He published his first monograph, Work and Community in the Jungle, in 1987, which means he has been at the historian's craft for the good part of four decades, during which time he has made critical interventions in the history of immigration, race and ethnicity, class and labor, and the radical tradition in the 19th and 20th century United States. I am personally honored to be introducing James Barrett today because his work has been a great inspiration for my own scholarship. His detailed reconstruction of the world of packing house workers in work and community in the jungle provided a model and a standard for what history from the bottom up should be. And his classic 1992 article published in the Journal of American History entitled Americanization from the Bottom Up, Immigration and the Remaking of the Working Class of the United States, 1880 to 1930, enabled me, along with a whole generation of urban historians working at the intersection of political and social history, to begin to understand the interplay of class, race, ethnicity, and place in new ways. Five years later, the Journal of American Ethnic History published James Barrett's next field-changing article, co-written with David Rodiger, called In Between Peoples, Race, Nationality, and the New Immigrant Working Class. This was a seminal work in the then young field of whiteness studies, which helped to recast the interwar decades as a period of racial and ethnic instability and to reveal the critical link between whiteness and Americanization in US history. For Barrett, this work also began a new project to better understand the particular place of the Irish in the story of racial and ethnic formation that unraveled in the neighborhoods of Chicago and other cities in the urban North. And with this, I will let him tell you the rest in this morning's keynote lecture, Irish Americans in Chicago's Interethnic History, Race and Class. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, very sorry that uh, I'm not able to be with you uh, there in Paris. Uh, nice day in Chicago, but I suppose I'd rather be in uh, Paris. <clears throat> I wanted to thank um, the uh, French colleagues in particular who helped to facilitate the conference uh, and have advised me a bit on uh, this uh, recording of my lecture. Uh, and thanks also to Andrew who did the uh, um, introduction. It's difficult to avoid the conclusion that of Chicago's broad range of ethnic groups, uh, the Irish played a central role in shaping the city. They generated and held tenaciously to political power for generations. And for much of that time, they led the city's most important uh, institutions, the police and fire department, most of the city's unions and the Catholic church, Irish Catholic, Lay teachers and nuns taught and socialized many of the city's children, and as they moved up in the social structure, the Irish were found disproportionately among the city's most influential lawyers and businessmen. But to focus on the Irish in isolation from other groups is, I think, a bad mistake. Uh, they made this place in consort competition and conflict with the city's many other uh, ethnic groups. Here I want to argue for the essential inter-ethnic character of Chicago's story by drawing our attention to race relations and labor organization, two critical aspects of the city's history, which might stand in for the central analytical categories in American urban history, race, and class. The role of the Irish in shaping racism and racial conflicts is rather well known, and Chicago is a particularly striking case in uh, this phenomena. Irish gangs played a key role in the central event in the city's racial history, the 1919 race riot, and tensions between African Americans and Irish Americans persisted through much of the 20th century. Less well known, perhaps, is the Irish role in integrating groups, including African-Americans, into the life of the city 
and working for civil rights. The strong defensive character of Irish American culture was shaped by early nativism and anti-Catholicism. Uh, nativist politics and prejudice against the Irish flourished throughout the 19th century and well into the 20th, accentuating their perception that it was essential for them to bond and to defend their accumulating power and influence in the city. The famine, nativism, poverty, and their colonial past all lent the Irish a cohesive defensiveness that came alive in neighborhoods like uh, like Chicago's. The folklorist William Williams observed that the Irish seemed to understand that they had to succeed as a people, not just as individuals. It was a lesson that later ethnic groups took to heart, hence the significance and viability of ethnicity as a social formation in the United States. In this sense, the Irish were the city's first ethnic group and for better or worse, newcomers had to deal with them. The central institution in Irish religious, social, and cultural life was, of course, the Catholic parish. But the broader implications of their, that fact are not always grasped. Much of the networking that allowed uh, the Irish to leverage their numbers uh, into significant power and influence rested on bonding social capital generated through parish life, which tend to be, tended to be literally ter territorial and defensive in nature. The physical boundaries of the parish constituted an important spatial understanding of the city, embracing some and excluding others. The territorial dimensions of this reality were only reinforced by the arrival of later uh, migrants, each group trying to defend its own turf. Monsignor Daniel F. Burns, pastor of the giant Visitation Parish, periodically read out the boundaries of the parish from the pulpit as the African-American population moved closer. And his message was certainly clear. Visitation would remain a largely Irish parish so long as par parishioners stayed in the neighborhood. This religiously based territorial dimension of Irish American mentality helps to explain much of their relations with later groups. For urban Catholics, John McGreevy concludes, the community came to be the church with a particular geographically defined space. Irish American street gangs thrived amidst the poverty and prejudices of the city, and these classic urban institutions became models for later ethnic groups, providing the basis for the earliest organized crime in Chicago as they did in other cities. Gangs tended to divide the city up into distinct enclaves based on ethnicity and race. These boundaries could be quite precise and interlopers might be greeted with Irish confetti, a mixture of paving stones and bricks. Remember, it's the Reagan's Colts you're dealing with. A gang of Irish youth bragged to a passerby. We have 2,000 members between Halstead and Cottage Grove and 43rd and 63rd Streets. We intend to run this district. Look out. While the Irish gangs showed a general belligerence, they seemed to have a special proclivity for attacking African Americans. In the midst of the World War I era Great Migration, the burgeoning Black Belt faced Bridgeport and Canaryville, two old Irish neighborhoods across Wentworth Avenue. As a teenager, the Black writer and poet Langston Hughes took a walk in his new neighborhood, inadvertently crossing this deadline. A white gang quickly set upon him, explaining simply, they don't allow niggers in that neighborhood. Part athletic club, part political enforcers, Reagan's Colts 
were bankrolled by a local politician and acted as racial sentinels guarding boundaries of the neighborhood. It was the Colts and other Irish gangs that played the key role in Chicago's Great Race Riot of 1919, and they enforced the color line between the neighborhoods uh, during and long after the riot. To say that the riot pitted black migrants against whites is at best an oversimplification of a fact that resides at the center of the process of racial identity formation. Recent immigrants played little role in the violence, which was largely per perpetrated by Americanized Irish youth who seemed to have protection from the police who were often drawn from the same neighborhoods. Gangs operated for hours without hindrance from the police, the Chicago Commission on Race Relations reported. But for them, it is doubtful that the riot would have gone beyond the first clash. It was evident during the riot, social worker Mary McDowell noted, that our Polish neighbors were not the element that committed the violence. It was committed by the second and third generation of American young men from the athletic clubs, which had grown under the protection of political leaders in the district, themselves mostly foreign born. McDowell's observation, the findings of the Chicago Commission and other sources all underscore a vital reality <coughs> uh, in the history of American immigration and the settling in of later immigrant groups. To become American, that is to acculturate to life in the American city, often meant to become white. And the Irish provided a key model for this transformation in Chicago and also in other cities. Ironically, some members of the Irish gangs frequented black and tan integrated nightclubs, cafes, and houses of prostitution just across Wentworth Avenue in the Black Belt. This juxtaposition of racial violence with an apparent attraction to interracial recreation and even sexual encounters suggests an ambivalence at the heart of the homosocial Irish American youth cultures. It is an ambivalence captured brilliantly in James T. Farrell's proletarian trilogy, Studs Lonigan, which takes as its focus the fragility of the Irish American urban male psyche in the face of increasing racial and ethnic diversity on Chicago's South Side. In this and other ways, Irish American gangs represented a contradiction in values. They and their Democratic Party patrons posed as defenders of immigrant Catholics, even as they persisted in their racism towards African Americans. Democrat William Deaver's mayoral campaign uh, in 1928 was notable for its white supremacist rhetoric and the Colts continued their attacks on African Americans throughout the, that decade. But when the Ku Klux Klan launched an ill-advised challenge to the Irish Catholic establishment in the early 1920s, machine politicians orchestrated a multi-ethnic political campaign and established an anti-Klan newspaper, Tolerance, with a readership of 150,000 while the Colts and other gangs staged demonstrations, bombings, and ritualized lynchings of Klan members. Despite support from some white Protestants, uh, especially in the suburbs, the Klan never recovered in the city. One source for limited integration amidst all these battles was the Catholic Church its institutions, and some of its clergy and laity. Though they were always a minority within the church and in the black community, African-American Catholics um, poured into the church in the wake of the Great Migration, and they did this for a number of reasons. Catholic schools offered high academic standards, discipline, and an element of status. The church was generally segregated along ethnic lines. National parishes 
catered to the city's various immigrant communities, and most black Catholics settled into congregations of their own. Parish organizational life brought the opportunity for community-based community building and affiliation with the Irish Catholic establishment offered the promise of some entree into machine politics, patronage, and jobs. As they did for immigrants and their children, Catholic aesthetics offered beauty and a brush with the divine in grimy inner city neighborhoods. In defense of racial segregation, the hierarchy first equated black parishes with those national parishes. No different, they said, from those of other ethnic groups. Many English-speaking territorial parishes served mainly Irish populations. A shift from the interwar years on, from ethnically-based national to territorial parishes, however, and continued relegation of African Americans to a few all-black congregations clearly represented a form of Jim Crow. From the late 19th century through much of the 20th, most leaders of Chicago's institutions were chained at Catholic high schools and colleges. The networks established at these schools provided the Irish with enormous social capital and facilitated their control of the Democratic Party, the Catholic Church, numerous unions and corporations, and many of the city's leading law firms. A large proportion of Chicago's public school teachers were likewise trained by Irish American nuns at Catholic girls' schools. As later groups entered these institutions, they were gradually provided contacts with the established Irish and an avenue to better jobs, upward mobility, and some measure of political influence. If this were less true for African Americans, nevertheless, an identifiable black elite was emerging by the post-World War II years, and many of these people were trained in Catholic uh, institutions. Much of the church's work was carried out by nuns, a greatly underestimated force, I think, in urban history. Two orders were particularly important in Chicago. The Sisters of Mercy established in Dublin in 1827, and the Sisters of Mercy of the Blessed Virgin Mary organized in the same city in 1831. Both orders followed the famine Irish into the American city. Irish nuns established Chicago's first hospital, nurses training school, orphanage, and girls academy. By 1896, the Sisters of Mercy had established five elementary schools and several high schools. Agatha O'Brien described the order as, quote, a mixture of nations. And they did eventually integrate young women uh, from Chicago's various ethnic communities. In fact, however, the overwhelming majority of these nuns came from Irish working class families. Unlike Polish, German, and other parish schools that aimed to maintain their languages and ethnic cultural identities, those taught by the Irish American orders used a curriculum that resembled that in the city's public schools, and they aimed for high academic standards. As the historian Sarah Deutsch writes, they were responsible not only for upward mobility of many of the city's young women, quote, but also in the long run for Americanizing them. Nuns were among the very few Chicago whites who lived and worked full time in black neighborhoods, serving the African American community in a variety of ways, staffing Catholic settlement houses and other welfare institutions, and of course, teaching the community's youth, taking special aim at mentoring young African American women. Thus, it's not surprising that nuns emerged as major, major players in the church's earliest efforts to promote civil rights and integration. Because so many Irish families placed a premium on the education of their daughters, and because so many 
non-trained young Irish American women entered public school teaching. The values and socialization nurtured by the sisters went well beyond Catholic institutions. At the turn of the century, two thirds of the candidates who passed the exam to enter the teacher training normal school were graduates of Catholic secondary schools. By this point, more than a third of Chicago's public school teachers were the children of Irish immigrants. Cardinal Mundelein estimated the proportion was about 70% by 1920. The proportion was so high, in fact, that public school boards and administrators worried about the what they called the Catholicization of public schools. And the high numbers did mean that the Americanization of immigrant youth we picture happening in the public school did take on a particularly Hibernian cast. Bishop Bernard Scheel, an Irish American activist, liberal, and supporter of CIO unions and community organizing, was a strong voice for integration and racial justice. His Catholic youth organization, the CYO, created a different sort of opportunity for African Americans to cross parish boundaries. It projected a deceptively simple vision with widespread implications. Reduce juvenile, juvenile delinquency and begin the process of integration through racially integrated youth sports programs. CYO propaganda was ostentatiously pluralist and as the organization matured, it embraced a more ambitious goal of racial justice. For both ideological and more practical reasons, the CYO maintained close relations with both the democratic machine and also with the New Deal government. Large numbers of black and white contestants and audiences crossed the color line repeatedly at the organization's events. By the late 40s, the CYO was running 56 summer camps serving 40,000 youth, hundreds of sporting events, a labor school, and seven settlement houses. CYO programs were racially integrated and most of the kids were from working class immigrant or African American homes. Black athletes were celebrated citywide for their boxing, basketball, and track accomplishments. Catholic swimmers of both sexes crossed the most rigid color line of all at pools around the city. In a society where sports offered a means of both acculturation, that is becoming American, and an avenue of upward social mobility, such experience was extremely important. Anyone familiar with, with Chicago's widespread segregation will find these accomplishments re remarkable. The strength of racism in the territorial of the Irish American worldview meant that there were serious limits to these efforts, especially at the level of inner city parishes where the reality of race relations was often quite different than the church's official pronouncements. In the post-war years, Scheel fell from favor among the hierarchy, the CYO declined, and white Catholics played prominent roles in neighborhood racial conflicts. With the second great migration after this uh, World War II, the black population exploded, expanding into previously all white South and West Side Irish neighborhoods, and racial transition produced conflict. In Englewood, just south of the Stockyards neighborhood, an area of second settlement for the Irish and other working class ethnics, Visitation Parish became a focal point for this conflict. In 1949, major rioting broke out when a labor organizer hosted an interracial union meeting uh, in his home near the parish. Crowds attacked the house, assorted, assaulted people passing through the neighborhood, overturned cars. In 1963, violence returned when the first black families moved into the neighborhood. Similar events occurred in Southside 
uh, parishes and heavily Irish parishes on the west side from the late 40s through the early 60s. Whereas earlier mobs were composed primarily of Irish, however, the post-war disturbances included many Eastern European Catholics who now identified as white and had absorbed racialized language values and repertoires from the Irish. Yet Catholic interracialism never disappeared and it reemerged forcefully in the 1960s. Despite its many contradictions regarding race, the church provided openings for interracial socialization and the basis for civil rights activism within ethnic working class neighborhoods. Founded in 1948, the Catholic Interracial Council, the CIC, established Freedom House, an integrated gathering place and sponsored a range of religious events aimed at mixed audiences. The group refrained from direct action, however, and moved cautiously so as not to alienate white Catholics. When Cardinal Meyer replaced Cardinal Stritch upon his death in 1958, the hierarchy of the church became relatively more supportive of the CIC. The CIC was not an Irish organization in the narrow sense. The whole point was to achieve some measure of racial and ethnic integration, so it included African American Catholics and whites from a variety of ethnic backgrounds. Yet if the leadership of the organization yet the leadership of the organization, many of the clergy involved, and a majority of its rank and file were from Irish backgrounds. In 1961, CIC clergy and lay people from Southside parishes joined an interracial group um, at a wait-in organized by the NAACP's youth group to integrate one of the city's last effectively segregated beaches. When the first black family moved into Visitation Parish in 1962, members of the Catholic Interracial Council escorted them to church every Sunday for almost a year. When fresh violence broke out in the summer of 1963, activists circulated through the parish to calm the situation. That same summer, nuns and priests picketed the Illinois Club for Catholic Women because it barred African American patrons from its swimming pool. And a CIC delegation that year joined the March on Washington. The following year, CIC priests and, and students uh, joined Freedom Summer in Mississippi. And in 1965, the Voting Rights March from Selma to Montgomery. In the heated summer of 1966, priests, nuns, and laity joined open housing marches through largely Catholic neighborhoods on the northwest and southwest sides, including the Marquette March, where they were attacked, along with Martin Luther King Jr. and other activists. In the interval between 1951 and 1965, William A. Osborne concludes, the leadership of the Catholic interracial movement passed from New York to Chicago. A subtle element in this equation is easily missed. The reverence most Irish Americans had for the church and for priests and nuns made it difficult for them to simply dismiss this activism. And polling data from the 1940s through the 1960s indicates that Irish Catholics were actually more amenable to open housing and integration than most whites. Yet in the neighborhoods, many Irish Catholics continued to oppose integration and the activism tended to divide the Catholic community. In some cases, it raised anger and denunciation. A person who signed their letter to the activist priest, Daniel Millett, Irish Catholic, wrote, when I think when I was a kid, the respect we had for the priest or the nun, take off the collar. In other cases, it encouraged laity, 
especially young Catholics, to embrace the cause of civil rights. As long as there are Catholics like you in the world, Maria Romano wrote Millette, I shall do my best to be a good Christian. She enclosed five dollars to support the priest's work. Numerous letters offered prayers and financial support, and some offered to join Millette in his work on Chicago's West Side. Likewise, in building Chicago's powerful labor movement, the Irish uh, are often remembered, rightly, as gatekeepers, protecting their own interests through craft union organization and apprenticeship programs. When we speak of the exclusive character of American unions from the late 19th century through the mid 20th, we are often speaking of the Irish who created and dominated um, them in these years. In general, Irish workers constituted a conservative, exclusive influence in the labor movement. Although many took part in the rise of the Knights of Labor and joined major strikes in the late 19th century, most seemed resistant to, and perhaps hostile to, the socialist organizing, which was actually quite strong at various points in the city's history. But in sticking too close to this narrative, we miss a submerged history of Irish American progressivism that shaped some of the earliest industrial union efforts, helped to integrate immigrant and black labor into the movement, and even played a part in the city's radical history. Many of the city's ethnic groups established niches in Chicago's uh, labor market over time. But the Irish were in a better position to carve out and maintain such niches, <clears throat> including in skilled construction work on the railroads, in local government public works, and elsewhere. Political and parish networks opened the opportunity for municipal jobs, of course, but they also allowed the Irish to dominate apprenticeship programs and to cling to the leadership of many of the city's unions. Such networking and the creation of what socialists called, called bonding social capital certainly opened opportunities for the Irish, but in effect, they could also close such opportunities to other groups. When threatened, um, the Irish could show great uh, cohesiveness um, and a remarkable level of solidarity and joint action, usually in support of their own, sometimes in support of other workers and ethnic groups. Because community and family welfare were closely connected to labor struggles in the community's moral economy, women, children, and men all turned out for large defensive crowd actions in each of the major strikes of the late 19th century. The participation of women, children, and the large numbers of those involved in such collective bargaining by riot, as well as attacks on those who violated uh, community sanctions on strike breaking, all this underscores the mutually reinforcing character of class and ethnic identity. Such struggles brought Irish Americans into class solidarity with other ethnic groups, but the community ethic also reinforced racism when African American migrants worked during strikes. Though strike breakers came from a range of ethnic communities, it was blacks in particular whom the Irish came to see as a scab race. Irish Americans' involvement in strike riots persisted well into the 20th century. In the bitter 1904 stockyard strike, blacks represented only a fraction of the strike breakers, but observers noted effigies of nigger scabs in the Irish American neighborhoods. Race continued to be an obstacle to labor organizing on the city's south side, and labor conflict played a major role in Chicago's central race riot of the 20th century. It was one that left a legacy of racial antagonism 
and Irish communities for more than a generation. In this sense, class solidarity could accentuate the racism that derived from community sources. While the bonding social capital based in parishes and politics allowed the Irish to not only insulate themselves, but also to exclude others, their employment of what could be called bridging social capital, the connections they made with other ethnic groups, and their efforts to integrate newcomers into social movements has been less well recognized. Irish American radicals by definition ignored all ethnic and racial boundaries in an effort to create a more powerful working class movement. These included Chicago-based communists like William Z. Foster and Jack Carney, the female labor paragon Mother Jones, and a myriad of faceless radical hobos, wobblies, and others. <clears throat> Born into a large poverty-stricken uh, Irish-American family in Philadelphia, Foster, uh, William Z. Foster, grew up in an Irish-American street gang, left home early, and tramped around the U.S. in a variety of jobs. But he considered Chicago home in part because of the city's radical reputation. This reached back to the 1877 railroad strike, a series of socialist and anarchist movements, the eight-hour strikes and Haymarket massacre, and the Pullman strike and boycott of 1894. In the early 20th century, the city was the birthplace of the IWW and the communist movement and boasted one of the best organizers, organized labor forces <clears throat> in the United States. These movements were not the sole preserve of the Irish, but the Chicago Federation of Labor, CFL, which Foster called, quote, the most progressive labor federation in the United States, was led by its charismatic president, John Fitzpatrick, who was particularly friendly to the radicals. Born in Ireland in 1871, Fitzpatrick arrived in Chicago amidst the labor upheavals of the 1880s and went to work in the stockyards. He rose through the ranks and served for decades as president of the Chicago Federation of Labor, yet he never left his Bridgeport neighborhood. Fitzpatrick's progressivism is significant precisely because he resided at the heart of the Irish American community and commanded respect and loyalty there and throughout the city. Married to a union school teacher, Fitzpatrick was a teetotaler, a devout Catholic, an ardent Irish nationalist, but above all, a militant trade unionist. He did not share Foster's revolutionary socialism, but he saw the route to power through the organization of the unorganized, regardless of gender, race, or ethnicity, through progressive municipal reform, and through independent labor politics. Under Fitzpatrick, the Federation embraced a progressive foreign policy. With Irish American nationalism at a high tide in the wake of the Easter Rising, Fitzpatrick and other Irish American labor leaders in the Federation supported independence for Poland and other small nations, as well as the Mexican, Irish, and Russian revolutions. And they defended the rights of immigrants and other radicals targeted by the federal government. These efforts enhanced relations between the Irish and other ethnic groups. During World War I, Fitzpatrick launched a spirited labor paper, The New Majority, which included a women's page and projected a progressive vision on a range of national and international issues. Immediately after the war, Fitzpatrick launched the Cook County Labor Party. The organization crossed ethnic and even racial lines, organizing labor party clubs in the Black Belt and immigrant neighborhoods and balancing its municipal and ward tickets with workers from various ethnic backgrounds. In 1919, Fitzpatrick ran for mayor on the Labor uh, Party ticket, projecting, quote, a Chicago for the workers. 
and although he lost, the party did well in the Stockyards District and some of the city's other immigrant wards. Fitzpatrick actively supported the organization of women and unskilled immigrants in Chicago's huge garment and other industries, and the effort to organize the burgeoning population of black workers in the World War I era and the 1920s. As a result of the efforts of Fitzpatrick and those around him, Chicago had a much higher proportion of its workers, about half of its labor force, organized by the early years of the 20th century. And this movement included vigorous women's unions, including not only the garment and other factory workers, but also scrub women, waitresses, and the city's public school teachers. Many of the women's organizing in the stockyards, schools, and the service industries was led by Irish American women. Margaret Haley of the teachers, Agnes Nestor of the garment workers, Mary McDermott of the scrub women, Hannah O'Day in the stockyards, and Elizabeth Maloney of the waitresses. Although organized by Irish Catholic women under the name of the nationalist women's leader, Maud Gawn, the Women's Stockyards Union soon integrated black, Polish, and other women workers in the yards. Irish Americans together with middle-class allies uh, were also vital in organizing the Chicago Women's Trade Union League. When Foster brought Fitzpatrick plans to organize the open shop bastions of meatpacking and steel, he did not hesitate to throw the CFL's resources into these efforts. Foster proved a master Foster proved a master architect of huge, diverse union movements and strikes in the steel industry and the massive Chicago stockyards. Once the province of largely Irish and German skilled butchers, by World War I, the stockyards and meatpacking plants were populated by a remarkably diverse group of unskilled laborers, Poles, Slovaks, Lithuanians, Czechs, and a residue of Irish. The Great Migration brought thousands of black migrants and the challenge of creating an interracial labor movement. By 1917, nearly 12,000 black workers, about a fourth of the stockyards workforce, had entered the industry in the midst of an aggressive organizing drive engineered by Foster and Fitzpatrick. Foster hired black organizers and others who spoke the immigrant languages and he worked through black and immigrant churches and fraternal organizations. The organizing was particularly successful in the Polish community where the union became a household word. But efforts were less successful among the black workers. Most were recent immigrants with little knowledge of unions. Others had had bad experiences in Chicago or elsewhere. The Packers ran an, ran an aggressive paternalistic program in the Black Belt. <clears throat> Estimates vary, but it seems the Stockyards Labor Council recruited perhaps half of the black workers at best. The big problem, Foster explained, was the organization of the colored men. After significant successes in 1917 to 1919, the Stockyards movement disintegrated in the midst of post-war depression the 1919 race riot, a failed 1921-1922 strike, and an aggressive open shop movement by the Packers who used race systematically to divide the stockyards workers. When the Packing House Workers Movement um, re-emerged in the late 1930s and World War II years. It was built largely on a coalition of black workers and progressive whites, um, including some Irish Americans left over from the earlier organizing. The United Packing House Workers of America proved to be one of the most progressive unions in the militant CIO, especially strong in the area of civil rights. 
but this new movement was less the creation of the Irish than of the black workers who had proved so resistant to the earlier organizing. Toward the end of World War I, again with Fitzpatrick's support, Foster built a similar movement in steel facing staggering legal and extra-legal violence in South Chicago and the mill towns throughout Indiana, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. Again, working through the ethnic organizations and employing multilingual organizers who could bring the message to the unskilled immigrants in their own language, Fitzpatrick estimated that Foster and his staff had organized more than 350,000 steel workers, most of them recent unskilled immigrants, at the start of the great 1919 strike. The movement was so strong among the recent immigrants that critics called it a hunky strike. As in meatpacking, however, the organizers faced their biggest challenge in overcoming the racism of the white workers and the skepticism of the blacks. Many of the AFL unions, half of them led by Irish Americans, had long drawn the color line. Black workers had been deadlined out of white working class neighborhoods and lynched. Employers, on the other hand, in Chicago's stockyards, in the steel towns and elsewhere, cultivated black leadership and supported black churches and other institutions as long as they opposed unionization. Through many an experience, Foster told investigators from the inter-church world movement, Negroes came to believe that the only way they could break into a unionized industry was through strike breaking. Race prejudice has everything to do with it, he told the Chicago Commission on Race Relations. They don't feel confidence in the trade unions. Undoubtedly, Irish Americans played a prominent part in deadlining, mobbing, and employment discrimination through their unions. What is striking in this context, however, is the insight Irish American radicals like Foster, Fitzpatrick, and others brought to the race issue. Their recognition of the threat, the color line posed to organized labor, and the elaborate planning they put in to surmounting it. They recognized that the labor movement would either integrate the diverse elements of the working class population or collapse. And they put considerable thought and creativity into realizing this integration. This is a scene from the 1919 steel strike. What's at work in these integration efforts on the part of Irish American labor activists? The church's teachings, uh, some understandable preference for the underdog, but also self-interest. The effort to build organization and movements based on class rather than ethnicity, especially with the advent of newer mass production methods and the related massive influx of unskilled immigrants from a bewildering range of ethnic backgrounds. The idea of an Irish labor movement was a non-starter. <clears throat> Some skilled trades remained dominated by the Irish for generations, but the secular trend in one industry after another was certainly stacked against this strategy of exclusion. Mass production and the growth of, growth of huge industrial complexes like the Union Stockyards and the South Chicago Steel District brought thousands of unskilled immigrants into the labor force. The existing unions could either help them to organize or perish. And Irish activists and organizers did respond to this challenge. The CFL generally organizing in garments Teamsters, meatpacking, steel, and elsewhere. In conclusion, Chicago's Irish American community was divided on these and other issues. The very strength of bonding within the Irish community often led to a defensive response to newcomers. Given their early history in the city, it's perhaps not surprising that faced 
with what they perceived as a threat to their status and social capital. Elements in the Irish community could lash out, sometimes violently, as in the 1919 race riot. Whatever the built-in tensions, the territoriality so prevalent in Irish neighborhoods and the gangs that sprang from this mentality reinforced the competition for urban resources. One striking feature of Chicago's Irish community then in relation to other groups is this networking. Building from parish contacts and beyond, the Irish carved out a niche for themselves in physical spaces around the city, in workplaces and unions, in politics and elsewhere. Such networking contributed to both bonding and bridging social capital in the effort to reserve space and resources for the Irish alone, but also in the plans of those aiming to create common ground with others. Thus the story is one of both conflict and integration, and we ignore either at the risk of minimizing and misunderstanding the broader functions of the Irish community in a city like Chicago. Thank you very much. So, uh, well, welcome back to all of you, those who are in presence and those of you who are uh, online on both sides of the Atlantic for our uh, first panel of the second day of this conference. And today we will uh, be talking about education, work and ethnic identity in Irish uh, Chicago. Our first panelist is uh, Bradford Hunt, who is a professor of history and chair of the Department of History at Loyola University, Chicago. He has held positions at Loyola and at the Newbury Library, um, involved in research, teaching, as well as public history. He produced Chicago 1919, Confronting the Race Riots, and uh, he is also the author of important books and articles on the history of Chicago, notably on the history of ethnicity and race and of public housing. And he has served on the board of the National Public Housing Museum, which, as you know, is in Chicago. And his talk today is Irish Americans and the 1919 Chicago Race Riots. And so, uh, Bradford, the floor is yours for 20 minutes. Thank you, uh, Paul. I'm delighted to be here. I want to thank uh, Thierry Arnaud, Henri, uh, James Chandler for bringing us all together. Uh, uh, and I want to build on Jim Barrett's comments as well as uh, James Chandler's comments yesterday about disturbing history uh, and what some public historians call difficult history. In this case, the 1919 Chicago race riots. This was the most violent week in Chicago's history. 38 dead, over 500 wounded. Difficult and disturbing history is history that we don't want to talk about uh, and worse, we're often ignorant about. Uh, in the case of the 1919 race riots, Chicagoans knew little uh, about it. And I know this because I produced this uh, program that Paul mentioned, Chicago 1919 Confronting the Race Riots, which was uh, a series of 11 public programs produced with 13 cultural organizations across the city. I'm going to explain more about this effort at the end of my talk. But I really want to do three things today. First, I want to complicate the basic story of the race riot, the short version, the one that some Chicagoans do know, uh, the one that um, uh, people not versed in this history probably have heard of. Uh, and by complicating it, I want to build on the strong work of others. Second, uh, along the way, I want to focus on the centrality of the Irish. Uh, they are only one actor in this story. Uh, but even as we turn to ethnicity, I want to bring space back into the conversation. I think this was really a battle over space and race with Irish gangs 
uh, in a disorganized, in a somewhat disorganized way uh, as troops in the battle. And I'll use a military analogy that may be imperfect. And then third, I want to uh, tell you about uh, how to communicate this difficult history uh, and to bring it alive and give it relevance for the 21st century. So let's start with the simple story. And here's an article from the Chicago Tribune from uh, two years ago. The way the riots are typically understood in Chicago is it's a story about a spark, an explosion, a spasm of violence. It's all an aberration in some respects, an unfortunate moment in time now long past. That spark is when Eugene Williams, age 17, takes a makeshift raft into Lake Michigan, he drifts towards a white only beach, he's hit by a stone thrown by a white man, he drowns, the police refuse to arrest the white man who threw the rock and all hell breaks loose. Uh, and here's the uh, crowd at the lakefront uh, just after uh, the, the drowning. Um, and this uh, is gonna spark a week of racial violence that's gonna ensue with ugly deaths and wild disorder. The news articles in the last uh, two years ago and also for the last really 50 years have usually told kind of a both sides story to this. Whites killed blacks, blacks killed whites, ethnicity is marginalized, it's really about race. Uh, in terms of broader causes, we need to think about African-American migration, labor strife, the general uh, upheavals of 1919, and maybe if you're lucky, an article mentions uh, gangs. This uh, conflict ends with the militia uh, and perhaps the rain that doused the violence. So I present this simplified story as something of a baseline, a way to understand perhaps the received wisdom, but this is the basic extent of white knowledge, if at all, about the event. So let's complicate this history. Of course, historians have written much more sophisticated histories, uh, and it starts really with uh, an important sociological study, The Negro in Chicago, written in 1922, a landmark in sociology conceived and edited largely by Charles S. Johnson, who was an African-American sociologist trained at the University of Chicago under Robert Park. This is a comprehensive uh, work. It's more uh, a broad sociological study. It has a, a strong narrative at the start, but it's not really a history. It's comprehensive. It does not shy away from pointing to white gangs as the primary, and especially Irish American gang, gangs as the critical instigators, but it wants to do a much broader sociology. It's just an excellent document where that is really the starting point for all the histories, including probably the single best book, uh, one that holds up really well uh, from 1970, William Tuttle's Race Riot Chicago in the Red Summer of 1919. He, uh, this is a classic example of new social history, an early precursor to some whiteness studies. Tuttle explains the riot in a black-white binary, uh, but set in the nuanced context of Chicago in 1919. Again, the emphasis on migration, labor conflict in the stockyards, political tensions following the April 1919 election of Big Bill Thompson. Uh, Jim Barrett kind of referenced that Fitzpatrick, John Fitzpatrick had run against Thompson, but Thompson was known for his anti-Catholicism and support for African-Americans and that unnerves, that, that unnerves the Irish American community. Uh, and finally, housing competition on the peripheries of Chicago solidifying black belt. Those are all the contexts uh, that Tuttle uh, uh, points to. He's less interested in ethnicity, however, and more interested in the African-American experience, which had so long been neglected. So building on that work, we have two more uh, important works here. The first is Dominic Pasiga, uh, who had an article that's hard to find. Uh, I've got it if you want it, and then hard to find digitally, the making of, in, a, in a book called The Making of Urban America. Uh, Pasiga is much more focused on ethnic conflict as well as class in the Irish community. Here, Irish uh, gangs have a central role in the story, the, uh, but he uh, and the Polish involvement is, is more minimal. Pasiga is famous as for being a Polish historian, but he's very finely attuned uh, to parishes, to ethnicity, to gangs. 
Here, uh, African-Americans threatened Irish-American middle-class neighborhoods, Pasiga argues, as well as working class, since the Irish had already arrived, were already well-established, uh, and had much more to lose. And uh, he, he, try, he plots out, Pasiga plots out some maps that are a little vague, but uh, I think he's on to something. Andrew Diamond uh, has a terrific chapter uh, in his book, Mean Streets, uh, Chicago Youths and the Everyday Struggle for Employment, 1908 to 1969, uh, about the 1919 race riot. It's almost entirely centered around white Irish athletic clubs and their activities in the riot. Diamond uses evidence from the 1922 report uh, and another Chicago School of Sociology study from 1927, Frederick Thrasher's book titled Gangs. And those two works tell us much of what we know about the Reagan's cults that uh, Jim Barrett mentioned, the large Irish and American athletic club, really a gang, sponsored by Cook County Commissioner Frank Reagan, complete with its own clubhouse, uh, but it's important to remember that this was just one of many gangs. Thrasher's 1927 book counted 855 uh, gangs, many of which were of mixed ethnicity. He found 75, which he thought were exclusively Irish American. And so uh, uh, Diamond frames this riot largely around young white Irish gangs who do much of the instigating and destruction. In nuanced ways, Diamond explains the masculinity uh, at the center of the Irish youth gang experience uh, and their violent tendencies. Boxing was a popular sport, a primary sport in the streets. Most popular films among young men at this time were violent Western, American Westerns set in the West. Uh, in the end, Diamond sees violence as a way for young Irish youth to express empowerment, particularly in reaction to the brutal worlds of their fathers in the stockyards. Uh, facing that future, they reject it. And given that Irish gangs had fought amongst each other over turf, it was not difficult to turn against uh, an African-American population over space as well. Uh, Diamond recognizes the vicious, viciousness of these white attacks and that sheer violence is disturbing. I wanna build on this with some new framing. I wanna present, I wanna turn in here to the focus on space with Irish Americans as one important part of the story, but the idea of blaming them entirely for this, which no one really does, but if you read it, you kind of come away with some of that opinion. Uh, it's instead a much more uh, broader story uh, that I think about space and race with Irish Americans as central figures. Here, I'm influenced by the recent mapping work done by John Clegg, uh, who was a postdoc at the University of Chicago, who we worked with on our public history project two years ago. Clegg took data from various sources, mainly the 1922 Negro in Chicago report, used GIS techniques to create some new maps, some of which recreate maps in that 1922 report, which weren't very good. Uh, his Clegg's are simpler and I think more revealing in terms of patterns. Here I want to return to this war. Um, let me give you an example of, of two of these. Um, First is a, he was able to take the data and create what we think of as a heat map. Okay, well, this is the south side of Chicago, shows you uh, something, what did we make of this, unless you know that the black belt is really down the middle here and that the violence is taking place on one side, that whites, largely Irish Americans, but not, not, not even largely Irish Americans, uh, 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 I'm sorry, I take that back, that Irish were one of many ethnicities to the left of that line, uh, but that the stockyards, an important employment source, was to the left as well. In between is this dead line. I should have spelled it with two words now that I think about it. It's not when is the newspaper article due, it's you will die if you cross that line. Let's zoom in a little bit though, and as you zoom in with Clegg's data, uh, I'm going to minimize that. You can see that it's actually even more localized. This violence, uh, while occurring along uh, the, the area just to the right of the dead line, uh, is actually also occurring um, in, in, in more nuanced ways. And when I overlay here, 
There we go. Overlay where African Americans were living. This this crudely, I've overlaid this with PowerPoint. This is where more than fifty percent of the districts uh, of the census. Uh, areas are African American. You can start to see how, uh, and this is where 20 to 50 percent, that lighter shade is 20 to 50 percent. You can see how there's some conflict here over uh, African Americans moving into new areas. The, um, I, I'm going to talk more about this stockyards in a bit. So when I am looking at these John Clegg maps, I'm struck by uh, this as really a battle, uh, as uh, a battle in a long war of four phases. And there's a strategic terror uh, phase, which are these bombings I'm going to talk about in a second that really take place not just during a one week in July, but over four years and beyond. There's an invasion attempt during the riots of that week, which involved drive by shootings by white largely Irish gangs, uh, taking cars into the heart of the Black Belt and shooting uh, at what they at whatever they want. Uh, that invasion attempt is going to fail, but what's going to be more successful is enforcing the color line uh, through beatings that take place and, and other violence that are going to take place as far back as uh, at least 1900 and, uh, and all the way really, I say the present, I'm a little, you know, very infrequently now, but certainly African Americans understand that the risk of violence is significant when wandering into uh, white neighborhoods. Uh, in certain parts of the city. And so th there's a violence that's going to enforce this color line, but there's also going to be laws in practice. And this is all of this long war to preserve segregation uh, in Chicago. Uh, I'm not saying who's winning, who's losing, but it, we certainly still have uh, a stalemate uh, to some extent of segregation. So let's walk through each of these four uh, phases of the battle. Let's go to these bombings. This is where the Clegg map can be useful. Again, if all you saw were these dots on a map, you'd have a hard time making patterns of it, but you overlay uh, the census tracts that are predominantly black, and you see that some of these bombings are taking place within the black belt. Uh, what's interesting is that the dots that are black are black households, uh, the dots that are white are white households, and it's very hard to see, but there are a handful with a little orange uh, at the top that were real estate, people involved in the real estate industry. And so you see that most of the bombings are actually in these contested spaces, particularly near Washington Park. And what's interesting here is that this confirms some of the evidence uh, that these bombings were really orchestrated by the Kenwood Oakland Kent Oakland Kenwood Properties, Kenwood Oakland Property Association. Excuse me, I gotta get the order right because there's later an Oakwood Kent, Oakland Kenwood Association. The Kenwood Oakland Property Association was behind these bombings, which is a real estate uh, group uh, that with insider knowledge when property transactions were gonna take place. And so they're bought and the Kenwood Oakland Association is in this area that is undergoing racial transition. So real estate uh, th th to do bombings is a much more sophisticated uh, and organized uh, effort here. Uh, and I think it's significant. I need to keep moving. We have, here's a picture of the bomb, of a bombing uh, from the report. These were definitely terrorizing events. Uh, if we look at the invasion issue here, we see this, and here's the Clegg data. We see the real line along State Street, just at four blocks, east of the deadline, which was really where uh, the boundary of battles took place. That becomes much more apparent as we look closely at the data. Again, this is in the Black Belt. Uh, there are white incursions into the area. That's the invasion. Again, that's going to get repulsed by African-Americans, and that's the story they want to tell. Whites invaded our neighborhood. We repelled them. We shot back. And that's something you could not do in the American South. Uh, you could do it in Chicago. And when African-Americans remember this, they remember the violence, but they also remember that they stood up. Here uh, is the, we don't have good images of the invasion attempt. I have this image of African-Americans and part of this, the story here was, was their resistance. I wanna tell one more story about that resistance and this involves the Angeles Flats. Here's a picture of the building from 1892 at the corner of 35th and State, an epicenter of violence. This was an Irish and American rooming house at the time. It was one of the few 
uh, areas that was still predominantly white at this corner. The black Chicagoans think that a, a bullet is fired from the building. They surround it. The police come. The police lose control of the situation, fire into the crowd. Four uh, African-Americans die. Uh, but this entire street along State Street from uh, 29th down to 47th is this uh, front line, this, this almost kind of uh, where whites and blacks are standing off against each other. So the invasion attempt fails, but holding the color line is what's going to happen. And these red X's in the to the left of the deadline in the white part of Chicago uh, around the stockyard show that the uh, particularly along streetcar lines show a lot of the violence uh, and a lot of the battles between black workers going to work over in the white part of Chicago, who then have to get to work or return from work. And that's when much of the violence takes place. They're riding streetcars, whites are stopping streetcars, pulling people off. Thank you. Uh, and this again maps well with the uh, data. Here we're enforcing the color lines. This is the white gangs in white neighborhoods uh, stoning African-Americans. I believe this is Oscar Dozier based on the uh, data from the report. It's a brutal death. The police are right there, but unable to stop it. Whites terrorized the handful of African-Americans who try to move into black neighborhoods here looting a house uh, and African-Americans are escorted out. The, there's another uh, part, part of the story where uh, the Reagan's Colts apparently burned down a Lithuanian community trying to in, uh, in blackface, trying to convince them that blacks are part of the uh, attack on them. This fails uh, and it, it's um, uh, it's a real mess. I, I want to get to the last part of my talk here about enforcing the color lines with laws and practice. Restrictive covenants are going to be part of the equation, but restrictive covenants are not in Bridgeport and not along that deadline. Instead, violence is going to be used. And here we want to think about uh, Richard J. Daly in his picture at the De La Salle Academy. Uh, he's part of this equation, certainly. Daly is a part of the Hamburg Club, uh, and he never runs away from his participation in it, but he never talks about it. We can talk more about Daly. Uh, his son also embraces the Hamburg Club, a white Irish gang. And even today, during the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, whites are still seen on the streets with baseball bats ready to defend color lines. Uh, I'm going to skip this and go to our, our project. Uh, we spent a year talking to Chicagoans about this. Many of them didn't know it. We were able to do things with youth, with communities. Uh, we had a, a graphic artist document this. Uh, we did a bike ride with the partners in the community. Uh, and it was a real success. It's when you cross this boundary, uh, it's when you cross these boundaries that you really get a sense that they still exist. We rode our bike across what the deadline was and explained it. And it is really still a divide today, 100 years later, between Black community and uh, Bridgeport. It was a powerful moment. I want to end here with the only monument to the 1919 race riots. It's a stone put together by suburban high school kids, a tiny plaque along the lakefront. Chicago does not want to remember this, does not want to confront this history. Uh, it's a complicated one. It's not easy to explain. It's one that still more work needs to be done on. Thank you, uh, Paul. I'm going to stop. Um, our next speaker will be um, uh, Sophie uh, Cooper. Uh, who is uh, a teaching fellow in Irish history at the University of Leicester. And she has a forthcoming monograph with Edinburgh University Press, Forging Identities in an Irish World, Melbourne and Chicago, 1840-1922. But today she will focus on Chicago. And her talk is Sister, Sister, Irish Female Teachers and Ethnic Identity in Chicago, 1840-1922. And Sophie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And can you see my PowerPoint? Yes, we do. Fabulous. Okay, uh, good morning, uh, bonjour, I suppose. And thank you very much for all being here. 
Today, I want to focus on the schoolroom and how that space might provide insight into how Irish Catholic women and girls, lay and religious in Chicago, navigated the world that they lived in during the last decades of the 19th century. I'm going to focus on Chicago Sister of Mercy schools, particularly the St. Xavier's Academy, the Irish Order's first school and mother house in the city. The Sisters of Mercy were first established in Chicago from Pittsburgh in 1847 by the amazing Sister Mary Agatha O'Brien, a 24-year-old who was originally accepted into the Carlo Order as a lay sister before Bishop O'Connor declared that her potential shouldn't be held back by the poverty of her father. He said that she was a wo woman, in his words, capable of making a nation and why should the order be deprived of the services she could render it because her father was a poor man in Ireland. The sisters soon set up a school, orphanage and hospital. They established a social provision structure when the government wasn't able to and the Sisters of Mercy catered to those of all faiths and gained a reputation for being shock troops when the women went out and nursed the cholera epidemic of 1854 an epidemic which killed three of the original sisters, including Sister Agatha. These women were already bending the social hierarchies that they lived within because of their intelligence, their drive, and where they could physically go because of their habits, even within the boundaries of their faith. I'd echo um, Professor Barrett's argument about the importance of women religious in shaping identities and behaviours, but I see it in a different way at least in the 19th and early 20th centuries. These women, often brought in from Ireland to cater to Irish communities, were key to maintaining an Irish, or perhaps a specifically Irish Chicago identity. As I argue in my, I've got to get in a, a, a plug, but as I argue in my forthcoming book, uh, Forging Identities in the Irish World, these women should be considered culture brokers alongside the more traditional male priests, politicians and publicans. So the first school that the sisters established was St Xavier's Academy. At first it was a hut, as you can see um, in the kind of middle photo, um, more or less behind St Patrick's Church. By 1856, as you can see, it's an impressive stone structure. And by 1873, um, sorry, by 1856, it's an impressive stone structure. And by 1873, it was a magnificent stone structure. The imposing property that they bought in 1871 was burnt down in the fire days after signing the contract. In 1898, the Sisters of Mercy ran 12 schools in Chicago, three academies of which St. Xavier's was one and nine parochial schools. In this role, the 225 sisters were responsible for around 5,500 students, as well as those who they cared for in their nursing and guardianship roles. By the end of the 1920s, St Xavier's would be, have responsibility for 639 students. Now I'm using as a basis Mary Hilton's point that for many women religious, joining a sisterhood offered not only an active life of service, but also membership of an intellectual community of cultured women. This club didn't only extend, extend its membership on taking the veil. It was often begun in the schoolroom, cultivated within an environment which prioritized the intellectual empowerment of women and passed this out into the wider Catholic and for the purpose of this paper, the Irish, the Irish Catholic community through new recruits to religious orders but also through students who married and had children, those who became teachers within the public school system, and through the familial structures which emphasised women's nurturing role for the next generation. Mary Hilton uses the example of John Wilson Croker's 1812 attack on poet and school teacher, Anna Letitia Barbour, to emphasise the importance of female school teachers in shaping society. In Hilton's words, Croker's, to quote, attempt to confine this outspoken woman to the schoolroom surely indicates an unconscious acknowledgement that the role of educator of the young, in fact, allowed women, especially outspoken ones, a considerable measure of cultural power." Now, by the 1890s, especially in an urban industrial city like Chicago, 
a city which was in that decade filled with labour unrest, ethnic tensions and the remnants of a vicious problematic uh, and sometimes problematic Irish nationalism. There were many more freedoms available to women, particularly those of the middle classes. Journalists like um, Margaret Buchanan Sullivan were writing in prominence. Um, Gillian has, has written on um, Sullivan. Uh, and in Buchanan's case, um, impressing on the Catholic hierarchies the importance of Catholic women in progressing the faith in her famed 1875, chiefly among women peace in the Catholic world. Irish Catholic lay teachers were spreading throughout the ranks of the city's public schools. And by 1900, teachers like Maggie Haley were leading the radical Chicago Teachers Union. Mother Jones and Elizabeth Flynn Rogers, uh, master workmen of Chicago's Knights of Labor Local Assembly, and later the first female master workman president of District Assembly Number 24, as well as mother to um, 10 children, were names that flew across the United States, synonymous with Irishness and trade unionism, if not Catholicism. The girls attending Chicago St. Xavier's Academy, Irish, Irish American or other, could not have been unaware of the potential for women to raise their voices and be heard in certain situations and with varying societal repercussions. They could look to the outside world for inspiration on how to demonstrate female intellect, integrity, and also intransigence. However, in this paper, I'd suggest that when looking at student, female student agency during the 19th century, the role of women religious within the schoolroom as role models and facilitators remains undervalued by many. I'm going to um, approach the subject by looking at the St. Xavier's Echo, a student-run newspaper which began publication in January 1891. By looking at this newspaper, we can also see the ways that their schooling and teachers were allowing conversations on the place of women in society and within Irish society to occur and even spread outside the school under the banner of the Sisters of Mercy flagship academy. A similar newspaper, The Academia, was published by female students at another Sisters of Mercy school, St. Patrick's Academy. Though in this case, despite their March 1891 founding editorial stating that, please do not expect to find in our columns a Plato, a Socrates or a Pericles, ah no, we are simply a band of schoolgirls who intend to use the academia as a lever to alleviate the literary talents of our circle. By November 1894, the boys, uh, probably from the Christian Brothers run St. Patrick's Commercial Academy, were, were permitted to contribute letters from home and the on odd composition on Irish nationalist heroes like Colonel Mulli Mulligan. As you can see from these 1891 articles though, these were primarily the work of teenage girls who wanted to expand, who appreciated their intellect. And they even sent copies of the Echo to the Chicago Tribune. And it, it was mentioned in the Chicago Tribune that. It, um, in newspapers received. But they also wanted a space to vent about boys, their peers and their adventures. Maureen Flanagan in her book on Chicago women and their efforts to improve the city notes that historians have missed the significance of women other than Jane Addams in shaping relief efforts in Chicago because of their reliance on male sources. This, res uh, this reliance is also a result of archiving choices in the past but also because the women involved didn't explicitly publicize their, um, their actions. The same can be said of Chicago's women religious. One way of counteracting this paucity of archival material and a way of understanding the priorities of women and their charges is through the examination of the material culture that they leave behind, including the St. Xavier's Echo and the Academia. School newspapers were part of late 19th century middle-class life, However, they were clearly a feature encouraged by the Sisters of Mercy across their academies, if not their parish schools. They therefore provided a unique insight into the schoolrooms and extracurricular activities that took place under the watchful eyes of Chicago Sisters of Mercy. According to the 1893 to four um, school prospectus, recitation commenced at 9 a.m. and continued until 3.30 every day with a 45 minute lunch break. It's similar in 1889, as you can see here. 
girls were accepted as both boarders and day students. And looking at the admissions books, and as was the usual practice at fee-paying schools, students were accepted from all denominations. Catherine McCauley's rule and instruction regarding discipline that children must be made to feel their teachers are their best friends. If we draw the, the strings too tight, they will snap. And that there should be a positive relationship between teacher and student based on mutual respect was followed. This prospectus emphasizes that the discipline is mild, yet conducted with such uniformity as to secure order and regularity. This is from Joanna Morgan's Leaving Autograph book, and many of the sisters signed it. Sister Mary Michael, for example, wrote, Dear Jo, may your life like the late maple leaf which adorns our forests in autumn grow more beautiful as it fades. The Irish sisters, many of whom still hailed from Ireland originally, took with them the educational priorities of their foundational institutions. This transnational connection of experience, life and con conduct was reflected in the newspapers that the students of St. Xavier's Academy and its sister school, St. Patrick's, published beginning in 1891, presumably put together during recreation time and facilitated by the sisters. Briefly considering St. Xavier's Echo and Academia in tandem, what I've noticed is that the Academia is much more catered to the Irish makeup of the children. I'm not sure why this is, um, from cursory census rec research, there are similar uh, amounts of Irish and Irish descended children in both Xavier's and St. Patrick's. Um, perhaps it's um, perhaps it's because of the names of the schools. There is much more of a wish to honour the patron saint. This is one of the letters from abroad. Um, by Cecilia Cunningham, which featured in the September 1892 edition. And you can see she goes from Queenstown to Cork, and they go to Cork from Bantry, uh, they go all through Killarney. This is kind of, it, it's very much a kind of a tourist approach. Um, while these travel logs do feature in the Echo and family trips to Ireland are popular themes, Cecilia's travel diary are seen along proud celebrations of Irish heritage, music, news, and similar. The sisters and organizers of the academia seem to be much more heavily invested in celebrating Irishness, whereas the Echo is a more inclusive newspaper, focusing on international relations, South America, Britain, US domestic policy, and, you know, agony ant columns, gossip columns, and then co gossip columnists complaining that they're being told off for spreading gossip. So kind of standard school fair. In April 1893, a series of columns in the Echo began discussing the prospect of having a woman as president. Both sides of the debate were put forward. In the first case, Jenny Murray argued in the negative and Alice Shannon for the positive. As you can see here uh, in that kind of bold bit, uh, Alice argues that it's not strange that we have found in the past no woman who could excel men in, all men in any one thing, yet we have in the present day examples of women who have surpassed representative bodies of men in certain branches. She then returns to a similar point to Jenny, that why indeed should she not hold even this office? Why should she not be a, well able to fill it as a man? It has never been proved that women are intellectually inferior to men. The May edition returns to the question of women as president and Louise Bish, um, Blish supported Jenny in her argument that women were never intended to rule man. This argument continues across a number of editions with no conclusion reached. Uh, and I mean, when I was doing this research, it was just after the Hillary Clinton um, election and I, there were definitely some parallels. Um, the point of my briefly focusing on this debate over women as president is to consider how we automatically look at the teaching and community within religious schools during the 19th century. These students, Louise, Alice, Jenny, Hattie, were to be the wives and mothers of the next generation of Chicago's um, children. They may not have all been Catholic. Middle class private Catholic schools were often regarded positively by parents of all faiths, and therefore we can't assume that every single one of these children were Catholic. However, they were being brought up and educated by nuns. 
these women had an influence on their students. These unmarried, intellectual, often Irish teachers, sisters, set an example of female intelligence and questioning of the world surrounding them. We know that the Sisters of Mercy demonstrated a discreet amount of resistance and steel when they came into conflict with their male counterparts, and especially land-grabbing bishops. Kathleen Brosnan has written on the gendered space of early Chicago, highlighting the ways that sisters found loopholes in order to protect their assets from bishops, um, and though retaining a public silence, fought back. If we return to Hilton's argument about the cultural power of this female school teacher, these sisters have already, had already proven their worth to the people of Chicago. Their foundress and three of sisters died in the early 1850s because of their willingness to tend to victims of a cholera epidemic. During the Chicago fire of 1871, the sisters became, became known for their efforts, even when many of their own properties were demolished. They not only had a cultural power, but a cultural authority that was acknowledged and celebrated outside of the convent or school walls by people of all classes and faiths. Women religious had carved their own space in Chicago from its very early days. Through their actions inside and out of the schoolroom, these women demonstrated that they had agency and that there were ways that women, even if they were shrouded in the habit, could have, the in have independence and economic and intellectual authority. The Sisters of Mercy facilitated the creation of the Saint Xavier Echo and Academia, and doubtlessly encouraged their students to consider the world around them and to question their roles as women, as part of the middle class, as Americans, as the daughters of migrants, often from Ireland, and as part of a global Catholic community. It's difficult to really test the influence of these ideas of femininity and independence into adulthood. However, it's clear that the schools created a lasting connection between many students and their teachers supported by financial donations and continued engagement with alumni uh, organizations. To celebrate 50 years or the global, uh, Golden Jubilee of, that 18, um, of the 1877 graduating class, which included a Mrs. Fitzpatrick, nay, um, Anna Brady, Mrs. D.F. Burke, Catherine Buckley, and Mrs. J.J. Larkin, Rose MacDonald, $30,000 was raised by the alumni for three scholarships. For those who chose not to marry, the influence was equally clear, especially in certain year groups. Of the students who studied under Sister Mary G uh, Gabriel O'Brien and graduated in 1884, 12 became uh, women religious, including three Sisters of Mercy. Of those, Mary Mitchell went on to become Mother Mary Sophia, who gained a bachelor's degree in philosophy and was president of St. Xavier's between 1919 and 1936, with a brief three-year gap in 1925. If we look at the founders of the St. Xavier's Echo, Lizzie M. Glish became a school teacher in the public school system, as did three of her sisters, though Lulu Louise, um, subsequently married and presumably uh, retired. Susan A. Bonfield also re remained in Chicago, living in 1900 with relatives. She and her cousin Laura were both school teachers. These women had been at the top of their classes, prize winners for reading and literature through, across their school careers. Therefore, it's perhaps unsurprising that they took the opportunity to live semi-independent lives based around service, teaching and intellectual improvement. Not all of these women were Irish or even Catholic, but we know that teaching helped Irish migrant families to rise and stay secure, securely in the middle classes. Lizzie, Lulu, Su Susie and Laura were all part of that late 19th and early 20th century movement of women into the professions. I think it's vital that we consider these choices with consideration of the teaching role models that they grew up with, the Sisters of Mercy in this case and also the encouragement that they received from their teachers to write, publish, and engage with the world. This is a far cry from the image that many people have of Catholic schools during the 19th and 20th century, and the influence that these women and that space had on, children, uh, on students shouldn't be underestimated. Just briefly, uh, to conclude, as my book emphasizes, and as Sean Farrell noted yesterday, we must continue to place the histories of men, women and children alongside each other in our study of the Irish in Chicago, 
particularly when considering multi-generational immigrant community and community identity. Irish descended children didn't just join Irish associational culture and politics when they re reached adulthood. They were ensconced in friendship, familial, religious and educational networks throughout childhood, aided heavily by the national parish system in Chicago and facilitated by Irish religious orders and teachers, many of them women. We need to rethink or at least con consider expanding who we focus on as culture brokers. And as Jennifer Redmond argues, stop writing about Irish diaspora experience when we actually just mean the Irish male diaspora experience. That's fine to do, but we should recognize who we're writing about and how that shapes our understanding of which diaspora experience we're talking about. Thank you very much. And so keep your, your questions uh, for um, the questions uh, session at the end of the panel. And uh, for those of you who are online, uh, I remind you, to, you can use the tool, the question and answers tool for, for your questions. Um, so our next, um, our next panelist is uh, Catherine Healy, who is a postgraduate scholar at the Department of History, Trinity College, Dublin. Her PhD explores the cultural representation of Irish domestic servants in England and the United States from the late 19th century to early 20th century. And uh, today uh, she will be talking about the problem of Bridget managing Irish domestic servants in Gilded Age Chicago. Catherine, uh, the floor is yours for 20 minutes. Uh, so I want to speak today about um, Irish immigrant women in Chicago uh, in the late 19th um, century, specifically the kind of women um, that you see pictured here, the Irish servant who uh, scrubbed and polished and served in the homes of others. Domestic service is, of course, distinct from any other forms of labour in its intimacy. You're cleaning your employer's bed sheets, their dirty dishes, their underwear, you're overhearing arguments and whispered conversations. You're waiting at the side of rooms, in hallways, always there, often silent, often unreadable. <clears throat> Domestic labor offered Irish immigrants a unique site of interaction with bourgeois employers. And I argue that the nuances of the relationships developed within private homes need to be considered for a fuller understanding of how Irish immigrants were understood in their new host communities. Now, as many of you will know, um, household service provided the most readily available form of work for generations of Irish women who left Ireland in the decades after the famine. Um, it was regarded as, as suitable work for those many single uh, women who emigrated, providing as it did a uh, free bed and board and training in domestic skills. In Chicago, um, a remarkable 64.5% of Irish female immigrant workers were employed in service in 1880, as you see from um, these figures compiled by Patricia um, Kelleher, compared to 22.4% of native white working women. Although it's worth noting that um, the figure, as you see, went down to 31.9% um, for second generation Irish women, which is um, uh, a much greater reduction than um, than, for, than among the, the German population moving from first to second generation. Indeed, Irish born women made up 19% of all servants in the city by that same period. And as in other big centers of Irish settlement, <coughs> Irish immigrant maids and cooks were central to main discussions of household management in the press with middle-class social critics writing reams of newspaper commentary on how best to handle the frequently dubbed Bridget or Biddy. Now, studies of Irish female immigrants have often neglected the topic of labour management, focusing instead on broader social and demographic train, trends. And those scholars who do consider the contested ground between 19th century employers and servants have generally not touched on Chicago, prioritising cities like uh, New York and Boston. So I would make the case that a focus on domestic service in the American Midwest can provide new insight into how working class immigrants are perceived by, the property, by property classes beyond the northeastern coast which is already uh, well covered. What I'm trying to do in my research is to think about domestic service as an arena of ethnic and class struggle and considered how the middle-class home came to provide a key space to contain and reshape Irish. I think about servant management as an instrument of class power. 
going against that notion of service as a sort of semi-feudal occupation guided by uh, bourgeois benevolence a la Denton Abbey. There's a view in some of the literature that service was only a short-term job for Irish immigrants, only a stepping stone uh, to marriage, which is certainly true in a lot of cases, but the fact that women's time in service was temporary doesn't mean that those experiences had no class significance. So over the next 15 minutes or so, uh, I'm going to talk about the civic discourses that surrounded Irish servant management in late 19th century Chicago. I'm then going to look at the customs and rituals uh, through which employers sought to regulate class relations in the home. And finally, I want to talk about uh, local efforts to reform service and how I highlight how such visions of reform pay little heed uh, to the needs of workers themselves. Now, historical research over the last few years has challenged understandings of the late 19th century as a confining one for middle uh, class American women highlighting how domestic authority enabled them to enter the public arena in empowering ways. In contrast to that Victorian notion of the angel of the, in the house, American mistresses oversaw and carried out a wide range of duties in the home, and activists and reformers across the United States cited women's experience in that arena to defend their participation in politics and public policy. The, the argument often made was that household management required similar skills to positions in government and administration, and that female spheres of influence therefore ought to be extended from the household out into um, the wider community and nation. Women gain social standing not only for their capacity to handle a budget or care for children, but also their ability to make productive and respectable workers of the servants um, in their charge. The importance of good stewardship was emphasized in countless articles on domestic management, and particularly in cases where households relied on immigrant labor. In general, Irish female immigrants were considered a class suited to service, but a class still in need of continual supervision. As an article run by the Chicago Tribune put it in 1872, the poor class of Irish are born to servitude and accept the situation without question. With habits of submission for centuries have grown up little fault of dissimulation and kindred vices peculiar to the oppressed. The representative of the class is called Bridget. Bridget is found doing all grades of domestic labor in the chamber, the kitchen, the scullery, the nursery, she is quick tempered, liable to mistakes, and if not well taught, a continual trouble to a careful mistress. The little vices of deceit appear occasionally, and the family consumption of tea, coffee, and candles is found to be greater than could be reasonably expected. Um, but Bridget makes a good servant when thoroughly trained. She has a home feeling strong within her and is capable of earnest attachment to members of the household in which she is placed. There are many faults attributed to Irish servants in Chicago, but domestic commentators rarely ever dismiss their reformative potential. Um, mistresses were encouraged to patiently guide their Irish maids and cooks rather than um, dismissing them as incompetent. Um, a typical perspective on the, the so-called servant problem is found um, in these quoted lines um, as taken from an 1873 um, Chicago Tribune article, which, which states, an American lady ought to be a good cook, laundress, housemaid and dining room servant in order to teach the raw Irish servants who invade her home to become efficient servants. If she understands all these departments of housekeeping has patience and good nature, she can soon drill the Irish domestics so as to make them capable in their different departments. For the Irish as a rule are quick to learn and eager to improve if they find a mistress who is kindly and reasonable. Now the rationale for such an approach uh, was not simply goodwill. Um, it was stressed again and again that softer management styles would ensure not only more competent labor, but also smoother class relations, easing grievances that might uh, drive servants away from the sector. The unspoken basis of this argument is that workers themselves would never set the ground rules. Mistresses were urged to be kinder only insofar as it might increase loyalty on the part of staff. Loyalty didn't necessarily mean higher productivity, but uh, it was certainly crucial um, to reduce turnover and save employers the cost um, involved in hiring and training new staff, um, which was a real bugbear uh, for a lot of employers in the period. Still, there were more than strictly material considerations at work in how servants were managed. Um, another key imperative was the maintenance of class boundaries, um, especially for newly middle-class employers. The very presence of servants was a means of affirming a family social standing, providing a clear marker of bourgeois status. Such standing was reinforced by customs that conveyed to servants their own place um, in the domestic hierarchy, whether it be through architectural segregation and um, through uniforms and um, through naming practices and um, servants being called by their first names and, of course, mistresses being expected to to be um, to be referred to more more formally. Um, 
such a uh, household staff were taught not only to serve but um, to to accept and even take comfort um, in their assigned positions. And the rules and expectations under underpinning service brought wider power relations to bear in the most minute of daily interactions, extending social inequality into the private sphere. Now, the management of Irish domestic labour was to a certain degree contextually specific, but there was a consistent logic uh, to the assumptions underlying many approaches in prescriptive literature and fiction, as well as in actual households. Irish servants tended to be treated as childlike subjects in need of discipline and surveillance. This view of domestic staff as subservient charges worked not only to perpetuate class stratification, but also to enhance the self image of employers. Defining oneself against a domestic other was one of the key ways in which a sense of elite or bourgeois status could be established. But there was often a sense of fragility about such authority, a sense that one could be um, shown up um, at any moment. Uh, in, an, in an 1874 letter to the Chicago Tribune, the journalist um, Jane Grey Swisshelm argued that American mistresses had been too lately lifted from humble stations to learn the art of governing households. She explained the habit of command only comes through generations of culture and our, our, our aristocracy of wealth found yesterday live in a state of chronic war with the servants who hope to displace them tomorrow. So your American lady weighed to the earth by, the, by silks, velvets, laces and jewels necessary to advertise her husband's success in business becomes the easy prey of Biddy. There's this constant concern in American discussions of the servant problem that American democratic ideals, you know, were giving servants notions um, above their station and that American employers often compared their problems in ser with servant management to, you know, how things were run in England where uh, it, it was felt that a stricter class hierarchy um, made it easier to, to manage uh, servants. Now, the conveying of authority was not only a matter of, of supervision um, or control. Practices of benevolence were also used to solicit gratitude and, and respect from servants. One of the most common ways in which servant keepers strove to encourage devotion was uh, through the practice of gifting. As Barry Schwartz has written, uh, Presence can have social as well as material consequences, creating a feeling of, of indebtedness to the bestower. There are plenty of examples of servants receiving presents in recognition of loyalty and good conduct. Small rewards are even in some instances regarded as substitutes for fair pay. In a popular 1904 household manual, um, Christine Herrick suggested that extra work be compensated, not necessarily by money, but by a gift, the granting of an unusual privilege, or by relieving the maid of a part of her regular work. But low value presence also served to remind staff of their subordinate position in the household. After all, the material items considered appropriate for domestics were a clear indication of the extent to which they were valued by employers and anything deemed thoughtless or cheap only reinforced the distance between them. One Irish cook in Chicago, Mary Dempsey, left her employers in no doubt that she took issue with some of the gifts given to servants of the house. In Christmas 1885, she and other staff in the Glessner household received an umbrella and a fan, along with five dollars in gold. Her reaction fell far short of what her mistress expected. To quote um, from a Francis Glessner letter um, studied by Helen Callaghan, um, Dempsey's presents, all but the money, were afterwards laid on the dinner, dining table by herself, and she told both children that she had an umbrella and had no use for the fan. Fanny, which was uh, the, the mistress's daughter, had a cry over it. I have kept away from her until this evening when I sent for her and talked to her about how insulting she had been and silly when she told me she would leave if she couldn't suit me. Dempsey recognised perhaps that the gifting ceremony undertaken by her master and mistress only confirmed the inequality of their relationship. These are presents that communicated and um, read the social distance between worker and employer since only one party of the two was in a giving position here. Um, so she stayed on in this instance, but um, Dempsey finally quit two years later um, in opposition to new demands made of her after the family moved to another home on Prairie Avenue, one of the city's most exclusive addresses. As Francis Glessner described uh, their, their last quarrel, I called Mary in to tell her I wanted the children um, called Miss Fanny and Master George and thought this a good time to commence it. Uh, when I have new people coming in. She flew in a rage when I told her I wanted her to cooperate with me in seeing that the beds were made in the servants' quarters before breakfast. She was very impertinent and our talk ended in her flouncing out of the room uh, saying she would leave, which she did. 
Dempsey was again here challenging the hierarchical order envisaged by her mistress. Um, her employers might have set the terms of employment, but their symbolic authority was by no means guaranteed. In fact, it was continually challenged. Now, servants usually tended to avoid striking or open hostility um, in their dealings with employers, but the defiance expressed in more subtle ways was widely noticed and commented on and um, treated in, in public discourse as symptomatic of an improperly confident working class. You see in uh, discussions of household management in Chicago and elsewhere, a persistent thread of concern about the prospect of working class resistance and, and revolt beginning in the home. An 1872 Chicago Tribune article drew attention to a recent strike of servants in parts of England and, Sc and Scotland, describing the development as one of the most alarming features of the present agitation in the field of labor. The risk of such agitation spreading across uh, across the Atlantic to the States was embodied in the figure of the Irish servant. As a writer of this article put it, for, fortunately, American housekeepers have not yet had this finishing touch to the miseries of servant Gaulism, but how soon the disease may spread from Dundee to Chicago, who shall say? We may, with a fair show of reason, expect Biddy to be up in arms before long, bent upon getting more money and less work and more privileges and discharging their employers. The fallout from Biddy's uprising was imagined with withering disdain. It means a demand for two days out in a week that the maid may keep up her colleague acquaintances. It means that John Thomas, who does his courting at the front gate, shall have the drawing room. It means that Biddy shall have the requisite time for her musical studies. It means that the cousins to the ninth degree shall have free ingress to the house at all hours. It means that the housekeeper is to be tolerated as a necessity of the situation and must know and keep her place. Um, there's often this ridiculing of Irish uh, servants um, for, their, for their musical and uh, literary aspirations. That's uh, quite a common trope actually in, in kind of more satirical discussions of, of uh, the Irish servant problem. The supposed weakening of bourgeois domestic authority increasingly became a public as well as private concern over the late 19th century. Employers and commentators struggled to reconcile the desire for compliant servants with new social and political ideals that undermined traditional markers of authority. As more and more women left the sector uh, for other employment, American employers often expressed having no choice but to employ new modes of housekeeping um, in order to attract good quality staff. But the final goal of most reform efforts was not to abol abolish domestic service, but to boost its social standing in order to encourage longer and more faithful tenure. For many journalists, authors and social scientists, the so-called servant problem was as much an issue of political economy as trade or foreign diplomacy. Meetings of the Chicago-based National Household Economic Association, founded in 1893, for example, regularly heard of the importance of good home management for social progress. Elizabeth Boynton Harbert, a prominent author, um, philanthropist and suffrage activist, stressed this point in the group's annual address in 1896, saying that social, sociological problems would only be remedied once the social problem within the home, as she called it, was settled. The drive for better standards of housekeeping functioned as a sort of a compensatory form of power for many such middle-class women, given their limited influence in other political realms. As Vanessa May has written, uh, female reformers were not hesitant to leverage their supposed command of um, the private sphere as women in positioning themselves as experts um, on civic virtue and class inequality. And, and that wasn't limited um, you know, to American born women. There are plenty of Irish American mistresses as well um, who spoke publicly about the need for a better, better quality first, um, better quality servants um, and the need for better training for first generation Irish women as well who, uh, who were imagined as, um, as fit for service. Many housewives opposed state intervention in the private sphere, even as the idea of separate spheres began to lose currency, seeing regulation as a move that would weaken their command over the home. Efforts to improve household management, particularly coalesce around the emerging field of home economics. As Phyllis Palmer has noted, however, many of the college educated proponents of domestic science didn't see women like themselves having to complete their own housework and instead sought to establish the home as a center of female professional expertise, elevating the role of mistress. Another occasion he proposed solution um, was to uh, bring in Chinese servants to replace Irish women um, following the lead of many employers on the West Coast. Um, the author of an 1872 Chicago Evening Post article on the Irish servant problem in Chicago argued that the only remedy was, I quote, a wholesale rebellion which shall send to California for a thousand Chinamen to take the place of the high stepping maids. 
the rider continued by importing a few hundred or thousands of the docile alert economical imitative submissive pagans the housewives of chicago and vicinity might be immeasurably served and blessed um, and that that discussion of the the virtues of, of chinese labor as against um Irish labour um, becomes an increasing feature of um, discussions of the servant problem on, on the East Coast over, over the last three decades of the 19th century. Um, some reformers and writers went as far as to imagine uh, new forms of domestic living. Um, this Puck illustration from 1901, you might not be able to make out the captions, but it, it dramatises some of the discussions you see around this period in heralding the downfall of the kitchen tyrant um, thanks to a family apartment house where all domestic service is provided by management. Um, and you see it, the, the, the narrative progresses from the picture of you know, the, the poor Irish woman at home being called over to America and being greeted by her very well-dressed um, relatives there. And you know, getting again, getting ideas above her station um, and you know, demanding um, demanding money of, uh, you see the mistresses there on their knees. Um, and then the mistresses, I suppose, have the final laugh in, in uh, moving to, you know, this, this new domestic, in moving into this new domestic arrangement where um, there'd be no need for, for servants at all. That image of the Irish servant squeezing as much as she could from um, her desperate employers was a common um, theme in, in, in discussions of, of servants around this time, more so in places like New York where, um, Irish servants were even more dominant than uh, in Chicago, but you see, you know, you get tropes taken up from the Amer from the New York press and uh, by the by the Chicago press. So, is you know some of the kind of concerns that are arising from material mat material conditions in New York um, are transplanted, I suppose, into discussions in um, in Chicago. I don't have long left. Um, you're just past 20 minutes. Oh, OK. Um, I'll, I'll finish up now then. Um, yeah, um, I'll, 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 I'll uh, cut out my, my final paragraph. But um, just, to, just to conclude, um, shared by much of the reform thinking in Chicago and elsewhere was a focus on middle class managerial skills rather than paying conditions. Um, and the issue of labor contracts, for example, is generally absent for, uh, from plans for um, domestic reform. Um, and servants continue to be excluded from labor legislation well into the 20th century. But um, by the interwar period, it was mainly African-American women who had to deal with the poor conditions of service, um, women who usually weren't in a position to leave service after marriage, and women who are often discussed uh, in much less sympathetic terms than the Irish. But that's a whole other story, and I will leave it there. I'm sorry for running over time. It's OK. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and so our uh, last panelist for this um, this session is uh, Emma Morton, who is a researcher and teacher in applied linguistics in the Department of English at Liverpool University. Emma's publications to date use a mixed methods approach to examine the language of historical letter collections, including 18th century pauper letters and 19th century letters of immigration. And this is uh, what she is going to um, talk about today. Her talk being uh, Identity, Integration and Belonging, a Corpus Analysis of Letters by Irish Migrants in Chicago in the 19th Century. And uh, Emma, the floor is yours again for 20 minutes. Merci Paul et bonjour à tous. Um, so my background is in linguistics. Um, most of my research to date uses corpus linguistic methods of analysis to, his, uh, to explore historical text. So I should probably start by saying that um, corpus linguistic methods is uh, basically involves using computational tools to analyze large bodies of digitized texts. And the texts I've been looking at over the last few years are migrant letters, historical migrant letters. Um, so um, I've been looking at, uh, in particular, Irish migrants to America in the 18th and 19th centuries <clears throat> and what the language of their letters can tell us about the migrant experience. So I'm looking at things such as identity, experiences of integration and assimilation, 
and the way in which family relationships are changed and maintained over distance and time. Um, okay, so this presentation, I, I'll start by giving some background information about my project. Um, I'll then talk a little bit about the data that I'm using, and then I'll present a couple of case studies demonstrating the sorts of methods I'm using and the sorts of things I'm looking at. And then I'll briefly talk about next steps. So this is kind of a, a, work, in, a work in progress. So background first of all. Um, so as I said, I'm interested in migration from Europe to America in the 18th and 19th centuries. And to explore this, I've been collecting and digitizing letters written by Irish migrants to their family and friends back in Ireland. And these letters tend to go in one direction. So they're from America back to Europe, but sometimes we have letters from both sides of the Atlantic. And I'm interested in what the letters can tell us about the migrants' preoccupations, their beliefs, their experience, how they self-identify as Irish or American, how they assimilated and how they integrated into American life and culture. Um, generally speaking, anyone working with migrant letter collections, me included in fact, uh, tends to focus on a particular diaspora, so there isn't very much comparative work out there. Um, additionally, there doesn't seem to be very much cross-disciplinary work happening with migrant letters. So historians might use letters to explore push-pull factors and the role of institutions in the migrant progress, migration prog process, sorry. Uh, social historians might use the letters to explore the uh, life experiences of individual migrants and their families. Political scientists might explore things like political remittances, so how political ideas are exchanged between migrants and their wider social network. And finally, linguists uh, like me tend to use letters to look at language change and variation. So over the years, I've been really interested in finding ways of comparing letter collections and encouraging cross-disciplinary research. So a lot of what I do looks at ways of digitizing and annotating letters so that we can easily compare collections and share resources across disciplines. And I'll demonstrate this um, a little bit later on. Okay, so about the data. Um, so the Irish Letter Corpus, um, uh, it's at the moment, um, I've got 2,508 letters uh, written in English. So it's about a million and a half, uh, one and a half million words. The average length of the, the letters is 647 words. Uh, the corpus is split into four periods, so pre-famine, famine, post-famine, famine, post pre-World War One, and post-World War I. Um, and I have another, so that's where it stands at the moment. I've got another 2,000 letters that have been digitised, but they haven't yet been checked for duplications or metadata hasn't been added. And then there's a further 1,000 still to be digitised. So when, when finished, it will be about 5,000, about 5,000 letters. Um, the letters are gathered from two places. So first of all, the IED, the Irish Emigration Database, it has around 4,000 letters that have been digitized already. Now this is a fantastic resource, but there are some issues. So there's lots of duplications. Um, there are various issues to do with transcription. There were lots of transcribers and they weren't properly trained. And there's not much contextual information about the authors and there's very limited markup. Nevertheless, it's a really fantastic resource, as I said. It's probably the best digital resource of its kind that's out there at the moment. Um, the second data set, um, the second source, this was perhaps more rewarding to work with. So I spent several weeks at the University of Missouri going through Professor Kirby Miller's personal archive of over 5,000 migrant letters. Now Kirby is a historian, so as you can imagine, he's collected lots and lots of contextual information about each author their jobs, who they married, their religious denomination, where they lived, etc. So many of Kirby's letters are from the same place as the IED letters, so the Public Records Office of Northern Ireland. However, many letters were collected by Kirby through putting adverts in local Irish newspapers, asking people to donate their letters. Um, so he then photocopied them and returned them to the donors. So it's a, it's a really interesting uh, collection. It's all in paper format, but I believe it's now starting to be digitized now that I've spent the last three years <laughs> digitizing hundreds of letters. Anyway. So here's an example of Kirby's letters, uh, one of Kirby's letters, um, and another example, and another example here. So we can see that there are some issues with the manuscript. So you know, issues such as text overlay, incomplete letters, poor quality, spelling variations, so New York, New York, 
uh, grammar variations, lack of punctuation. So there are quite a few um, issues to do with the, with the letters when it comes to digitizing them. Um, now, Kirby uh, typically has a typed transcription of each of the manuscripts. So that's basically what I was working with when creating the corpus. So I had the original text, um, and then I had Kirby's um, typed transcription, typed on a typewriter. Um, and so I, I looked at both of those to create a digital version in plain text format um, that can be used with the corpus software so that you can analyze it for patterns in the language. Okay, so once I'd done that, I was able to add metadata to the corpus. So I captured all of the contextual information in an Excel spreadsheet. And this allows me to use computer tools to search for, for instance, all letters by female migrants who left Belfast to work as a servant in Chicago. So it allows us to do those kind of nuanced searches and then to compare uh, a component of the corpus with the corpus as a whole. Okay, so that's about uh, a bit about the data. So I wanted to give you a couple of examples, uh, brief examples of how I'm using um, the letters and how I'm analyzing the letters. The first case study looks at representations of home in the Irish letter corpus. And this is then compared with a German letter corpus very briefly. Um, I'll then focus on a letter collection by an Irish migrant to Chicago in the 19th century. So as is often the case with corpus linguistic methods, we start by looking at the whole corpus. We look at patterns in language in the whole corpus, all of the letters, all two, three, four thousand letters. And then we home in on one letter collection to see whether that's representative of the whole or whether it differs from the whole or not. So we're constantly moving between the whole and an individual letter collection. Um, so as I mentioned before, for some reason, there are very few comparative migrant letter studies out there. But I think the digitization of letter collections, which is happening more and more now, could change this. Um, so I've been looking at representations of home in my Irish letters corpus for quite some time, but it was really difficult to see the significance of my findings until the Irish experience is compared with another migrant experience. Um, so for example, the German migrant experience. Um, so digitizing and annotating the letters in a consistent way allows us to make these sorts of comparisons. Um, and that's what I want to talk about briefly now. Um, so a bit of context, first of all, um, now, Kirby Miller himself used the letters for his book, Emigrants and Exiles, which was published in 1985. You're probably really familiar with it. Um, Miller examines Irish migration to North America from 1607 to 1921. And he argues that although most Irish who crossed the Atlantic were voluntary emigrants who went abroad in search of better economic and social opportunities, that is for the same reasons motivating emigrants from other parts of Europe, such as Germany, they often viewed themselves as involuntary exiles compelled to leave home by forces beyond individual control, so particularly by British and landlord oppression. Having now read many of Miller's letters through the process of digitizing the letters, I think the theme of emigrant as exile does exist, but not necessarily in obvious ways. So that's sort of what I wanted to explore using, using corpus methods. So my main question was, how do migrants conceptualize home? Um, to, to explore this, I worked with colleagues at Zoes in uh, Berlin who have a corpus of German migrant letters and we wanted to see whether there is an exile theme within the Irish letters and whether this theme also occurs in the German migrant letters. Uh, the German corpus is quite a lot bigger, 5,400 letters. Okay, so to, to do this, uh, we use Sketch Engine. So that's the corpus tool that we were using. Sketch Engine allows us to search for words. It allows, allows us to look for distributional trends and frequencies, collocations, keywords, things like that. Okay, so here's uh, a visualization. It just shows the distributional trend for home in the, in the two corpus. So we're just looking for the word home initially. The green represents the Irish corpus and the red line represents the German corpus. So we can see that the term, the, the English term home and the German term Heimat are used at very different frequencies by the writers. So the visualization shows that home has always been present in the Irish corpus. So writers started using the term in the middle of the 18th century and it increased over the decades to peak in the beginning of the 20th century 
when it was used more than 30 times per 10,000 words. Its use slightly decreases during the 20th century. Now, if we compare that with the German near equivalent HIMAT, we can see it occurs at a much lower rate. The term HIMAT has a more narrow meaning, so it has quite emotional connotations, something akin to motherland, which might explain its overall less frequent use. Uh, but I'll come back to that in a moment. So throughout the second part of the 19th century, its use is somewhat more frequent, but remains somewhere between 1.5 and two times per 10,000 words. Compare that with 30 times per 10,000 words in the Irish corpus. Um, and during World War II, its use nearly vanishes. Okay, so some general observations then. So there are 3,007 instances of home in the Irish corpus, but only 894 occurrences of high mat in the German corpus. So we wanted to discount instances of home meaning house in the Irish corpus so that we would be left with home meaning something more akin to high mat. So to do this, uh, we qualitatively analysed half of the 3,000 seven occurrences of home in the Irish corpus to see what exactly home represented. So we basically looked at one and a half thousand concordance lines for home in the Irish corpus and tried to group them. What does home represent? What does it mean? So we found that 927 of those occurrences were used in a similar way to HIMAT, while 427 were used in the sense of house. So we discounted all of those instances where home means house, so that we're left only with those instances where home means something similar to high map. We want to be comparing like for like effectively. Um, okay, so um, I suppose the thing to say here is that what we found is that even when we compare like for like, um, when home has a similar meaning to high map, the Irish corpus still contains more than twice as many occurrences of the word. In other words, the Irish talk about home a lot in their letters. Um, okay, we then carried out a closer qualitative analysis of all instances of home and four themes were identified. Um, so we've got the theme of returning home, remembering home, comparing home and new world, and then news from home. And there are a couple of examples here. So she says when we got rich that she will go home. So that would be returning home. I wish I was home once more. I'm dreaming all the time of home. So that would be remembering home. And then we've got things like you would find everything strange to your customs and entirely different here from what they are at home. Uh, so that would be theme three, comparing home and new world. And then finally, theme four, news from home would be something like this. I got a letter from home about two weeks after I got yours. They told me all about the death of my brother. OK, um, I hope my connection isn't too unstable. I hope you can still uh, hear me OK. All right, so um, initial observations. So the Irish migrants are preoccupied with the notion of home. That's the first observation. And this appears to be a structuring element to their letters. So I will return home, I long for home, I haven't heard from home, it's not like home here, things like that. This is not the case in the German letters. Home more frequently occur, uh, refers to America in the German corpus. Um, this doesn't happen in the Irish corpus. Home doesn't refer to America. Home nearly always refers, refers to Ireland. Um, it's really it's really rare, whereas in the German corpus, it's quite common for home to be referring to America. Um, so while it's generally accepted that the Irish integrated faster into American society, at the same time, our study shows that they write about home significantly more than their German counterparts. And this preoccupation with home might go some small way to supporting Miller's emigrant as exile argument, but we kind of need to look into it in more detail. OK, so that's the kind of general overview. That's the that's the backdrop. I suppose this is what we do when we do corpus linguistics methods. We look for patterns in the whole and then we home in on a particular letter collection and say, well, is home represented in these ways in this particular letter collection or letter collections? OK, so I'll talk now. Um, about the Hall and Black collection. So having looked at uses of home in the whole corpus and having noticed what's different about the Irish experience when compared with the German experience, the next step is to focus more qualitatively on specific examples. So what we're interested in is whether our general findings represent the individual experiences. Um, and this is where we focus on uh, Irish migrants in Chicago. So the Hall and Black collection, um, 
there are 33 letters in the Hall and Black collection, the majority of which are written by John Hall and his brother-in-law, uh, Lytle Black. I'm not, I'm not sure about the pronunciation. Different people have told me different things, whether it's Lytle or Little. I'll go with Lytle for now. Uh, the letters date from November 1888 to March 1891. Uh, now, John Hall migrates to Pennsylvania in 1888. Lytle Black, his brother-in-law, migrates to Chicago in 1889. Um, very briefly, John Hall, um, he's a quali qualified solicitor from a middle class Presbyterian family. Uh, he migrates from Dungannon, County Tyrone, uh, to Washington County in Pennsylvania. And his experience of America is not a positive one. So unable to find work as a solicitor until he obtains American citizenship, he's forced to do short term manual labor, manual labor in mines. Uh, rarely able to cover his, exper uh, his expenses or by necessities, his letters read as warnings to family members not to leave Ireland. So his letters are full of things like this. My impression is that the ideas of people at home about America are all a mistake. You ask me how I like this country and for my candid opinion as to your coming out here. Well, to the first, I answer that I do not like it at all. And to the second, I say that any person who can live at home at all had better stay there. Now I'll skip... Uh, through the next couple of slides, but I just want to say, I suppose, in the John Hall letters, we see all of the four themes of home. So he remembers home a lot um, and he compares home and new world, generally in very negative ways, home is better. He's constantly asking for news from home. So we see all of the four themes of home uh, being represented in John Hall's letters, okay. In contrast, uh, Lytle Black, uh, despite John's advice not to migrate, and his letters are full of this, don't migrate, don't migrate, don't migrate, uh, he migrates. And he settled in Chicago by mid-September 1889. And Lytle's experience of America is altogether different to that of John. So a grocery salesman by trade, he finds work for $10 per week. Uh, almost immediately and within eight weeks he's increased his weekly wage to $14. Um, he quickly embeds himself into the Presbyterian church community in Chicago becoming a member of the various committees and regularly uh, dining with the pastor and spending evenings with the congregation and these two contrasting experiences of American life are expressed by uh, Lytle in a letter to his father-in-law dated 10th of September, 1889, not long, af not long after he's, uh, he migrates. Um, now, in terms of themes of home in Lytle's letters, we don't really see them. This is, this is the kind of interesting thing about this particular Chicago letter collection. Um, Importantly, while there's evidence of the four themes in John's letters, we don't see this in Lytle's letters. There's no reference to remembering home. There's certainly no reference to one day returning home. He fully embraces his new life in Chicago and speaks of America only in positive ways. By 1890, he's saved enough money to bring his wife and their three children to Chicago. Um, so his, his first impressions are really, really positive. Uh, similarly, when Maggie Black, his, his wife, um, uh, gets to Chicago, um, there are only two in her, less, uh, in her letters, there are only two instances where she writes about returning home. However, she makes it clear that uh, she makes it clear that this is very unlikely to happen. It probably won't happen. Um, in fact, she pretty much suggests that her family in Ireland come to her in, a, in, in America in Chicago instead. Um, OK, and finally, just some evidence of integration in the in uh, Maggie and Lytle's letters as well. So they're clearly integrating into American life and American society. Um, a few quotations here. We hope all, all are well and doing well like us Americans and uh, did Annie's fellow, as they say here, come at Christmas. OK. So uh, general observations, we see all four themes in, uh, of home in John's letters. We only see two of these less emotional themes in Lytle's and Mac Maggie's letters. Experiences of integration and assimilation seem to be linked to different factors. So Lytle's experiences in Chicago are much more positive, and this is probably to do with religious networks, work expectations, uh, and so on. OK, and next steps, I need to look at more of the Chicago letters. <laughs> Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.
we we will now open uh, the floor for um, discussions. For, so for those of you who are physically present, I already see uh, hands uh, being raised. Uh, you can uh, ask your questions. And uh, for those of you who are online, please use the, the question and answers uh, tool. And also uh, please specify uh, which panelists you, you want um, to answer your question. Henri? Uh, oh, for Brad, just to Thank you. comment <clears throat> between the white and the uh, Irish and the black, there was a photographer. They, they should know, but he was a Japanese. Yes. <laughs> Why? He was a yellow Japanese, and he became Al Capone private photographer. So I think Jun Fujita is exactly. the name of the photographer. Yes, he was Japanese American who took some of those most yes. uh, impressive yes. photos. Yes. He went to Wendell Phillips High School, graduated in 1906, and yeah, is a, it was a just so yeah. Do we know exactly if the man from the stones and the police police interview first was the Irish or not? We don't know. We kn I, I believe that that person depicted in the photograph who died is Oscar Dozier. It fits best with the data we have. It, it's not, it, it, that's, I think, the best fit. Um, we don't know. We know that it was near the stockyards uh, and, and part, of the, part of that story. I have more on Oscar Dozier's, you know, the, the violence there, but we don't know if that was Irish, if those perpetrators were Irish. So it's just a, uh, a question. You mentioned that some estates had racial covenants and some did not. Yes. Could you explain what, what those covenants are? Does it mean that physically an estate was reserved, physically or, or legally, was reserved for a certain group? So restrictive covenants in Chicago, I should have explained that, are legal documents attached to property that really governs the sale of it more so than who can live there. Uh, they, you know, they were uh, created after the 1919 race riots in order to uh, create legal forms of segregation. They're outlawed in 1949 by the Supreme Court. Uh, they are in some neighborhoods more than others. To do that, a, a community really has to organize and go door, door to door to neighbors and say, please sign this covenant and attach it to your property. It's not a law that's imposed really from above, it's from below. So it's, a, it's for neighborhoods to have large numbers of restrictive covenants means that property owners organized to resist the sale of their property to African-Americans and to Jews at, at, at times as well. So it's important to note that. The neighborhoods that uh, had those covenants tended to be more middle class uh, whereas Bridgeport and other working class neighborhoods did not have restrictive covenants to the same extent, they used the violence. I mean, to be restricted, to add a restrictive covenant took a certain level of sophistication as a property owner. Uh, that was perhaps, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's sophistication or whether the violence was sufficient, but we see restrictive covenants more in middle class neighborhoods than in working class ones and not in Bridgeport, which was right next to the black community. So they were using intimidation and violence to preserve their whiteness, their the white community. Okay, thanks. Yep. Uh, we have a question from Greg. Greg, if you want, you can turn on your mic and ask your question directly. Okay, thank you. Uh, I've been working on immigration of single women into central Illinois, Bloomington, Illinois in 1857, 1858 that was arranged by the Belfast philanthropist, Mayor Foster. He had an organization called the Women's Immigrant Protective Society that arranged for the migration of single women into Illinois. And um, his first group, he brought about 70 women into Bloomington, Illinois in 1857, and then uh, in 1858 moved his operation to Chicago. Uh, it had an impact I have found when I look at working single women uh, in the city directories of 1855. There are 52 women who are actually in the city directories as workers, which is a very unusual uh, kind of listing. And then comparing to the 1860 census, uh, we get about 120 women who are working uh, outside their home. And so this is a big jump in numbers, and I'm assuming that many of those women came through Foster's work. 
And so have you run into this early assisted migration effort? Uh, I'm, have, have you seen references to Foster doing this? Any of you? Um, I've actually, um, well, th that period is, is um, earlier than the scope of my research, but um, I don't know if you're familiar with Andrew Urban's book. Um, he, he writes on the migration and politics of domestic labor during the long 19th century, and he has a whole chapter on Vera Foster's work in that period. Um, and actually, I went up to Prony Archive in Belfast uh, just before COVID and looked through um, a lot of the applications uh, sent by um, people in Ireland to Vera Foster applying for financial assistance um, from the 50s up to the up to the 80s, which are fascinating treasure trove in themselves. And um, you get letters from you know parish priests from from local farmers um, applying for to, applying for money um, to help girls in, in their parish or their own daughters um, emigrate uh, to America. Um, so uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're the Vera Foster collection up in Prony and Belfast um, would, have, would have relevant material, I would imagine. Okay, what's the title of the book, please? Yeah, it's Brokering Servitude um, by Andrew Urban. So uh, he has, um, yeah, he has a whole chapter on, on Vera Foster's work in that period. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I haven't worked on them particularly, but um, I'd echo Catherine's kind of point, especially about Andrew Urban's book. Um, but you often find with these philanthropists that they don't want to send girls to uh, really kind of heavily industrialised spaces. Um, you have the same with Caroline Chisholm going to Australia as well, where they're trying to get um, local communities that are slightly more kind of rural um, are really calling for women to be sent out there. And also a lot of when the church gets involved, they don't want um, Irish girls and women being sent to kind of heavily industrialized spaces because they're spaces of sin. So uh, whereas the kind of more rural areas, um, yeah, are, are seen as healthier. Um, so you kind of have this kind of toing and throwing um, in the Irish communities as well in Mel in in. Chicago. Thank you. Uh, we we have a question from John uh, Brady. Uh, I'm not sure to whom that question is addressed. So anyone who wants to answer can can answer. Um, he was asking to what extent did the Irish immigrants in Chicago and elsewhere play out inherent national behavior patterns as distinct from responding defensively to the strange new and violent society in which they found themselves? I think that's a very, yeah, that's the central question that um, people like Jim Barrett and others have tried to um, think through. It is, I think if, if I'm understanding the question, is there inherent some something inherent in Irishness that makes them more violent. I that to me uh, or less violent or less violent. <laughs> uh, I it just strikes me as problematic. But I think uh, that both Andrew Diamond and, and maybe to a lesser extent Jim Barrett would say uh, that 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 the cultures of masculinity of this period uh, did promote levels of violence that may have had different cultural impacts among youth at that certain time and place in a much more bounded way than in some some other way but I, yeah I, this is that's the that's a question for the conference <laughs> but would you say that also chicago and the south side of chicago was a more violent place than where the, where their parents came from in ireland or there yeah so one of the points that both Dominic Pasiga and Jim Barrett, and, and I think um, others have made, is that the Irish involved in the race riots were not ne rarely first generation, more often second, third mm -hmm. generation. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I wouldn't know that they'd had an experience in Ireland of violence and therefore somehow um, brought that over in some way. I, I, the whole, yeah, I'm, I'm skeptical of that transmission vector if you will yeah uh, well and maybe we 
might be able to answer that question if we would compare Irish immigrants who went to places that had fewer gangs, say, than Chicago, yeah. perhaps. It'd be interesting to do a work with Emma's letters and talk and see about violence or beatings or, uh, I don't know, things, robberies, something in that data set to say, oh, writing home, I got robbed or I got beaten or I was in a, you know, my brother's in a gang or something like that or in a club. And there might be ways to tease some of that out of her data with more, a lot more work. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, yeah, definitely. Um, so, you know, um, and this is the, the beauty of using corpus tools, actually, you can kind of um, search for keywords and key terms um, or themes in the discourse. So I haven't seen much of that in the letters that, that, I've, that I've read, but, um, you know, there are quite a few letters that um, I digitize letters from the IED that I haven't read yet. And so um, yeah, I can do I can do a little search actually and see, uh, you know, it's it's quick <laughs> and see yeah. if anything comes up. And whether they, they talked about the, the 1919 race riots, for example, I had a question for you, uh, Emma. Um, I assume the letters in the corpus are transatlantic letters, that is people writing to people in Ireland. So is that correct? They don't include, for example, correspondence between immigrants who are would be both in the United States? Uh, no, that, so most of the letters are um, America back to Ireland, um, but there are still a lot of letters between family members within America. So for example, the Hall and Black collection, uh, John Hall's in uh, Pennsylvania and Lytle Black's in Chicago, and a lot of the letters are between the two where uh, Lytle's kind of saying, come to Chicago, you'll be much better here. We've got the networks and the infrastructure in place. And John, uh, he says, yes, yeah, okay, I will send me the money. Um, and uh, <laughs> Lytle sends him a load of money and then he, he, never, he never arrives. And then there are some um, uh, letter collections that are in both directions. So we have some collections where you get the letters from Ireland back to America and they're really nice as well. You've got both ends of the correspondence. So, but the majority are one direction, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, you, you, you raise your hand. Uh, yeah, well, if you could talk to the, to the microphone, which is good. So, I wonder if any of you are familiar with this barracks museum in the port of uh, Sydney, Australia. Uh, it's very interesting because in the second floor, the, the barracks museum was an actual place where the so-called convicts were housed up until 1850, who came from England largely. Um, then after 1850, it became a residence for Irish women who were seeking domestic uh, occupations, you know? And I wonder if you know anything about why a particular woman or group of women would choose Australia over America. Was that geographical? Was that class related? If you know anything about that? I mean, the, the conditions of the women there, it, it are, are very um, disturbing. They had to live there in a very difficult uh, situation until they got a spot. They seems as if, you know, the distance traveled was such that they didn't, or maybe it had nothing to do with the distance, but they didn't go there with it, a, a position. They were settled there until they got that position. They had to stay there almost as if they themselves were convict, so-called convicts, which largely meant that they were uh, poor, whether they're ma male or female. Um, but the women in, in general were not uh, coming out of jails or prisons or what have you so much as just that they were poverty stricken and were seeking employment in Australia. But I just wonder if any of you know anything about the relationship between those choices, why someone would end up in Australia and why someone would end up in America, a I woman. Mean, should I start that as someone who works on Melbourne and Chicago. Um, so the barracks that you're talking about are Hyde Park barracks and those women are part of a very specific um, kind of work scheme, the Earl Grey. Um, they're, they're known commonly as the Earl Grey orphan girls. Um, although most of them were between the ages of about 15, 16 and 30. 
Um, so this is a very specific scheme from the Irish workhouses, and it's, um, it takes place between 1848 and 1853-ish, 1842-ish. Uh, um, and those women are sent out, they are, they are chosen specifically from the Irish workhouses as kind of slightly better class uh, of women. They're separated from the rest of the workhouse um, people, um, from the women, uh, and they're taught domestic skills. Um, once they get to Australia, there's actually quite a lot of backlash against them. This is part of the reason that they're kept in those barracks. Uh, there's a lot of women who go to Adelaide. There's a lot of women who go to Melbourne. Uh, there's a lot of women who go to Brisbane, some Brisbane, to go to Brisbane, some go to Sydney. Um, and they're kept there kind of because there's a lot of, they're, they're kind of, they're named straight away by Protestants who are, are kind of angry about um, superior, like the fact that they got their um, passage paid, um, that this is kind of some preferential treatment. And so they are immediately called prostitutes. They're immediately called um, the kind of filth of scum of society. Uh, some of them do arrive there pregnant. Uh, um, I doubt they had much say in, in getting pregnant, considering that they were going straight from an institution onto a, a ship where they didn't have much movement. Um, so, um, so this is partly about protection. Um, and it's kind of seen as a kind of a, a holding place for them. Um, some of them did go out with 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 work contracts some of them didn't um so yes it wasn't in good they, they th those barracks are not nice places um the museum is excellent but they're, they're not nice places but women who were choosing to go to australia or into chicago a lot of the time they're going into not nice institutions if it was in the 1850s um, and they're not coming across in very good condition either uh, because of where they're leaving. Um, so a lot of people, the people you actually see going to Australia tend to be more well off if they're not coming on a government scheme uh, because they had to be able to afford it. And um, there's also some kind of preferential treatment for women, uh, not preferential, but uh, emigration agents want women to go because they're, they're becoming the, the white mothers of Australia. Um, so workhouses have to pay less to send them, whereas to go to America, you had to be paying your own way, effectively. Uh, I don't know if any of the others want to come in, but, but that's kind of an overview of, of the Australia thing. Thank you. Yes, please. Hi, um, this is a question for Emma. Emma, yes, uh -huh. uh, you, you mentioned um, you mentioned Kirby Miller's book, yeah, seminal book, uh, Emigrants and Exiles, but you did not mention uh, Donald Atkinson uh, uh, book. Book, sorry, uh, I was wondering. I mean, I found your uh, your speech very very interesting. Um, now, Atkinson uh, questioned the vision that Miller uh, uh, gave, is giving in his book, okay? Uh, and I was wondering if your research actually aims at settling uh, the, the dispute between the two men. Um, and I guess um, all this implies that there is a measure of subjectivity when uh, you read emigrants' letters. So I'm interested to... Uh, uh, get your views on this. Yeah, thank you for the question. It's a really good question. Um, yeah, and there's also Fitzpatrick's work as well. Um, so uh, he also uses uh, letters, but he looks at migrants to um, Australia. Um, so I suppose I'm not I'm not trying to settle anything, but <laughs> having read um, uh, Kirby's Kirby's work, Miller's work. Um, I, I sort of thought, well, it would be really useful to, to look at, to do a kind of corpus linguistic analysis of all the letters to see whether a linguistic analysis supports some of his arguments and uh, supports some of his uh, findings. Because I think one of the criticisms has been um, of Kirby Miller's book is that he might cherry pick a little bit. There was, I think I remember that might've been one of the arguments that, you know, he kind of takes 
uh, one letter and builds an argument around that. Um, and as I was reading his letters, I, I, I have over the over the years started to think, no, I, I think there is this theme in the letters, but it might it might be present in more subtle ways um, through kind of repeated use of language, not obvious statements, but just kind of an underlying theme of homesickness and exile. And, you know, and this is something that we're finding with um, home, just the word home, how it's used so frequently um, by the by the Irish migrants and mostly it's used when talking about remembering home and missing home and wanting to return home so this is you know this is um, I guess what I wanted to, to do was to see um, whether a corpus analysis would build on Kirby's findings or support them or challenge them I'm kind of open really to you know whatever the data's lead in the investigation really um, and I suppose the other thing that um, I wanted to, to do is once once we've got all of these letters digitized, we can then start to compare different experiences. So, you know, we can compare, you know, the experiences of Irish migrants to America with Irish migrants to Australia or elsewhere as well. Are there differences in how they conceptualize home and talk about home? Do they perceive themselves as exiles and things like that? Um, does that answer your question? Yes, very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, um, thank you to all. I think uh, we are going to, to take a break, lunch break here in uh, Paris, and uh, we will uh, reconvene at uh, 2 p.m. Uh, Paris time. Uh, thank, to, thank you to the four of you and to um, the audience as well. Um. Well, year of Galair, Foyterov, Gadi, Session and Tronona. Welcome everybody to this afternoon session. We have um, three speakers instead of the uh, announced four speakers. Uh, Kuan will not be with us. Um, so we're going to start with uh, Brian O'Krahur. I'm going to e introduce each of the panelists. Um, before they speak and we're going to keep questions for the end of the session. So the, uh, our first speaker is Brian O'Connor, Associate Professor of Irish Language and Literature at the University of Notre Dame. Recent publications included, include his co-edited Routledge International Handbook of Irish Studies and um, in 2022 he will uh, publish um, a, an edited volume, Bones and Marrow, Knovis Smir, an anthology of Irish poetry from medieval to modern um, with Wake Forest University Press. Brian, over to you. Uh, thank you all very, very much. Um, our colleague Kuan O'Sheridan is uh, the project manager on one of the Iron Islands and unfortunately power to the island was cut off this morning. So he is in splendid isolation and he sends his apologies. Uh, my task today is to uh, set the groundwork, set the table, so to speak, for my two colleagues, uh, Maureen Nick Ward and Liam Mahmahuna, who will address uh, Douglas Hyde's famous visit to Chicago in January 1906. And what I want to do is to lay the groundwork uh, for that visit. Um, the Irish language in North America is not so much uh, understudied as unstudied, uh, specifically when it comes to Chicago, for as little uh, as we know about Philadelphia, New York, Boston, San Francisco, we know almost nothing um, about Chicago. And the way this is generally uh, treated in histories is uh, something along the following lines. Because they spoke English, the Irish had little need to create institutional, complete ethnic communities like Chicago's Polish or Germans. However, for the vast majorities of, of Chicago's Irish, Catholic parishes remained the focal point of their lives and their neighborhoods. And the narrative uh, switches then from language to Catholicism, to church organization, to schools, and then uh, democratic politics. So what I'd like to do in this talk is sketch out uh, 
an overview of the Irish language uh, from the beginnings of the city in 37 up to uh, the arrival of Hyde in 1906. And I'd like to break it down into three sections. Uh, Pre-fire, in which we have isolated references to the Irish language. And then the period 1870 to 1893, where we see a lay secular um, urban movement with some uh, specific uh, endeavors in the realm of education. And then the third period, uh, the introduction to the golden era for the Irish language in Chicago, which is 1983 onwards, where we see the clergy, the Catholic clergy being very, very involved and the integration of the Irish language movements in Chicago into a broader, wider trans transnational movement. So um, a common uh, mistake is that it is it's often cited that the citizen newspaper in chicago ran new, numerous articles in irish in the 1860s and that i believe is um, just a genuine typo in a very very famous article uh, the citizen newspaper doesn't begin until the 1880s so yes there were irish language articles in that paper in the 1880s but not in the 1860s the earliest reference i can find to the irish language uh, occurs in 1821 in the edwardsville spectator which was a weekly anti-slavery newspaper that ran from 1819 to 1826 in the recently incorporated edwardsville uh, city in illinois and then 1855, in the Sa uh, Sagamo Journal from Springfield, the state capital of Illinois, we come across a small article on the Irish language translation for the, uh, tele for the electric telegram, which back then was cutting edge technology. And it informs us that the literal translation uh, of telegram into Irish is scale in more butter. Uh, that's remarkable because that exact same story will reappear in the Irish language press in Ireland in the 1890s. Uh, that's pretty much it for pre-Civil uh, War uh, references to the Irish language. Uh, in contrast to Boston, Philadelphia, there does not appear to be any Irish language slogans or mottos on the flags associated with the regiments in Illinois. And then, of course, 1871, we have the Great Fire. And it's in this period that the Irish language becomes institutionalized in New York, New Jersey and Boston. So you have the beginning of the Irish language organization in Brooklyn with uh, Michael J. Logan, the Irish language newspaper. And in 1873, you have the Philo-Celtic Society of, of Boston. And it's in this context, the following year, 1873, we have a strange comment in the uh, standard newspaper in Chicago on the 1st of May, where the editorial is happy that German is falling into disuse in the public school system. There's no more point to teaching German than there is in teaching Scandinavian, French, Italian, or Irish. And this is the first reference to Irish in the educational system. Uh, it's follow the following week, I, I, I'm not quite sure whether that was a red herring or not, but the following week in the Sunday Times, another Chicago newspaper, we find an announcement that all Irishmen who can read or speak or who are desirous of reading and speaking the Irish language are requested to meet at schoolroom at 204 Brimmer Street. And again, the following week, we have another reference to the Irish language asking who will dare to vote against the teaching of Irish in Chicago's public schools. This is not out of context. We find similar movements in Boston, and New York to have the Irish language introduced into the public school system uh, as a subject. However, it's not in Chicago, it's in Joliet in 1874 that the city council authorizes the school commissioners to employ a teacher whose duty shall be to teach the Irish language in the public schools of this city. The matter was at first regarded as a burlesque, but the action of the council has made it a serious fact. The old saying, no Irish need apply, is played out here. It is an Irishman we want, and a genuine one too. That report comes from the Daily Argus. So in 1874, uh, the Brooklyn Philo-Celtic Society announces that there are 50 schools of Irish uh, throughout the US, and Chicago 
is included. And in 1875, we find that those who are interested in Irish are meeting in Judge Booth's rooms in City Hall in Chicago. And that name may ring some bells because that's Judge Henry Booth, the Dean of the Law School at the University of Chicago, who was uh, the first Dean to admit African American students to that law school. Um, Booth had no Irish connections. He appears to never have learned Irish, know nothing Irish, uh, has no connection uh, with Ireland or with the Irish. Uh, similarly, we find Irish language groups meeting in Judge Rogers' rooms uh, in 1875, and there's a move to establish a magazine for Celtic literature, an old language that is now surely fading into nothingness. And this is uh, one of the first references we get to the decline of Irish. So we have these two strands running in tandem, efforts to revive, learn, speak the Irish. At the same time, the language is, is on its way out. There's a series of Q&As, questions written to newspapers throughout the 1876, uh, 1977. Is there a printed grammar of Irish? Are there dialects in Irish? And uh, over and back like this. In 1877, Chicago newspapers report that the Society for the Preservation of the Irish Language has been founded in Dublin, and they hope that American organizations will link to this new organization. Um, it's in 1879 that the famous, or the infamous, Thomas O'Neill Russell makes his first appearance uh, in Chicago, where he gives a lecture on the Irish language in the Opera House. Um, O'Neill Russell is a pre-famine character. Uh, he was born in Westmeath in 1828, uh, the son of a Quaker. He was a co-founder of the Society for the Preservation of the Irish Language in 1876. Uh, he moved to the United States, to New York, where he became a traveling salesman, a commercial traveler, uh, which took him to every state in the Union. And while he frequently gave speeches and was a um, a great promoter of the Irish language. He held very, very strong views on grammar, on spelling, on the use of font, and he tended to fight and argue with everybody uh, he met. Um, in 1879, we find in the exchange room in the Pacific Hotel, the St. Patrick's Society, uh, heard a lecture by O'Neill Russell. This is one of the most prestigious uh, hotels in Chicago, in post-fire Chicago. Uh, it's located on the block uh, bounded by Clark Street, LaSalle, Quincy and Jackson. And it was one of two prominent hotels built after the Great Fire. And it's here that Oscar Wilde would stay in 1882. Um, we have regular announcements that Chicago Public Library is purchasing academic Old Irish books as they are published. And um, again, we find letters over and back requests for songs and translations. Uh, M.P. Gallagher of Cortland, Illinois writes in looking for a translation and, and Miss Gallagher of Chicago provides a translation the following week. It's in 1885 we find the first reference to the Chicago Gaelic Society, and they meet on a regular basis at LaSalle, at LaSalle Street on the corner of Adams. And they send a petition to Charles Street Parnell in 1885, requesting him to promote the Irish language and to stop the decline of the Irish language uh, in Ireland. I'm not aware of any other request from any other language organization to Parnell. So this might be quite distinctive. Uh, the major figure here is Morris Crean from Dingle, native speaker of Irish, who appears to be the first teacher of Irish uh, in Chicago. So in 1886, we hear that uh, there are, there's another Irish language class meeting in the uh, Sloshinger's building on northwest corner of Adams and LaSalle, and there's an invitation to Scots speakers, speakers of Scots Gaelic, to join them. And there's an apology that they're meeting on Sundays, as this may cause problems for some of their Presbyterian brethren, but they apologize that there's no other way around it, seeing that the instructors are living up to four or five miles away from the building. Uh, in 1887, the true Republican. Uh, 
a semi-weekly pro-Republican pro newspaper published in Sycamore, Illinois, publishes a long article on the Irish language in North America in general. It talks about New York. Uh, it talks about the, the, the desire of American-born children of Irish parents to learn their native language and music and how, as a rule, these children come from the poorer classes. Uh, it's noticed as that the study of the Irish language has been in vogue in the United States for some 20 years. Uh, and today there is a Gaelic society in most of the large eastern cities, and one has just been formed as far west as Omaha. It then makes the point that on this work of teaching the Irish language, only Brooklyn rivals Chicago. And the, late, the lead figure in Chicago is a David J. O'Keefe, who was best posted regarding the Irish language and literature as any man of this country. Uh, on the side, uh, a no, side note here for a moment, but it's too good to pass over, is the proposal by a, uh, a Mr. May, which takes up a lot of space in the newspapers in the late 1880s is May's uh, suggestion that the Irish in America combine. They get a grant from the French government, they form a syndicate and they buy Southern California. Southern California will become an Irish speaking state. They, all the immigrants from Boston, Philadelphia, New York, Chicago, will relocate to Southern California. They will raise an army, they will raise a navy, and over time they will sail around South America back to Ireland. They will invade and recapture Ireland uh, for the Irish. But um, it's worth noting that this will become an Irish language uh, state. At this point, uh, the GAA is quite strong in the west side of the city, and 1891 sees the first hurling game between Inish Falls and Grattans takes place on the 4th of July. Uh, we know that an S. O'Brien is paying for numerous copies for himself and for others of Irish Lauren uh, Gaelga in Chicago. And it's in 1892, this is a year before the Gaelic League is founded in Dublin. The Chicago Daily Tribune reports that Morris Crean, who resides at 1909 India, Indiana Avenue, is reviving the defunct Gaelic school. This is the Gaelic school we mentioned in 1884, which meets on Sundays in the courtroom. And amongst the major players here are William Rawley, P.F. Conway, Richard Coleman and Michael Murphy. And the newspaper makes, makes a big deal that these are all bald men with moustaches. Uh, I think here the distinction is to make that they're not children, that these are adults, uh, respectable men, middle class, learning the Irish or learning to read the Irish, which implies that they're native speakers, but they don't have literacy. So they meet twice a week, possibly not only to read, but speak. And this is no new thing. Six years ago, in 1884, Jay Crean taught in Judge Knickerbocker's courtroom. He was obliged to give up after two years as he had to uh, move out of the city for work. They relocated to the Jesuit school on West 12th Street, uh, where instruction was under William Raleigh. The distance from the school was a problem. Uh, numbers declined, but now Crean is back in the city. and they are, The group has come to the attention of the New York traveling salesman, O'Neill Russell from New York. So this Crean is a native of Dingle County Kerry. He came to the US in 1851. He resided chiefly in Illinois, in Galena, Cairo and Chicago. He was well versed in English, Irish and Latin, and he did as much to promote the Irish language in Chicago as anyone. He was a Democrat in politics, but belonged to the Douglas School of the party. And during the war, he held the position of assistant postmaster at Cairo, Illinois. Um, uh, Mr. T. Winter Cronin from Houston, Texas, writes to this Gaelic organization, suggesting that they form a military company and 32 men from the class join and Crean translates the US Army drill book into Irish and they're drilling on a regular basis. We're a long way here from the Gaelic League being a non-political, uh, non-sectarian organization.
Uh, at this point, there is a regular column in the Roman font in Irish in the Chicago Citizen. Uh, we know that on Gael, the New Jersey Irish language newspaper, is available in Chicago from MJ Geraghty at 432 West 12th Street, from J. Donahue at 253 Wabash Avenue, uh, from H. Radzinski at 283 North and 2863 Archer Avenue, and finally from a Mr. Gorman's newsstand in Joliet. Um, that brings an end to that middle period uh, in Chicago, where it's remarkable, marked by the absence of Catholic clergy. It tends to be lay figures from Ireland. It's an adult uh, organization, uh, remarkable for the number of judges and the use of uh, courtrooms, state buildings, uh, official uh, premises. Um, it's in 1895 that we begin to see the Reverend John J. Carroll, who's the parish priest at St. Thomas's Church on Kimbark Avenue and 55th Street becomes uh, a major player. So on St. Patrick's Day, he delivers a sermon in Irish, which is printed and translated in all of the Chicago newspapers, and it's written on a Gaelic typewriter. So from a dinner uh, in a, for, on St. Patrick's Day in 1895, there will be an organized effort to make Chicago take an efficient part in the Gaelic revival. And central to this is the arrival of Father uh, O'Growney, uh, the father of the Gaelic League in Ireland, uh, the author of the text, very famous textbooks, will return to Chicago and during his stay this project will be matured. And it makes the point that O'Grady's textbooks are, are as available as English books throughout the city. Um, as we know, O'Grady came to the US because of ill health. He was suffering from tuberculosis. He moved to California, finally Arizona. He would die there and his body would be returned to Ireland in a, a major funeral uh, state, uh, state procedure. Um, at this point, William Dillon, who is the editor of the New World newspaper in Chicago, becomes a member of the Council of the Gaelic League in Ireland. While P.F. Holden, who is a key player in Chicago, becomes a vice president of the Gaelic League of America. The 1898 report on the Pan-Celtic, a newspaper, sorry, the newspapers in Chicago report on the Pan-Celtic Congress, but they stress that the Gaelic League is much more active and much more practical, and again, it emphasizes the Chicago branch. Uh, something which I want to share with you, if I can, is uh, an article that ran in the uh, Chicago Tribune, uh, a debate over just how uh, cosmopolitan Chicago was. And as a response, they run the following on the uh, front page. So, the, okay, so uh, the headline here is um, proof that Chicago is cosmopolitan and you have specimens of many languages spoken by the inhabitants of the metropolis. So down here we have ni an aum no ur er bi er dinna, bool an tiran fadas ata she te. Uh, time waits for nobody, strike the iron while it is hot. Uh, again, you'll notice that's more Gaelic, Scots Gaelic, than it is Irish. And you'll see down here further down. Uh, in appearance, the Irish language has much resemblance to that of the Greek dialects. Resim uh, dialects, different ones of which are spoken in almost every county in Ireland, make it difficult to present what one might call a distinctively Irish translation of the proverbs. The best Gaelic probably would be written as given. A branch of the Gaelic language spoken in Scotland has none of the same pronunciation and little of the same construction. A good Scotch scholar has written the translation of the sentences. What would that so 1898 we have Irish it's recognized uh, it's front page of the uh, the Chicago Tribune and by 1901 we have five Irish language groups Irish language schools operating in Chicago we have the Celtic club branch of the Gaelic League who are working in the Knights of Fifus Hall on Lock Street and Archer Avenue. We have the Chicago Gaelic League which meet on Sunday afternoons at 2 p.m. in City Hall. We have the McHale branch 
of the Gaelic League, 2 p.m. Sunday in the Sodality Hall on 12th Street and, Mary's, and May Street. We have the South Chicago Historical Branch of the Gaelic League. They meet at 8 p.m. at 9206 Commercial Avenue, South Chicago. And we have finally the Irish Language League of Chicago, and they meet between 3 and 6 p.m. on Thursdays and 8 and 10 p.m. at St. Bernard on Sundays, St. Bernard School, 66 and Stewart Avenue. Um, so cities Chicago, we have at least three Gaelic League branches and two other organizations. And in terms of what they do, their activities, they are pretty much the same as Gaelic League club societies branches in Ireland uh, or England. Uh, there are classes followed by history, lectures, dancing, literacy, some uh, silent movies are, are screened as well. Um, 1901, we see the fourth National Congress of the Gaelic League of America coming to coming to Chicago. And again, uh, the speakers and the lineup here reiterate just how central the Catholic clergy have become to the Irish language movement in Chicago. The sessions of the convention will be held in St. Bernard's Catholic Hall. The convention will open with a military mass which will be celebrated at St. Thomas's Church and at which a sermon in Gaelic will be preached. Addresses of welcome will be delivered by the Reverend J.K. Fielding and Mayor Carter Harrison of Chicago to which the national president, Stephen J. Richardson of New York will respond. A mass meeting will be held at the auditorium on the, uh, on the adjournment of the convention at which the Reverend J.K. Fielding will preside, the Reverend John J. Carroll will deliver an oration in Gaelic, and the Reverend P.C. York of San Francisco, one of the leaders of the Gaelic movement, will deliver an address in English. Short talks in the Gaelic revival will also be given by the Reverend Richard Hennebury, Professor of Celtic Languages at the Catholic University, Bishop Scannell of Omaha, and the Reverend J.B. Dollard, who, under the name Schlieff Naman, has become one of the best known writers of the Gaelic movement. The musical programme will be under the direction of Francis O'Neill, Chief of Police of Chicago, who is said not only to be a Gaelic scholar, but also a performer on the Irish bagpipes and an authority on Irish music. And it's notable here that Green... Yeah. Uh, could, I, yeah. could I remind you that we're over 20 now? Okay. Okay, great. Uh, so I'll finish up there. The last thing is uh, they made a big deal that the orange was mixed with green and white so that the Northern and Protestant members would be comfortable. So the idea that there wasn't Irish in Chicago doesn't make sense. And I'll finish with a 1904 report by the University of Chicago uh, by Professor Carol Darling Buck, Professor of Sanskrit, who argues that there are somewhere between 10,000 and probably as many as 15,000 Irish language speakers in Chicago in 1904, at the end of 1904. And that brings us to the Douglas Hyde visit. My apologies for going over. That was a fascinating insight into Irish in Chicago. We're going now to Dr. Maura Nicholvord, who's a lecturer in Irish language and literature and history of education in Maynooth University. Um, her areas of teaching and research include the life and work of Douglas Hyde, um, Ireland's first president censorship of Irish language literature from 1920 to 1960. She's also interested in children's literature in the Irish language and education for the Science Society Nexus and in the history of education. She is currently collaborating with Professor Liam McMahuna on the life and work of Douglas Hyde and the first volume of this work will be completed in 2022. Uh, Douglas Hyde was founding president of the Gaelic League, first professor of modern Irish in UCD and first president of an independent Irish state. This paper will examine Hyde's own account of his highly successful eight month Gaelic League fundraising tour of the United States and Canada in 1905-1906. Hyde's visit to Chicago in January and April 1906 will be central to this analysis. The tour was both a fundraising and an awareness raising endeavour. During the eight months he spent in America, he visited some 50 cities, 12 university campuses, and was twice invited to lunch in the White House with President Theodore Roosevelt. 
He succeeded in collecting $50,000, thought to be the equivalent of more than a million dollars today. The visit was meticulously planned and choreographed by John Quinn, a wealthy New York-based lawyer and spearheaded by Tomás Cunchanan, the league's chief organizer who had previously lived in the States for many years. The Chicago operations of Hyde's tour was arranged by Francis Hackett. Hyde arrived in Chicago on the morning of the 7th of January, 1906, and there was a welcoming committee, as is evident in the new and critical translation of Mahersk America, published in 2019. You can see the cover of the book there on the slide. The 7th of January, we traveled overnight by train and reached Chicago at 8.50. A smart, welcoming committee greeted me, including Tommaso Concanon. They brought me to the hotel, the auditorium above the lake and kindly allowed us to rest until four o'clock. So here we can see there's a photo. I wanted to show you one of Lucy and Douglas Hyde. Lucy accompanied Douglas, so Lucy was Douglas's wife, to America. And this is the two of them in Chicago. Underneath the photo, you can see compliments of Father Fielding, Chicago, 7th of January. 1906. Father Fielding is mentioned by Hyde and Brian mentioned him there in his paper throughout his visits to Chicago from January until April 1906. Hyde refers to him as my old friend. On the 12th of January 1906, the following was written by Hyde. I spent the afternoon with O'Neill. Again, Brian mentioned O'Neill earlier, once the chief of police, now on pension. It was Father Fielding who took me out. Every piper, fiddler or musician from Ireland that came to Chicago, O'Neill cornered them and recruited them into the police and in due course collected their music and tunes from them. He produced several large books of the tunes and he gathered that tunes he gathered from these Irish musicians. Fielding took Hyde out to meet the former chief of police, Francis O'Neill. Father Fielding was a friend of Captain Francis O'Neill's in Chicago, who, like O'Neill, played the flute and was interested in preserving traditional Irish music. Fielding was also a Gaelic League activist and believed in Ireland for the Irish. O'Neill said that Fielding was so taken by this tune that you can see on the slide and promoted it so enthusiastically that it became known as Father Fielding's favourite. O'Neill also said that his reverence induced the good sisters of the parish to teach it to their most promising musical music pupils while he cheerfully accompanied them on the flute. John Quinn was born in Ohio in 1870, the oldest son of Irish immigrants. From an early age, Quinn was fascinated by literature. I became a collector of books, he later wrote, almost as soon as I ceased to be a collector of marvels. Moving to New York after, Quinn quickly established himself as an accomplished and affluent lawyer. He became a patron of the arts and a champion of the revival period. Douglas Hyde's book, Maharaska America, My American Journey, is dedicated to John Quinn, which highlights how Hyde wished to bestow a very high honour on, on him and to praise him for his work as chief organiser of the tour. This highlights the importance of John Quinn to the whole operation. I'll read you out now the first passage of the book taken from Douglas Hyde's My American Journey. I first encountered John Quinn, an American lawyer from New York in August 1900. I clearly remember the first occasion I saw him. I was on the stage that had been erected, speaking as lively as possible in Irish to the audience, when I noticed a tall, slender and distinguished man in the midst of the crowd listening intently. When the event ended and the speeches concluded, I met the tall man again. We spoke and he informed me that he was touring Ireland on holidays. I believe he was Lady Gregory's guest at her residence at Cool House. I conversed with the American and he inquired about the Irish language in Ireland. He apparently heeded my answers as I received one or two letters from him once he returned to New York, stating that if possible, I should come to America where I would receive assistance from him and others. He was very interested in anything concerning Irish arts and literature and had read the books I had written. I believe, said Judge Kyo, that he did, did what nobody else in America ever did. He read your literary history of Ireland twice. He was close with the poet Yeats and had brought him to America a few years earlier, guiding him from city to city and from university to university. The Gaelic League considered the possibility of sending someone to fundraise in America. I alone was available. And as president of the League since its establishment, there was, in their opinion, no one more suitable than me. The 
Patrick McMullen bequest of 1895 led to the employment of the Gaelic Leeds first Timra or organiser in 1897. And the person appointed to this position was Thomas Bono Cunchanan, the man who acted as, as advance agent for Hyde in the US in 1905-1906. Again, taken from the book, Thomas Bono Cunchanan was selected to travel as the advance man. Born in Inishmian, one of the Aran Islands, Thomas had gone to America when he was 17. When Thomas Bonn returned home in 1898, he found the Irish language movement in full flow. He assisted it, and as the first Timura community language organiser, he was the finest resource. He traversed Ireland, north, south, east, west, organising for us and promoting the Irish language gospel. As a result, he knew Ireland and the States well. He was selected, therefore, to travel in advance of me. He was the advance man for me in many of the cities and states in the US. Were it not for his groundwork, we would not have raised so much money for the Gaelic League. Hackett was born in Kilkenny, Ireland. He immigrated to the United States in 1901 for various reasons, among them being his dissatisfaction with the British government ruling Ireland and his family's inability to finance his college education. When he arrived in New York, he published articles in Standish O'Grady's All-Ireland Review, Arthur Griffith's United Irishman and Samuel Richardson's The Gale. Hackett took a series of jobs as a clerk in a law firm for the advertising department of Cosmopolitan magazine and literary editor of various periodicals such as the Chicago Evening Post. In 1906, Hackett moved into a whole house and taught English to Russian immigrants. He left his position as literary editor of the Post in 1911 to pursue a career as a novelist and died in 1962. In Hackett's memoir, the following is written, Douglas Hyde told me I'd been a help, invaluable. He couldn't have done without me. There is correspondence between Hackett and John Quinn in the National Library Ireland about Hyde's trip to Chicago, which Hackett helped to organize. The following is written in Hackett's memoir, American Rainbow, published in 1971. Probably at the suggestion of John Quinn, I became secretary and press agent for a meeting of which, at which Dr. Douglas Hyde was to speak on the revival of Gaelic. It was not a writer's work, but I took it on. It took a month to organize. It was a cause. Hackett wrote a handwritten letter in English on the 11th of February, 1906 from 16 Astor Street, Chicago. The Murphys and Hotel um, Virginia are mentioned, which I will go into, into in detail later. My dear Dr. Quinn, Dr. Hyde's little rest here did him a lot of good and he and Mrs. Hyde went away on Tuesday looking very well. Mrs. Hyde found the Murphys a nice family living at the Virginia, very attentive to her during her stay. They took her to several concerts and the theatre and she was very much at home in their suite with the three girls. Everyone enjoyed Dr. Hyde, his simplicity and his warmth delight everyone, especially the Americans. I wish we had more like him. I've been very much rushed the last two or three months and haven't seen anybody. Between you and me, this has come to be a tiring grind but I'm going to see it through to the end. I have real affection for Dr. Hyde and there is nobody else in the world for whom I would do more. Thomas, Hackett and Quinn together in their own way helped make a success of Hyde's tour. However, Quinn and Thomas did not get along. Lucy also didn't like him. I would, go, I would go so far as to state that Quinn could not stand him. This is evident in Quinn's letters to Hackett in 1906, again housed in the National Library Ireland, where he describes Thomas as the following. Concannon is rotten with vanity and conceit. The funny thing about these Irish asses is that they think they know America and know the ropes. Concannon for me does not exist. I wouldn't have minded his stupidity, but his egotism was un unendurable. He simply knew it all and had the worst case of swelled head I have seen in a long time, either in this country or out of it. Did you ever know, P.S., did you ever know the meaning of the Irish word ossel? It fits Concanon exactly, and a very literal translation of it is jackass. Ossel is my unanimous verdict on Concanon. Pamal Spawn, as uh, one of the main organizers of Hyde's trip to America, was sent proofs of the book Maharaska America, which Ngoom published in 1937. There is correspondence in the National Archives Dublin about the publication process surrounding this book. Thomas was sent the proofs of the book by Ungoom and wrote to Hyde in September 1935, and this letter is in the National Library Ireland, and he outlined his concerns about the manuscript. This letter highlights the atmosphere of the time which was ripe for self-censorship. He uses strong language such as upset, mental disturbance, when referring to, to the Ruddy Bioga, the small things that would upset Irish people at home and across the seas. 
These Ruddy Bioga are his, the references to alcohol. Tomás wrote about the work he did in America and his recommend, recommendation was that this page would be put into the book on page five, where there are the references to the first time that Tomás visited Ratra and how Tomás and Douglas Hyde drank strong wine from Australia together. Um, Tomás did not want these references of alcohol to be in the book. He goes as far as saying that he does not remember the event in Ratra and that he was not a man who had an interest in drink and that he was a very measured man. If we look at the published version, we see that Hyde did indeed leave out the reference to the strong Australian wine in Ratra. Tomás didn't want his own personal image being polluted. Tomás was a Catholic and the Catholic Church was sensitive in regard to alcohol. This sort of censorship was nearly a willing form of censorship that grew from the fear of the Irish people in regard to the Catholic Church. The pioneers also had a huge influence in the 1930s, a group that strengthened the opinion that alcohol was bad and you should avoid it. Hyde, as ever the pragmatist, took a pragmatic view in regard to self-censorship here. He understood the climate in Ireland and in America at the time. It would be better to emphasize the hard work that Tomás undertook in America in 1905-1906 instead of a, well, placing emphasis on a strong bottle of Australian wine in Ratra, County Roscommon. Tomás also asks on Creveen to place more emphasis on the work that he did in America. This would connect well with John Quinn's view of him as egotistical. This is pure self-praise that Tomás is looking for. Tomás Bond wrote a paragraph for on Creveen about the work that he did and asked him to put it into page five of the book where he had the passage about the two of them drinking wine in Ratra. And as we can see here on the slides, we have the letter from uh, Tomás to Douglas Hyde. He has this whole paragraph that he wants Hyde to put into the place where they were previously drinking the wine. And if we look at the published 1937 version, we see that his alt, his paragraph is in there word for word. Here is a postcard and uh, my colleague Liam McMahuna will be showing lots of different postcards that Douglas Hyde and Lucy sent to their children when in America. This is a postcard that uh, Douglas Hyde sent to Una and it is date marked the 7th of February 1906. Hyde has written the following, Tom Anish or Mavalak di San Francisco. I'm now on my way to San Francisco, February the 6th, 1906 on Creveen. Um, in the picture here, we see the auditorium building in Chicago. This was completed in 1889, and the building is located at the northwest corner of South Michigan Ag Avenue and Congress Street. The building was designed to be a multi-use complex, including offices and a theater and a hotel. As a young apprentice, Frank Lloyd Wright worked on some of the interior design. Here's the extract from Douglas Hyde, My American Journey, about Hyde's powerful speech in the auditorium when he came to Chicago. The meeting was scheduled for eight o'clock in the auditorium. It was almost as successful as the large New York meeting. I was certain that I would have no voice left after the previous night in Pittsburgh, but thanks be to God, having been allowed to rest in the morning, my voice had returned, and I spoke for an hour and 40 minutes. The auditorium was almost full. The papers reported that scholars, businessmen, and merchants from the Irish societies were present in the house, and when I appeared, all jumped to their feet, waving their handkerchiefs and shouting joyously. The Oakland Tribune reported on this lecture in the auditorium on the 8th of January, 1906. Nearly 8,000 descendants of the Gaelic race met at the auditorium last night to listen to Dr. Douglas Hyde. The Chicago, Chicago Daily Tribune also reported on the event. As Dr. Hyde arose in response to the cheering that swept up through the furthermost galleries, the audience sprang to its feet and handkerchiefs flickered over the mass of heads like white caps over a stormy sea. Mr. Gomeshgel, Dr. Hyde began to speak in Gaelic. It was a poem, a soft, slow turning speech which felt like music on the eager ears. Wonder spread to comprehension and pleasure and laughter and clapping interrupted him. Um, the origins of Chicago's 20th century club lay in the belief that the creation of a cultural and literary club composed of members from the city's best families could help Chicago overcome its reputation for coarseness. The club was organized to replicate similar organizations in New York and elsewhere. Potential club members were nominated and vetted before they were offered membership. Again, from Mahariska Merikal Hyde wrote that 10th day of January, I returned to Chicago in the afternoon and spoke at the 20th Century Club at the house of a man named Dr. Turk. There were some 60 people present and I spoke about Ireland for an hour. We enjoyed a fine supper afterwards and they presented me with a wreath of lilies of the valley in the shape of a harp. I reached my bed a quarter after two. 
20th Century Club was hosted in Dr. Fenton B. Turk's residence on 151 Rush Street. Rush Street's history traces back to the original incorporation of the city in the 1830s. It has since hosted important residences, such as the house of the first mayor of Chicago. Today, it continues to run through some of the wealthiest neighborhoods in the country and has businesses that correspond to the demands of its residents. The street was named after Dep Declaration of Independence signature Benjamin Rush. The newspapers at the time reported on upcoming events daily and Hyde's lectures were promoted. Dr. For example, this was documented in the Interocean on the 9th of January 1906 on page 12. Dr. Hyde goes to Milwaukee tonight, but he returns tomorrow to address the 20th Century Club, while on Friday and Saturday he will speak at the University of Chicago. The Union League Club of Chicago is a prominent social and civic club located at 65 West Jackson Boulevard. Founded in 1879, the Union League Club of Chicago traces its roots to the earlier Union League of America. The Union League of America was founded during the American Civil War to support Abraham Lincoln and preserve the Union. In the Articles of Association, the club's primary objectives are to encourage loyalty to the federal government, defend the Union, promote good citizenship, maintain equality of all citizens, and assure the purity of the ballot and oppose corruption and secure honesty in the administration of national, state, and municipal affairs. At the same time, some members wanted the club to have the amenities of a social club, including fine dining. Today, according to the club's website, it is both a catalyst for action in nonpartisan political, economic and social arenas, and a social club with an array of unique opportunities for entertainment, personal growth and fine dining. The club's first clubhouse was designed by William LeBaron Jenny who was an American architect and engineer who was known for building the first skyscraper in 1884 and became known as the father of the American skyscraper. Hyde dined at the Union Club on the, on the 11th of January. Dr. Crow took us out in his carriage, but it was cold beyond description. Large mounds of ice lay on the shore of Lake Michigan and the lake itself was frozen. The glass was several degrees below zero and the cold entered our marrow. In the evening, a man named Barry hosted a large dinner at the Union Club, the finest club in the West from all accounts. William Rainey Harper helped establish the University of Chicago and served as the first president. The new campus was established by oil magnate John D. Rockefeller and opened its doors in 1890. As stated, Harper became the first president in 1891 and its classes were held there, its first classes were held in 1892. An interesting point to note is that the University of Chicago was founded by a small group of Baptist educators in 18, 1856 through a land endowment by Senator Stephen A. Douglas. It was therefore called Douglas College, and in 1891 it moved to its current location in Hyde Park. If you look at this photo here on the left, you can see founding University President Harper and as he heads to the 1901 decennial celebration with the university founder John D. Rockefeller. The following buildings were reported on page eight of the Chicago Daily Tribune on the 7th of January, 1906. Hyde will speak in Mandel Hall, University of Chicago, Friday evening on the Poetic Literature of Ireland and in the Music Hall, Fine Arts Building, Saturday at 11 on the Folk Tales of Ireland. Harper was born in 1856 to parents of Irish Scottish ancestry. He died on January the 10th, 1906, aged 49. If we look at the date that he died, it is a couple of days before Hyde delivered his first lecture in the university. He documents the following. The 12th day of January, a gentleman named Payne took me out to the university, which is some eight miles from here. I gave a lecture to some 800 or 900 students and Irish poets. I spoke for an hour and a quarter. The attendance would have been larger had not the president... Dr. Harper died the previous day. He was an interesting man. He and I had, the cars, had corresponded for 14 years. Hyde then returned the following day and reported the following. The 13th of day of January, I delivered a lecture to the university group on Irish folklore. Some 300 attended. I spoke for an hour and 20 minutes. So after, uh, on the 13th of January, after his lecture in the university on Irish folklore, Hyde then went to Sherman House. My lecture had barely concluded when I was taken to Sherman House for a memorial luncheon of the fellowship group. Some seven people were in attendance with much conversation. I spoke for 20 minutes. The fellowship club was established in 1901 by a group of Irish Americans to help promote a more responsible image of Irish in Chicago. 
the former Irish Taoiseach and De Kenny in 2012 in a speech he delivered to the Irish Fellowship in Chicago at a St. Patrick's Day dinner stated, I am also mindful of the central role which the Irish Fellowship Club has played in the story of the Chicago Irish since its foundation in 1901. Ireland is grateful for the role the Irish Fellowship Club has played in promoting Irish interests in Chicago and indeed in Washington. But the Irish Fellowship Club has also played its part in Irish history and in developing the links between Ireland and the United States from the very early days of our state's existence. That is what Hyde was doing back in 1906 in Chicago, strengthening ties between Ireland and the United States as he addressed the Irish Fellowship a few years after its establishment in 1901. The Sherman House, as you can see from the picture here, was one of the big four of the post-fire hotels, opened in 1873, it closed in 1910, located at northwest corner of North Clark and West Randolph Streets. From 1872 to 1873, the hotel's third structure was constructed on the same site as the previous two hotels. Um, uh, let me see. Yeah, so as with the previous... Can you finish up, please? Oh, just, just coming up to... Okay? okay, thanks, Kleena. Um, so that's Sherman House there. Here we have... Virginia Hotel and what's really interesting about the description of Sherman House and of Virginia Hotel is that um, there's huge referencing to the Great Fire as Brian had mentioned in his paper um, of 1871 and Hyde as well I suppose at the time in America, at the start of the 1900s, there were a lot of great fires that had broken out. So, it was, and it was very much in the folklore as well about the great fire in Chicago. So one of the social scenes um, during Hyde's visit was he was actually brought out to visit the firemen and to look at their new, uh, their new Oshana, their new, I can't think their, the new equipment and different things, resources that they had for the fires. Um, and there, actually, if we look at this slide here, so that's Chicago after the Great Fire in 1871. And on the left, we see a postcard that Hyde sent from uh, San Francisco after the, their fire in April in 1906. Um, Hyde also visited uh, very well-to-do people, for example, Murphy, he was in charge of Irish whiskey. His um, address here, you can see it was 12 Wabash Avenue where the shop was. And Hyde spent a lot of time with him, with his family. Uh, Lucy as well spent time with them. And Hyde actually christened uh, Murphy's new home, Cool Nakriva. Uh, it's a, a, here are a few examples of postcards that Hyde sent. Again, to the girls we can see here is an American football pitch. Um, and this was actually in the University of Chicago at the time. And he also sent postcards to Ethel Chance. Uh, Liam will be discussing Ethel in his presentation shortly. And lastly, I'll just finish up here. So Hyde's reputation preceded him and he was celebrated and lauded as an Irish cultural icon in Chicago. This image here, um, so on the left hand side, uh, was depicted, uh, as we can see, Hyde is depicted as Aaron's idol in this Fesh pa pamphlet from Chicago of eight, 1903. The Fesh was held on the 5th of May 1903 and Hyde's photo as leader of Cunner and Aguilga was forefront. He was their inspiration, he was indeed their idol. Hyde's own account illustrates this status as idol and the cultural significance of his experience in Chicago. When I appeared, they all jumped to their feet, waving handkerchiefs and shouting joyously. joyously. Gurmagov, sorry for going over. Uh, thank you very much, Moira, for that um, fascinating paper. And I would encourage everybody to have a look at uh, the volume on Hyde's American Journal, which re reproduces um, many of the, the postcards that you've seen uh, in Moira's presentation. I turn now to Antalav um, Liam Machmahuna, Professor Emeritus of Irish at University College Dublin and editor of Aigse, a journal of Irish studies. His publications include Berla Sereilga on Irish English literary code mixing, a new edition of Padder O'Leary's novel Shéanna, Seherun na Gaelga Scríofa a of Irbucha na Héran on the cultivation of written Irish in urban areas, which he co-edited, 
And as we have said, Douglas Hyde, My American Journey, also co-edited. And as I have said in my introduction to Moira's work, he is currently researching the life and work of Douglas Hyde with Dr. Moira Nicomvord. It's a good atoshenish aliam. Well, it might come anyway, I start off. Um, as Moore has already indicated, uh, Hyde's journey in America took him uh, in three stages across the continent. First, he toured the East Coast, then Chicago and the surrounding cities, and finally the West Coast. All of these regions had significant Irish and Irish American populations. On the 4th of January, two months into his journey, Hyde wrote in his journal that he and his wife Lucy were now departing New York and heading west, not knowing what lay before them, but confident that all would be well. John Quinn, the dynamic financial lawyer already mentioned, was the sponsor and architect of Hyde's journey. Uh, Quinn Hyde wrote, had scheduled everything and arranged everything um, and arranged everybody to speak on his way to California. Liam, maybe if you have the PowerPoint open before you press share screen, because okay. it didn't work for me until I did that. I had it on my um, screen and then I, I went. It. Yeah, I have it open. I have it open. And then okay then then press share screen and basic and eyebrow session the share screen has now disappeared it's been back to the i've minimized it all right if yeah. you want i can share your presentation liam yeah, okay doesn't... if you try that and i, I continue on okay yeah. hyde reached chicago on the 7th of january and for the next month the city functioned as a hub from which he spread the message of the gaelic revival throughout the midwest as he journeyed back and forth to the metropolis, taking in the 11 cities of Milwaukee, Cleveland, Columbus, Indianapolis, Cincinnati, St. Louis, South Bend, St. Paul, Minneapolis, and Omaha. In many of these cities, he addressed audiences of 2,000 people or more for two hours, raising between $5,500 and $1,500 on, on each occasion. Um, Rather than repeat the same lecture over and over again, Hyde had a repertoire of four themes. These included one, the last 300 years of Irish literature, two, the folk tale in Ireland, and three, the poetic literature of Ireland. These three seem to be mostly delivered in universities and colleges. Hyde's main address, the Gaelic movement, its origins, importance, philosophy, and results, was based in large part on his famous 1892 lecture, The Necessity for De-Anglicising Ireland. This plea to his fellow countrymen to stop aping English ways and to be true to themselves and the Irish language and culture invariably had a profound effect on his audiences. Hyde's accounts of the occasions and events organized in the central cities of America have their own particular interest. These cities were home to substantial, if not overwhelming, numbers of Irish who formed approximately 10% of the population at the time. And their generosity in supporting the cause of the Irish language is clear from the certified accounts of money raised by Hyde's tour. In all, they contributed a very creditable $8,000 out of a total of 50,000 or more raised, almost an eighth of the sum. And when Chicago's donation of almost $7,000 is added, the total contribution made by the Midwest comes to about $15,000, over a quarter of the total. Aged 46 at the time and full of energy, Hyde was very sociable and gregarious by nature. He threw himself into his public role at the highest level of civil society in the United States. And as Professor Timothy McMahon has astutely observed, the Douglas Hyde who traveled through America was part celebrity, part diplomat, part tourist. This latter persona being particularly in evidence on the West Coast. But there were other audiences to be addressed as well and more personal connections to be maintained between the Hydes. Um, okay, I think we're getting... Yeah, this is the change okay. line on a co-ed, Liam. Um, John Aber. No, I write my three here. Ever Catter. Okay, one. He goes. He goes really quickly. Two is is sort of well, okay. We're now in. Yeah, two is the map of the mid of the, the um, Midwest. Okay, now we're going to three. Um, well, I can. Okay, that's just the both type. Okay. Or you'll have to, okay, this is Santa Clara, this Hyde and his, his wife Lucy traveling incognito there on the, on the left of the picture. But there were 
other audiences <coughs> to be it's the two girls in Ratra, the dog and their father. There were two other audiences to be addressed as well and more personal connections to be maintained between the hides in the Midwest and their family and friends at home. Douglas and his wife Lucy sent over 90 beautifully illustrated postcards back to Ireland and England during their tour and these were rediscovered recently in the Hayden Heavey Library in Athlone in Ireland. 60 of the cards were sent to the young daughters Newell and Una, then 12 and 10 years old respectively, who had stayed behind in County Roscommon, and 30 went to less than chance and just seen there, a family friend who lived in Birmingham. The cards sent to the children by Douglas were in both Irish and English. Newell is exhorted to speak Irish to her younger sister, while both are urged to follow their parents' progress on maps. Lucy in particular is anxious that the cards be kept, as indeed they were, Interestingly, Douglas signs himself as Uncreevy, his well-known pen name, rather than Dad, Papa or the like, while Lucy makes do with her initials LCH, standing for Lucy Committee in Hyde. Milwaukee and Cleveland were the first two of the Midwestern cities visited by Hyde. The local arrangements made in each of them to welcome him were typical of the template which had been devised by John Quinn. It involved the prior establishment of a reception committee comprising some of the great and good of the local establishment, rather than the activists of Gaelic societies and other grassroots bodies. Hyde's diary account reads, 9th day of January, I departed Chicago to go to Milwaukee in Wisconsin. I reached the town in the afternoon and a group traveled 30 miles outside the city to welcome me. When we arrived in Milwaukee proper, the state governor was waiting. The city sheriff was also present and an old man named Quinn, who was a Fenian in his youth and who never forgave the church for their treatment of the Fenian movement. I spoke in the Paps Theatre in the afternoon. Archbishop Mesmer from Switzerland, the state governor, and some 800 people attended. I next provide some contextual information. Wisconsin, where I am at present, is a half Scandinavian state. Milwaukee is a big city with some 350,000 inhabitants, almost half are German. It is a major brewing centre, and Paps is the chief brewer. German is taught in every school in the city. Many of those who visited me spoke German with me once they realized I knew that language. Nevertheless, the language is, is destined to die. And he hadn't heard any German being spoken on the streets. German was in fact, in fact being spoken at home. My speech last night so impressed the bishop that he contributed $50. Maybe I won him over by speaking some German and praising the Germans in my lecture. While he is Swiss, he was far more generous than the Archbishop of Pittsburgh, Dr. Canavan. And then in Cleveland on the night of the 13th, he, he left for there. And he spent, after spending the night on the train, I arrived in Cleveland at eight o'clock in the morning. The crowd welcomed me and brought me to the Hollenden House Hotel. Cleveland is a large city with approximately half a million people. Maybe some 50,000 are Irish, but they are widely scattered. This is a coal and iron city, he said, and there is very little that is not manufactured here. Noting the number of priests at a dinner organised for him, Hyde allowed himself a little joke, saying how much at home their presence made him feel. Strangely, Hyde occasionally seems to have actually underestimated the impact his visit made on a city. For example, his summary account of his visit to Cleveland is rather downbeat. He had a reasonably successful meeting in the Colonial Theatre with some 800 people in attendance and collected $600. But I believe most of the money came from the AOH or Ancient Order of Hibernians. In fact, almost twice that, 1,170 was collected. And furthermore, we have a second account of the visit, which comes from none other than John Quinn himself, the tour's organiser, whose sister, Mrs. Anderson, happened to live in Cleveland. Quinn therefore had occasion to visit the city regularly and relayed a more positive account of the occasion to Hyde 18 months later in a letter dated August 1907. Everybody remembered you with the greatest pleasure. In fact, they all said that your visit to Cleveland was the best Irish event that had been there in a generation. Hyde's charismatic personal impact on behalf of the language revival is further evidence in Quinn's more general reflections. Everybody almost that I meet who keeps in touch with Irish things asks me how you are and when I have heard from you and how you are doing and how the movement is getting on and so on. Now, as already mentioned, a central tenet of the Gaelic League's founding philosophy was its non-sectarian, non-party political stance. I jealously guarded this, um, but he was always being probed by journalists. In Ireland, it was the question of 
um, striking a balance between the Irish Parliamentary Party, headed by Redmond, and radical elements such as the IRB or Arthur Griffiths. And then in America, it was a question of the boys, Clan de Gael, and the United Irish League. And we have a report, an eight page um, typescript of a reporter's interview with Hyde in Cleveland in the Holland and Hotel. What do you think of the Clan de Gael? Excuse me, that is getting onto dangerous ground. What about the United Irish League? You're asking me to tread on ground even more dangerous. I am not a politician, and the Gaelic League is not a political body, and never has been. We are nothing but a linguistic, educational, and industrial movement. We are grateful for the support of the Clan of Gael. We are grateful for the support of the United Irish League. And beyond that, I cannot go. Now, there was another <coughs> rather more amusing uh, question and answer session that all occurred in Cincinnati with a tongue tied editor of a newspaper called Men and Women. The editor wanted an interview for the St. Patrick's Day edition of his paper and had brought a shorthand writer with him, but in the event, he did not know what questions to ask and could not think of any. Hyde, whom we might mention, was also an experienced amateur actor, rules to the occasion, however, and states, therefore I compose the questions myself and also answer them. Sometimes no collection was made on the night of, of an address, thus defeating one of the main purposes of the event. Uh, so it was in Columbus, Ohio. We had a large meeting in the theatre with up to a thousand people present. City Bishop, Dr. Hartley, Colonel Kilburn, a war veteran, and many others attended. Dr. Thompson spoke well and humorously introduced him to the audience, but no collection was conducted. Event only 500 was collected in that city. Now you see the, in the moment the Army and Navy Monument in Indianapolis. Um, Hyde's diary accounts show the standing he had as a visiting celebrity and quasi-diplomat representing culturally nationalist Ireland. He regularly received streams, visits from a stream of local dignitaries. However, they also highlight the practical challenges of speaking before an audience of several thousand listeners in halls with poor acoustics. And thus it was in Indianapolis. People paid their respects throughout the day. We had a large meeting in the afternoon in Tomlinson Hall. It was a truly terrible place to speak in. I shouted and roared as loud as I could for two hours to 2,000 or 2,500 people, but I think they were satisfied. I did not go to bed until two in the morning. <clears throat> now there's steamers, you see a steamer on the Saint, uh, you're going on the Mississippi as Hyde went to St. Louis. And uh, I, I saw many people from my own district in County Roscommon, a relative of my own, in fact, Old Field Cubbage came from Moberly, 100 miles away to hear me. It was 2 o'clock when I reached my bed. 1,400 was raised in St. Louis. Hyde's journey back to Chicago on the 22nd led him to comment on the poor state of the roads. I had a high speed train, was back in Chicago in only nine hours. The train is flat with neither hill nor mount between the two places, which is the ideal man for Indian corn. The roads, however, are in terrible condition, even in the towns. They're like cattle tracks. The roads, I believe, are the worst aspect of America. So now we come to South Bend and Notre Dame. Hyde tells us I had to leave the city again, go to South Bend, Indiana, some 80 miles from Chicago. I went to St. Mary's Academy, run by the Sisters of the Holy Cross, where I spoke to 500 girls on Irish language literature. I had not eaten since morning and was weak from hunger. It was after six when I finished, and the Sisters provided a light snack before I hurried to Notre Dame lecture on folklore to 500 boys. Once finished, I had a long chat with the president, Father Kavanaugh, and some of the professors. In the evening, I lectured in South Bend, the town where the University of Notre Dame is located. 50,000 people live there and is the leading center for the manufacture of towels and sewing machines. My meeting in South Bend was the smallest thus far. There were no, no more than 200 present and no collection in the event. Just $130 was collected there. Hyde's interest in hunting occasionally shows itself as it did in St. Paul when you seen the Ryan Hotel, the State Capitol Hotel, and Fort Snelling. I met people from my own abode in County Roscommon, from Cartron and Rathkiri, but John O'Brien was the man I most enjoyed meeting. He is the only man I ever met who would hunt wild ducks with a bow and arrow. The arrowhead was dull rather than a sharp point. Now a lawyer, he was born and raised on an island among the Indians of one of the Great Lakes, and he spoke Chippewa fluently. On returning from lunch with the Archbishop, 
that Fitzgerald and another man took me to Minneapolis on a trolley car, I said. If the St. Paul meeting was large, the Minneapolis meeting was larger. I believe there were in excess of 3,000 people here. I spoke for two hours and 10 minutes, but the acoustics were poor and I had to shout at the top of my voice. However, it was all to no avail financially as he wrote to Lucy saying in the car to her, admission free and no collection. And then you can see the stone in moment, the stone arch bridge and milling district, Minneapolis, a card to the girls and one to the same card to Ethel Chance. But interestingly, the one to the, to the daughters, they said, to her pogue the poly ruin, give the parish and the pet cop the two uh, a kiss from me. And um, then I think there's a picture there of uh, Hyde with uh, the two on his shoulder in one picture and then in his lap in the second. We arrived at, uh, in Omaha at 11 in the morning, the eighth day. My wife and I dined with Bishop Scannell, a court man with plenty of Irish. And then strangely, I lectured the girls in the poor Clare's convent in Irish, and then the, best, the bishop translated it into English. And it's a, an interesting bilingual occasion. $1,500 was collected. Hyde and his wife Lucy were now heading for the West Coast, and it was time to pause and take stop, as Hyde wrote. We have now reached the very centre of America. Omaha is midway between the two oceans, between San Francisco and New York. I visited the major eastern cities and had spoken everywhere I was invited and everywhere Quinn and Moss Brown had arranged. But the states between Omaha and California are new states without either cities or large concentrations of people. Therefore, we now had to go straight to California, to San Francisco, where Father York rather than Quinn directed operations. So they left Omaha and headed west. To sum up then, by way of conclusion, Hyde continued to hone his oratorical skills and sway audiences as he moved west across America. The experience he gained from the month he spent in Chicago and the Midwest in general helped him to frame his arguments to maximum effect for his Irish and Irish American listeners. John Quinn's testimony, which we've already mentioned, regarding the impact Hyde had on people in Cleveland is confirmed by the enthusiastic white hot letter sent to him from Indianapolis by the Vice President of the State Life Insurance Company on the 22nd of January 1906, just three days after Hyde's visit to that city. Dear Mr. Quinn, Dr. Douglas Hyde has come and gone. He won us all with his big heart, superb intellect and splendid good fellowship. We had a magnificent meeting, over 2,000, which is a large audience for Indianapolis. The amount subscribed at the meeting was about $500 and taken by tickets about the same amount. We were probably clear $1,000 for the doctor. The estimate proved to be accurate as $1,100 was the actual sum recorded for Indianapolis. And so, Hyde's great American journey continues throughout the first half of 1906, raising awareness of the Irish language and Irish culture and placing them center stage in public discourse for a time not just among the Irish diaspora, but among the American population more generally. Thank you very much for three papers which interlocked and spoke to each other in a very compelling manner, um, remembering both Hyde's journey to America and um, the place that the Irish language occupied in America at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. Um, perhaps I could ask um, the first question. I, you mentioned that um, the postcards were found in the library in Athlone. Could you tell us how that um, came about? Well, I think it's a question, to some extent, the question of being hidden, if I take this one, of being hidden in plain sight, because um, they were there, and they, but they weren't adverted to so much. They're even, they're even in fact, there is a catalogue now from the A and EP library, um, which that, I suppose going on for 10 years now, where they're highlighted, but some it just didn't find any resonance. The The bigger background picture is that um, well, there's a long story where, where Hyde, Hyde was a great hoarder. He kept everything, but then it suddenly, uh, it was all scattered after his death. And um, the, now the material is coming together in about 10 or 12 archives throughout the world. So, um, but it started coming in about 1970, the diaries not made their way into the, um, the National Library. So uh, 
it was one of the public. Anyway, I you can't just offhand. I can't remember the name of the, of the uh, publisher, but I think the the material. Aidan Healy was a collector then. He was. Um, it's interesting. He, he apparently studied a translation of Goldsmith at school, the Vicar of Wake in, in Irish, one of the Goldsmith translations. And he was so taken by it that he spent his life doing two things: gathering up material on Irish, particularly about Douglas Hyde, and first editions and so forth of uh, the Vicar of Wakefield. So um, it made its way anyway from from one collection by 1970 into the National, into the Aidan Heavey Library, and then other material went into the National Library. Okay, thank you. Um, and more, we mentioned that you were, um, the first volume of the edition that you're working on is to appear in 2022. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Well, we've been working on this for a while, Liam and I. It's been great fun going to, as Liam said, all the resources are scattered around the world. Um, lots of different libraries, lots of different archival research that we've been undertaking. So we're going to, because it's so vast, Kleena, and there's so much information and so many different resources available to us now and so many people helping us as well. The National Library Ireland have been fabulous. Mary Broderick in there and um, Gerard O'Lewing, they've been, whenever they come across new material to do with Douglas Hyde, they send it on. So we've had to break it up into four volumes. So we're going to start with four volumes of his, I suppose we'll start off with his youth, his childhood in um, Roscommon and go up till he's about, until about 1880, 1890, um, and just break it up that way. So it'll be four volumes. So the first one, please God, next year. Excellent. Brian, I was struck by the, the, um, the, the term that was used, um, I, I think, in, in the references that you made and in some of the other talks about the, the notion of the Irish race. And it's something that we're going to see again in 1922 with that Irish race um, meeting that was held in our Irish race conference that was held in Paris in 1922 to coincide with the beginning of statehood. I wonder if you'd care to comment on the term because it's something that takes us aback in, in the contemporary world. Yeah. Um totally different interpretation, totally different context to the 20th century, 21st century use of the term. So it's race as was used by Darwin, where race is interchangeable with nation, where it's interchangeable with identity. So they see no difficulty talking about Irish, English, Scot, races, Welsh, race, French, race. So it's very much linked to language, linked to culture. And it's Darwinian, but it's a long way from social Darwinianism. Okay, thank you. There's a question for Brian um, from James Barrett, who says that he's struck by the estimated 10,000 Irish speakers in Chicago at the turn of the century. Do you know if these are mostly people who studied the language during the Gaelic revival or whether it was people who grew up speaking Irish? And interestingly, the addresses suggest that they're mostly working class people. Yeah, uh, this is uh, Moira mentioned it there in the, the seminal um, event. So the University of Chicago published um, a document on the various languages spoken in the city. And this well, Irish was taken care of by Professor Carl Darling Buck, who was the professor of Sanskrit Indo-European Comparative Philology. And he's referred to as the father of Indo-European linguistics in North America. And I believe there's still an endowed chair uh, named in his honor at the university. So he bases this on the on the number, the percentage of Im Im Irish immigrants coming to America, coming to Chicago, and the breakdown of where they come from uh, in the Irish speaking counties. But he says at a minimum, it's less than 14 and a half percent. He suspects that puts it at 10,000, but he argues they should be closer to 15,000. Uh, in terms of class, um, it's difficult there's nothing in the newspapers that suggests by names or descriptions where they're 
that what their social origins are. But clearly, if they have the whereabout to be meeting in City Hall, to be meeting in judges' rooms, they have some uh, social status. Uh, I don't have the familiarity with 19th century Chicago to judge by the addresses uh, the locations, but I'd be very interested in hearing from people who are more familiar with Chicago what that says, uh, what the what the quarters, what the districts say about the social standing. And um, one thing that's uh, where Chicago stands out in contrast to New York, uh, Philadelphia, and Boston is at no point have I come across an area which is described as being Irish speaking. There, I can't point to any parish, any area in Chicago where there is a concentration of Irish language speakers where Irish is the vernacular. Thank you, Brian. Perhaps I have uh, another question for, for the three of you. I, I was recently reading the biography, a new biography of Sylvia Plath called The Red Comet, which speaks a lot about Sylvia Plath's father, Otto, who, who migrated from Germany and about the push towards assimilation and the uh, desire to speak English on the part of his family when he arrived in the United States. And I wondered whether that same assimilationist um, element meant that um, Irish became perhaps not a language of the home, but a language of the parents. Do you have any indications, Brian, in, in your reading that that might have been the case? Uh uh, John Kelleher, the professor of Celtic at Harvard, has a fantastic essay on this talking about the small cities in Massachusetts where uh, when people gather in the evenings and as the young people leave and the old people, the grandparents sit around the table at night, the conversation will switch from English to Irish. And he talks about those bachelors, the old men who didn't marry, who were seen as being taciturn, but actually they were native speakers of Irish who weren't comfortable with English. They had functional English, but they were never comfortable. And they sat there in the corner, smoked, uh, spoke to their friends, but that Irish became the language of the shadows, the language of the late night uh, male groups. And in terms of the pressures to to switch to English, uh, it depends on the context. So during, clearly during the no-nothing period, uh, during the Civil War, uh, directly after the Civil War, when Roosevelt comes to power, and this is not a, a melting pot, this is an English only uh, country. So it depends on the decade in which, you're, in which you're talking, and it depends on the locality in which people were. So in some ways, language became a marker, uh, but it was much easier to use Catholicism or religion as a marker of identity. Uh, learning a language, speaking a language, as we know, takes, takes effort and time. Going to mass once a week takes much less effort. Okay. Can I just revert to the Irish Race Congress uh, um, in Paris, 1922, because it was attended by Hyde and by Mike Mead and Michal, Mike, Michal O'Hay and Mike Mead. And Hyde was actually recorded there, and that, that recording is available, I think, even online. It's around 90 seconds of him speaking in Irish. Um, so it's an example of what Maura was saying earlier, that Hyde is really everywhere when you start looking at anything to do with Irish. And uh, there are other recordings, too. There's one in America, Gaelic, one of Hyde speaking in 1910, and there's maybe others. Um, we have quite a range of resources and not just written. That's, that's fascinating. Thank you, Liam. There's another question from Sophie. Um, this is a question for Brian. Brian, do you find that native speakers of the early 1880s were still involved in the early 1900s or is there a switch to learners? And perhaps is this echoed in the class dynamics? Yeah, it's a great question and it's hard to answer. It, 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 in broad terms, but very often what you find is that the native speakers who arrive in the 1880s tend to be literate in contrast to those who came earlier, and they're more inclined to become teachers and leaders. Um, the switch definitely in the 1890s is to children and to learners if that answers the question. So what, it, what you're finding is that it is Irish who are now established, uh, becoming upwardly 
mobile, but conscious of their identity. And they want their children to have some form of connection, whether it's language, whether it's GAA, whether it's um, music. And perhaps more, more than any other city, I find that music, dance and sport are more closely intertwined with the Irish language movement in Chicago than elsewhere. There's a very close tie over between music and dance. But something which shouldn't be lost in the conversation is that the feshes and the dancing are an offshoot of Conan Aguilga. If it isn't for Conan Naguelga, there wouldn't have been the dancing organizations or the, um, the piping to a large extent. Okay, I have a question here from Patrick O'Sullivan, again for Brian. Some years ago, we had an informal conversation about a possible anthology of the Irish language literature of America. Werner Sullers and the Longfellow Institute were interested. One starting point was that Misha Raftery seems to be an Irish American poem, possibly by Sean O'Callaghan. Any thoughts on the subject? Yeah, Misha Raftery used to appear on the Irish five pound note is, uh... It was often mistaken for a 17th or 18th century composition, but it was uh, composed in Chicago by uh, 1903 by a, an Irish immigrant. And if you look at the rhyme scheme, it's quite obviously uh, not a 17th or 18th century. Um, such a thing would be wonderful. I mean, the question would be, would it be literature written, texts written, original texts written composed in America or by Irish Americans? Would it be bilingual? But it, it would be a great idea and well worth pursuing. So it's a conversation I'd love to continue. Great to see you, Patrick. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I think we, we possibly finish up here or perhaps we have two new messages. No, I think this is everything, okay. Thank you um, to all three of you. We look forward to um, the four volumes on, on Douglas Hyde and we'll make sure that our university libraries acquire them and we'll, we'll certainly ask for them as presents at various times of the year. Um, so thank you, Gurumila Mahadev, Agus Slán Gafoyle. Thank you all. Okay, I'm s they, are, they are coming back, and uh, Kiona, thank you for uh, chairing this panel. Um, thank you for chairing this panel, and um, the floor is yours now. Thank you, Thierry, and greetings everyone from Cork in Ireland on this day after midsummer. Um, it is wonderful to be here as part of your conference. Um, and particularly in the con context of being able to chair a session that is going to focus on Chicago and Irish culture. Um, my own discipline is visual arts and architecture. And of course, uh, so many, in fact, a generation of Irish architects came to study under Mies van der Rohe in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and of course, before that, there was huge Irish involvement in building Chicago. But uh, as well as architecture, I always feel that culture um, not only creates products for us to you know, look at and understand, but it creates spaces for uh, connection and for difficult and interesting and challenging conversations. And I know that looking at the papers today that we have some very fascinating interpretations and propositions ahead. So I won't delay, I'm going to invite our first um, speaker, uh, Charles Fanning, to speak. Um, Charles is the Professor Emeritus of English and History from Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. He's the author and editor of a dozen books and many essays, and the Irish in Chicago loom large in these publications, which include new editions of seven Farrell titles for the University of Illinois Press. So Charles, I invite you to um, begin. Right, thanks so much. Uh, delighted to be here and uh, to participate in this. And i um, always happy to be uh, advocating for Farrell. Uh, James T. Farrell, whose body of work uh, I've been advocating for, um, for a long time now. Um, in 2004, Ellen Skerritt, also on this panel, and I organized a symposium at the Newbury Library in Chicago 
to mark the 100th anniversary of Farrell's birth. Uh, it was Alan who said, who actually ordered me to read Farrell uh, a few, uh, quite a few years earlier than that. And, uh, and it was she who helped me begin a correspondence with Farrell because she knew him. Uh, Farrell reviewed my first book uh, and for the Chicago Tribune, and I was making plans to meet him uh, when he died suddenly in New York in uh, August 1979. Um, well, uh, the continuing refusal to acknowledge uh, James C. Farrell's literary achievement by critics and academics who should know better is unconscionable. Many still pigeonhole him as a one book wonder, the author of the Studs Lonigan trilogy published between 1932 and 1935, which tells the story of the short ineffectual life of a weak willed Chicago corner boy who ruins his own health and dies of pneumonia at 29. It's a powerful piece of fiction, but it was the young author's first project, not a culmination, but a beginning. Farrell ought to be known for a lot of, Farrell ought to be known for a lot of other books. First off, oh. notably for his second sequence, the five O'Neill O'Flaherty novels, the first of which, A World I Never Made, was published in 1936, one year after the third shit. Lonigan book. The Lonigan and O'Neill cycles of fiction share a setting, the Chicago South Side neighborhood around Washington Park, where Farrell himself grew up, a time frame, roughly 1890 to 1930, and many characters. Farrell's own childhood and adolescence around 58th Street had much more in common with the experience of young Danny O'Neill in the second series than with that of Studs Lonigan. However, with a wisdom unusual in young writers, Farrell knew that in order to deal in a balanced way with his own emotionally latent <laughs> personal experiences, <laughs> he ought to tell Studs' <laughs> story first. <laughs> now, Farrell, uh, Farrell uh, knew that he had to tell somebody else's story first, Studs' story. But Farrell's eight Washington Park novels actually comprise one grand design with two contrasting movements the downward negative alternative embodied in the passive doomed studs and the upward positive possibility embodied in Danny who grows up aspiring to be a writer. After finishing the young manhood of Studs Lonigan in 1934, Farrell reported to Ezra Pound, quote, one more Lonigan book to come and I'm writing it and also I'm working on a long story of a family, Irish American with lots of autobiography that may be anywhere from one to five volumes. Shortly after publishing the first O'Neill novel, Farrell explained to a friend that the new series, quote, is conceived as a complementary study to Studs Lonigan. One of the main characters, Danny O'Neill, is planned as a character whose life experience is precisely the opposite of Studs. While finishing up the final draft of the fourth O'Neill novel, Farrell wrote his publisher that, quote, I think now it'll come out right and be a fitting end to the series and a fitting companion series to Studs Lonigan, and that Danny and Studs will stand, as I conceived them, dialectical opposites in their destinies. One goes up, the other goes down. These two sequences, several later novels, and the many short stories that share the same South Side Chicago setting constitute a fictional chronicle of three generations of urban Americans, from 19th century immigrant laborers to depression era intellectuals, grounded in a specific place with clear reference points like the, like the markings on a compass. The grandson of Irish immigrants and the son of a teamster and a former domestic servant. Farrell had been born on February 27, 1904, raised in Southside neighborhoods near Washington Park, and educated at Corpus Christi and St. Anselm's Catholic Grammar Schools and St. Cyril's Carmelite High School, graduating in 1923. Because his parents had many children and little money, he lived from age two with his maternal grandparents and his unmarried uncles and aunts who were better off. And this double perspective of belonging to two families both enriched and complicated his youth. Farrell was first encouraged to write by his eighth grade teacher at St. Anselm's, Sister Magdalene, and then by two of the Carmelite fathers at St. Cyril's, 
fathers Leo Walter and Albert Dolan. After high school, Farrell worked for an express company and as a gas station attendant, took a semester of pre-law courses at DePaul University Night School and enrolled for several quarters at the University of Chicago. In March, 1927, he resolved to be a writer and embarked on a fierce regimen of reading and writing in and out of schools from which he never subsequently deviated. He took the chance of a creative life by quitting the University of Chicago after the spring quarter of 1929. He recalled later that, quote, in order to give as much of my time as I could to study and writing, in a sense, the depression caught up with me. By early 1928, I had brought on my own depression. I got myself jobless, not through inability to hold a job, but because I did not want one. Uh, the result was that over the next years, Farrell had, like the young Herman Melville, swum through libraries. There were ways, recalls Murray Compton, Murray Kempton, the great jazz critic in his memoir of the 30s, there were ways in which Farrell was the best educated young writer of his time. He had read philosophers well outside the realm of discourse of conventional critics. He was a deep, though perhaps narrow, student of history. He had great resources in the European cultural tradition. He was a perceptive enough critic to argue for William Faulkner in the early 30s when Faulkner was at his peak of creation and his nadir of reputation. And I love this. He was certainly better educated than Hemingway and Fitzgerald, who in many areas were not educated at all. Farrell's breakthrough came in April 1932 when Vanguard Press published his first novel, Young Lonigan, A Boyhood in Chicago Streets. What followed was one of the most extraordinary creative flowerings in the history of American letters. One thinks of Melville's eight novels and several stories between 1846 and 1857, his entire fictional corpus, but for Billy Budd, and Faulkner's 11 books, including his masterworks between 1929 and 1942. When he finished writing My Days of Anger, the fourth O'Neill O'Flaherty novel in February 1943, Farrell wrote a friend that, I have accomplished what I set out to. At age 39, I have now written the books I said I would write a little over 10 years ago, when this seemed like a wild prediction. Uh, in 11 years, he had published 11 novels, four collections of short fiction, one book of literary criticism, and over 300 essays and reviews. As it was appearing in the late 30s and 40s, Farrell's fiction was generally pretty well received and it sold well enough. Still, what was missing from even the positive reviews was a clear sense of what Farrell was attempting. This was especially true in New York, where he had lived since 1932, and where his work was systematically and unfairly savaged by several influential critics. Here again, Murray Kempton's memoir provides perspective. Quote, yet he was and always would be received as a barbarian in the genteel world of the literary supplements, because poverty had blunted his fingertips and left his work heavy with passion and deficient of charm. Farrell's world was one whose inhabitants understood the price the artist pays. This is still Kempton. He looked at the New York literary world and thought it commercial, supercilious, log rolling, and absolutely alien. Kempton remembered that a distinguished journalist once heard Farrell speak at a literary forum and came to him afterward in honest wonderment that he could speak English. Now, if you think about it, such an observation about whether Farrell was a native speaker can be construed as positive. It means that the writer has created believable characters who exist, think, and speak at a great remove from his own experience. What is not positive, but positively appalling, is that such ignorant judgments continue to be made about Farrell. They put me in mind of James Kelman's fiction and the controversy when he got the Booker Prize. James Wood chaired that Booker Committee, and what he says about Kelman can be said about Farrell as well. Quote, 
Wood. He uses first person and very close third person narration. The two are almost indistinguishable in his work to represent with bitter fidelity the mental journeys of his characters. Because proximity of impersonation is his goal, he is unafraid of boredom, banality, digression, repetition, and verbal impoverishment. And yet he is rarely boring when writing like this, partly because he simply proceeds as if the subject matter were interesting. And partly because in writing as in most areas, and I love this phrase, limitation increases focus and tends to irradiate necessity as if it were a luxury. End quote. Although no critic at the time pointed out the projected scope and ongoing achievement of Farrell's novels and stories, in point of fact, the South Side Chicago world that he created is as complete and coherent as Proust's Paris, Joyce's Dublin, and Faulkner's Yachtnapatawpha County. Had this been registered when the O'Neill O'Flaherty novels were appearing, then all these books would be, would be much better known. What is still needed is the equivalent for Farrell of Malcolm Cowley's portable Faulkner. Militating against the articulation of Farrell's true fictional program by critics was everything that constituted his unique accomplishment, the setting, Chicago, themes and styles of his depiction of Washington Park and environments and environs. These all ran counter to the elitist hegemony of the new criticism in the late 1940s and 50s, which favored high style, the veins of irony and illusion that cry out for exegesis and an erudite controlling narrative consciousness as in Ulysses, the wasteland and to the lighthouse. There was also, I feel bound to say, a pronounced distaste by some cultural tastemakers of Farrell's having given extended physical attention to the lives of working class urban Irish Americans. I'm reminded uh, of what Calvin Trillin said in a New Yorker piece on the St. Patrick's Day Parade. A lot of New Yorkers who think of themselves as people of unshakable tolerance take a sort of easement when it comes to the Irish. Similarly, even though Farrell wrote extensively about the writers he admired, his literary influences were also ignored by the critics who stood out against him. Alfred Kazin, Granville Hicks, Malcolm Cowley, and Edmund Wilson created a cartoon image of the young writer as a ham-fisted stumbling naif that still persists in some circles among people who haven't bothered to read the fiction they are denigrating. Uh, suffice to say briefly here, Farrell's was a deliberate development in which four writers were crucial. From reading Sherwood Anderson, he came to see that the neighborhoods of Chicago in which I grew up possessed something of the character of a small town. They were little worlds of their own, as worthy of literary treatment as any other worlds. Second, Farrell said that James Joyce introduced the city realistically into Irish writing, thus providing precedent for his own meticulously detailed evocation of place, the area around Washington Park. He also attended to Joyce's example in becoming the first American writer to fully explore the Catholic Church as an institutional force. Farrell brought Catholicism into the mainstream of American literature. Third, Anton Chekhov, and this is Farrell again, raised the portrayal of banality to the level of world literature. Farrell said, and, and a moral imperative for his own, uh, Farrell said this, and also he said that a moral imperative for his own fiction was Gorky's statement of Chekhov's essential message. You live badly, my friends. It is shameful to live like that. And fourth, Farrell declared that among the writers of the 20th century, the one whom I love the most is Marcel Proust. A la recherche de temps perdu is the great sustaining model for Farrell's own belief in the validity of extended artistic rendering of individual consciousness. Uh, banal and repetitive though it often is, 
and of the unbidden epiphanies of involuntary memory that relieve our existential funk. The five O'Neill authority novels are the place to begin the necessary reassessment of James D. Farrell's fiction. The series is sweeping and symphonic in structure. A World I Never Made is the prelude in which major themes are introduced. No Star is Lost is a dark movement and a shattering minor key. Father and Son consists of contrapuntal variations between the two title figures, Jim and Danny O'Neill. My Days of Anger contains a large focused statement of the major theme of the entire series, and The Face of Time is a lyrical coda recapitulating the opening themes. Two streams of experience mingle in these pages. The outer stream of social life, a chronicle of the works and days of three generations of Irish Chicagoans, and the inner stream of consciousness, the perceptions of that chronicle and of themselves in the minds of several individuals living it. Throughout the five novels, the same two watershed experiences recur, death and illuminating reverie. Deaths in the family constitute the central events of the outer stream and emphasize the social themes of alienation and failed community in urban America in the 1910s and 20s. Solitary reveries are the central events of the inner stream of consciousness, and these emphasize the, social, the, the psychological theme of individual isolation. Clarifications of life and honest self-assessment come only in dreams and daydreams, and they are almost never shared. This theme gathers force in the three last volumes of the series, in which major characters die without having spoken their minds to anyone else. Against this choking tide, the young protagonist, Danny O'Neill, moves toward understanding of the social and psychological tragedies of his family's thwarted lives. His growth toward the resolution to use art as his weapon against these dual tragedies is the binding theme of the whole project. Through the first four books, Danny O'Neill experiences the start of formal schooling, early adolescence, high school, and college. <clears throat> In the fifth novel, he comes around again to early childhood, when home is the whole world. The slow and painful nature of his intellectual journey enforces another continuing motif. How hard we must work for enlightenment in this tough world. Here, Farrell's abiding love of Yeats, from Adam's curse to the circus animal's desertion, stood him in good stead. In the series overall, Farrell achieves a balance between the bump and flow of experience, both inner and outer, and a structural ordering into large thematic blocks and recurrent motifs. Most of the characters in these novels are caught in the flow and catch only brief glimpses of larger meanings. The sole witness to both confusing detail and clarifying pattern is the reader whose outside perspective generates the single and governing irony the author allows between his often striking epigraphs and the last page of fictive text. The author's having given that power of perspective to the reader makes for compelling, memorable and salutary reading. Charles, I'm just gonna give you a time warning to make sure that all our speakers have. Yep. Thank I'm you. Almost done. Thank you, yeah. Uh, all these novels uh, are in print, thanks in hardcover and paperback, thanks to a reissue of the series by the University of Illinois Press, which has also published a selection of Farrell's Chicago stories. Um, there has been some useful critical essential to Farrell. I don't want to say that there hasn't. His, his biographer and bibliographer, Edgar Branch, began this work with a Farrell book and continued through many essays. Uh, other solid contributions have followed, and the inclusion of the Studs Lonigan trilogy in the Library of America is also a positive sign. Most important, though, Farrell's example has been and continues to be formative and heartening to a great number of American writers, among them Richard Wright, Nelson Algren, Meyer Levin, Norman Mailer, 
J.F. Powers, Edmund O'Connor, Kurt Vonnegut, Leon Forrest, Tom Wolfe, Pete Hamill, Betty Howland, William Kennedy, and Stuart Dybeck. From elsewhere in the English-speaking world, Farrell has inspired Liam O'Flaherty, James Plunkett, Brian McMahon, Michael McLaverty, John Broderick, Dan Davin, David Ballantyne, and James Kelman. All these people have acknowledged that debt. Uh, also, his readership remains strong. I've never given a talk on Farrell without at least one person coming up afterward to say how valuable his fiction has been to their understanding of their own lives. Uh, and yet, Farrell is not, still not where he belongs in the cultural consciousness and conversation about literature in our time. The statute of limitations on the line of bourgeois put forth by those who have ignored and undervalued his work expired a long time ago. It is high time to get cracking on making a change. Thanks. Joss, thank you for such an illuminating insight into the work of an author that certainly deserves to be um, more celebrated and studied indeed, and then he is. Uh, just to ensure that everyone gets their speaking time, I'm going to take all the presentations in one go and then we can open up to questions at the end just with whatever a lot of time we have left. So it's my pleasure now to introduce um, our next three speakers, um, all O'Shea's. I don't know if you're all the one family or related. Certainly you're, you're related by surname. Um, let me just, I think you're going to share your screen, which is great. Um, Connor O'Shea is an Irish American educator and scholar born and raised in Chicago. He's also a licensed landscape architect and assistant professor in the Department of Landscape Architecture at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And Mary Rose O'Shea is an Irish American educator and scholar also born and raised in Chicago. And she is a secondary English to teacher, labor activist, and doctoral student in literacy, language, and culture at the University of Illinois in Chicago, where her research focuses on critical literacy pedagogy, teacher beliefs and ideologies, and broader understandings of the term literacy. And Michael O'Shea is a community activist and PhD student in higher education at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto, whose research focuses on the relationship between treaty law and Indigenous access to post-secondary education. He is also a co-founder of Potscope, an international organization that connects communities to the night sky. So I'm very much looking forward to their paper, No Longer at the Crossroads, Irish Dance Halls in Chicago and Late Generation Ethnicity. All right, uh, thank you, Fiona, for that um, introduction. Um, good morning, or depending on your location, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mario Zoshay, um, and I am delighted to be here today with my two brothers, uh, Connor and Michael. Um, before we um, uh, begin, uh, Michael is going to um, acknowledge the land um, that we are currently on. Um, great, great to be here. Sorry we can't be here in person. Um, before we begin, um, it's important that we recognize that um, here in Chicago, we are on Indigenous land. Um, our paper is about place and geography, so it's especially important to uh, recognize these lands as Indigenous homelands. Um, after all, Chicago is an adaptation of a French translation of an Algonquin word for the wild garlic that grew abundantly along these shores. So um, I'll leave that land acknowledgement up for a second. You can take a moment um, to reflect, especially for those in the Chicago region, um, about our place here um, as settlers on this land. Thank you. Right, uh, thank you, Michael. Um, we are honored to be here and we would also like to acknowledge our gratitude to those who've inspired, influenced our informed, um, ongoing research and cultural education, including but not limited to many of the scholars of this conference, including Dr. Fanning and Ellen Skerritt, um, as well as our parents and grandmother who instilled in us a deep appreciation for Irish culture and tradition. Uh, um, as mentioned today, we are sharing an overview of our ongoing research on dance halls in Chicago from roughly the post-World War I period to the late 1960s. Our research aims to describe how dance halls functioned as social centers, their role in Chicago's urban fabric, and their relationship to Irish American identity and history. 
While more extensive literature, including fictional cameos, exists on dance halls in general and more specifically on dance halls in places like Boston, New York, and London, there's considerably less um, about those in Chicago. And we respond to this topic as interdisciplinary scholars and as Irish Americans with lived experiences. So uh, why dance halls? On our next slide. Um, in full disclosure and acknowledgement of our positionality, um, indeed we are siblings, and we were initially drawn to this topic out of family history um, curiosity piqued by artifacts such as this, a personal copy of a book of tunes that are, uh, written by the great Irish Chicago musician, Cuz Tian. Um, Cuz knew our family in part because of our grandfather who um, passed away the month following the writing of that inscription. Um, he was involved in running some of these dance halls of the 1950s and 60s in Chicago. Um, you may recognize the surname on this 1958 advertisement from the um, Suburban Economist. Next slide, please, Ken. Connor, next slide. Um, so as you can see here, um, they're recognizing um, some names. However, um, we knew a little else. Uh, next slide, Connor. I guess there's a delay here. <laughs> All right, so um, we knew little else of these dance halls other than that story from our father um, and family friends, and so it began. So Cuz Tian, who came over from Ireland in the late 1920s, returned to Ireland and eventually came back the following decade, eventually settled in Chicago permanently several years later, is representative of the bridge between dance and music traditions in Ireland and the continuation and evolution of those traditions among the diaspora. Next slide. Oh, it's delayed. And this, this is a, a picture here from the Library of Congress archives um, and the, the excerpt as well that we're currently viewing is from the, the aforementioned um, Book of Tunes. Um, Christian also recounts in there dancing at the crossroads um, and then um, this is prior to coming again to Chicago and, and playing in the um, more formal dance halls. Okay. Um, so Irish social dances which took place in a variety of physical spaces as Connor will discuss um, further later were significant social and um, cultural sites as noted by Dr. Fanning in his 2012 piece on Eleanor Neary. Dr. Fanning also directs us to Mick Maloney's studies of Irish traditional music in America and description of the dance hall as a crucial social institution for the Irish in America. We are interested in particular both in the locations and the function of the dance halls, but also how dance halls contributed to the maintenance and development of Irish American identity and are currently considering those points through two different lenses. Michael. Thank you so much, sister. Thank you, Mary Rose. Um, so as Mary Rose mentioned, we're using two frameworks to approach our work. Um, the first is this concept of late generation ethnicity, which is um, an immigration and ethnic uh, development framework. Um, when we borrow this from uh, scholar Liam Kennedy, uh, whose work, A Sense of Ending Late Generation Ethnicity in Irish America, um, was referenced in the conference program. And we use this as a starting off point to think about um, whether or not the Irish uh, American community in Chicago is uh, a late late stage uh, generation ethnic group um, and where the dance halls fit into that evolving ethnic identity. Kennedy himself actually borrows it from the sociologist Herbert Gans, um, who traced the ethnic identity development of different um, white European immigrant groups in the US um, and their process of acculturation and assimilation. Next slide, please. Um, there are many characteristics of late generation ethnicity, and we're not here to um, debate or evaluate whether the Irish in Chicago are at that stage. Um, but one characteristic of late generation ethnicity is an ending or ebbing of the flow of um, immigration from the home country, um, a diminishing re replenishment of new people coming from the home country. Uh, Irish immigration has indeed slowed to the US and to Chicago particularly, but hasn't stopped entirely. Uh, after highs in the late 18th century in the post-famine era, the Irish-born population in the States has declined, um, particularly after the 1920s and 1930s, um, with quotas on immigration and the Great Depression. Still, though, um, the Irish-born population in 2014 
uh, was over 125,000, though down from 1.9 million in 1880. So again, this is not an immigration history paper, but it's important to keep these trends in mind as we think about who is in Chicago when these dance halls are appearing, who's organizing them, and who's going to them. Today, as the conference theme um, would assume Chicago remains an Irish metropolis, even if reduced from its high in the early 20th century. Um, today, about 7.5% of the population of the city proper claim Irish ancestry, many more in the suburbs. There are Irish concentrations today in strongholds um, like Bridgeport, Beverly, Mount Greenwood, and Canaryville, um, but there are communities throughout the city. That map at right um, is an excellent map from the Encyclopedia of Chicago um, that shows concentrations in that color, like a light, a light brown, a light tan, um, in city neighborhoods like Canaryville, just south of the loop, um, but also in suburbs like Oak Lawn, Park Ridge, LaGrange, Morton Grove. You'll see those, um, those light tan areas, um, southwest, west, and to the north. Um, and this map illustrates the migration out of the Irish uh, from the central city, um, which we'll talk about later, um, and their suburbanization in the post-war period. Next slide. Thanks, Connor. Um, our second framework is a critical geography framework, which helps guide our mapping. Um, mapping in an urban area, um, especially in a city as diverse, complex, and segregated as Chicago, um, requires that we approach mapping critically. So not um, assuming or taking things for granted, but asking questions, why? Why are things the way they are? How do demographics play into this? How does public policy play into this? How does race, class, and, and gender? Um, critical geography, um, as quoted by the scholar Dacia Gurbino, is a framework that highlights how power and domination are embedded in the creation of geographic boundaries. So if we're to say that Irish dance halls are both literal and symbolic expressions of Irish American culture, ethnicity and identity, what does their location and distribution say um, about Chicago and what does their disappearance say? Next slide, Connor. So it's really important that we, um, in addition to mapping these dance halls, understanding um, the demographics of Irish settlement and migration. Um, which is complex, and I know there have been other, some other great presentations today um, about the demographics of Irish Americans in Chicago. Briefly, I will say the Irish have lived in many different neighborhoods throughout Chicago. There's never been a single Irish neighborhood. Um, initially, as Ellen Skerritt explains um, in her great entry in the Encyclopedia of Chicago, um, initially Irish settlement would take place in industrial areas along the south side, such as um, Bridgeport near the canals, or later in back of the yards near the stackyards, an Irish settlement would expand along streetcar lines and rapid transit. Of course, a discussion of Irish identity in Chicago is incomplete without talking about uh, the Catholic Church, which I believe um, Alan Scarrett will talk about after us. So in these, these are two community settlement maps, one from 1900 and 1950, and you'll see the evolving locations of Irish communities throughout Chicago um, scattered throughout, especially throughout the south and west sides. Um, in these maps, we also see the effect of the growing black belt in Chicago um, during the Great Migration as African Americans left the Jim Crow South. Um, and there was an effect on um, Irish migration within the city. Uh, so fueled by racial anxiety that sometimes turned violent, the Irish would move South and West, such as the fictional families, uh, the O'Neills and the Flaherty's in the novels of James, James T. Farrell, referenced by Dr. Uh, Fanning just a moment ago. Um, and explained in this excerpt from um, the excellent volume by Eileen McMahon on the history of St. Sabina's Parish and that parish's demographic transformation from majority Irish to um, majority Black. And this racial anxiety would fuel another wave of migration in the post-war period as Irish were part of the white flight phenomenon away from the central city into suburbs. Um, itself a very complex phenomenon caused by a number of factors um, including not just racial anxiety, but uh, federal housing policies and unscrupulous real estate practices. So let's keep those two frameworks in mind, um, late generation ethnicity and critical geography, as we talk about methods, which my brother Connor will talk about next. Thanks so much, Michael. 
Um, and apologize, apologies for my uh, notes being over the, the screen uh, at the start of the presentation. Um, so just really generally speaking, our methods are divided into two uh, phases. Uh, so there's a mapping phase and then there's an interview phase. Um, and in terms of this ongoing project, we're sort of in the middle of the mapping phase. And so we're kind of coming up for air and offering a snapshot um, of our work at this particular moment in time. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more in a bit more detail about this mapping phase. Um, so phase one uh, involves mapping and also ground truthing, uh, which is a term we're using uh, to, that refers to following up in person uh, at the former dance hall locations using ground level photography as well as drone photography uh, to confirm and then also build upon uh, our findings from our review of literature, satellite images and other existing maps like the community settlement maps that Michael showed. But the big idea is that we're, we're sort of mining our review of literature for dance hall locations and other relevant information, such as their current uses, if the buildings still exist. This review of literature includes a lot of archival newspapers, uh, particularly local ones, local history publications, gray literature, but also some academic literature. Um, but of course, since we're embedded in the community here, we also want to acknowledge, include, and confirm uh, or challenge uh, some of the knowledge that we bring through lived experience. Um, so, for example, we grew up a few blocks from the Irish American Heritage Center um, in Chicago's Mayfair neighborhood. So that's a, you know, a data point for our maps that we don't necessarily need to glean from the review of literature. So the data that we're gathering is falling right now into four categories. So the first, of course, being the dance halls, um, the second being pubs, uh, the third being cultural centers, and then the fourth, uh, Irish import shops. Um, and then within the dance halls, we're seeing some sort of subcategories emerge actually, such as outdoor fields, um, which are places where dances also occurred uh, in Chicago. And what we're doing is we're adding these points to get really technical here for a second. We're adding these points in ArcGIS Pro, um, along with some existing maps, such as those community settlement maps, but also parish locations and census data. Um, and then we're also drawing on some basic uh, publicly available geographic data from ESRI, the mapping service, such as municipal boundaries, expressways, streets, um, and satellite images. Um, and then finally, we're exporting those maps uh, as raw, sort of unfinished drawings into Adobe Illustrator for further graphic design. Um, so I'll show a couple uh, snapshots from this process here. Um, so this is it's an example of one of our newspaper artifacts um, from the uh, Suburbanite Economist. Um, showing uh, uh, an advertising for the Keemans Club um, and the host Jim O'Neill and Dennis O'Shea at hosting at the Holiday Ballroom on Northwest Side. Um, another artifact here uh, describing Jim O'Neill's uh, bus that he chartered uh, to draw West Siders from Keemans uh, to the Northwest Side holiday because there wasn't a sort of easy route to get from the West Side to the uh, Northwest Side. Um, and then another one here, Jim O'Neill uh, and the Johnny O'Connor Orchestra. So this is sort of a sampling of you know, some of the, the artifacts that we're drawing upon to sort of begin to tell the stories and you know, confirm the locations and understand the dynamics within uh, these dance halls. Um, in terms of the sort of tools we're using as a, as a working group, we're using a Google Sheet, a uh, shared Google Sheet where we're collecting all of our data. Um, we're trying to also collect the opening dates and the closing dates for these dance halls so we can also do a more temporal analysis and a temporal representation um, of these of these places. Um, and so we're sort of building then this large geo database within ArcGIS Pro where we can export these various maps um, in different ways. Um, and if anybody else in the conference is working on uh, mapping now or in the future, I'd love to sort of have a you know conversation offline about some of your uh, approaches. Um, and then in the next phase, um, which we've actually just received IRB for, we're really excited about that. Um, we're going to be conduct conducting semi-structured interviews with members of the Irish American community here in Chicago. And so we're going to ask questions such as, do you remember attending a dance hall? Where was it located? How long did it operate for? What kind of music uh, did they play? So while we're still in the middle of this process, we do have some provisional claims and maps that we'd like to share with you and offer up for discussion. Um, so first, um, and what we're looking at here is a, a map of the dance hall locations um, that we've um, mapped as of, as of yesterday. Um, and so we've established that dance halls were ephemeral. There were no buildings constructed specifically as Irish dance halls. Uh, the events took place in existing facilities that also hosted other uh, events for wider audiences um, and other ethnic groups. Um, so for example, we haven't come across any building facades of dance halls chiseled with Irish names above the doorway uh, yet. Um, so in a sense, dance halls, uh, while they took place um, in ballrooms and similar facilities, were more ephemeral or event-based than architectural. 
Um, and then, you know, in terms of just sort of looking at the map and understanding what we're seeing emerge here, um, as one might expect, there are clusters emerging along the south side um, near 79th and Halstead and west of there, and then also on the west side along Madison. Um, and so I think those areas warrant uh, a more detailed mapping at a smaller scale. Um, there, there are no more dance halls um, currently in operation, but we have uh, started to sort out their former locations into three categories. Um, so there are dance halls which are now demolished and the land is vacant, such as Keemans at 4711 West Madison. Uh, it was demolished in late 93 after a fire. Um, other buildings have fallen victim to a similar fate. Um, others yet, uh, particularly ones in uh, areas that have higher economic development in Chicago, um, such as the Waveland Bowl, um, have been replaced by new development. Um, and then there are some uh, places such as the Irish Village, which I don't think is technically a dance hall, but is we're realizing is a very important part of this, um, this story, um, is actually now the Millennium Banquet Hall. Um, and it, its menu is not the menu for the, the, for, for the banquet hall, or it's listed in Polish um, and in Spanish right now. Um, so it's moved on to, to uh, serve other, other ethnic groups. So however, while dance halls are not operating, of course, Irish music and dance um, in different forms have, has transitioned into cultural centers and pubs. Um, and so in this map, we see not only the location of the dance halls, um, but also a map of uh, Chicago's Irish pubs as taken from an 1989 Chicago Tribune article titled, Where to Find the Irish Spirit. Um, and we're, we hope to map many more of these to get a sense of how um, they've sort of moved uh, around the city over time. And then the fourth provisional claim based on the mapping process that we'd like to make is that cultural centers, so uh, namely the Irish American Heritage Center on the Northwest side, and then Gaelic Park and Oak Forest um, are regional attractions, but they are also still significant social and cultural destination at the local neighborhood or parish scale. So they're actually operating at two different scales. Um, so as you can see on this map, um, their location near the expressways, which is the dark, uh, the sort of bolded uh, white line, um, it's critical for access by Irish Americans who left the city for the suburbs during white flight or afterwards. Um, so Gaelic Park's current location, uh, it, you know, Gaelic Park was originally on 47th Street. Um, it, it actually reflects the movement of the Irish for, further and further south, um, you know, something that we're reminded of in studs. Um, however, as I mentioned, the location is still important at the neighborhood scale. For example, the Irish American Heritage Center is in the Mayfair neighborhood and in St. Edward's Parish. Um, and there's a high percentage of Irish and Irish Americans in that parish. At the same time, it's still, uh, you know, there are the regular visitors there from places as far away as Lake Forest. Um, so it's important at this different scale. And so I think because of this, we wanna make a connection back to critical geography or even critical urban theory to suggest that the flow of Irish Americans around the region via expressways or public transportation between city neighborhoods, outer ring suburbs, inner and inner ring suburbs to places like these regional destinations, it kind of complicates that sort of uh, oversimplification of the uh, traditional city and suburb dichotomy um, that I think underpins a lot of uh, popular conceptions about the sort of older, colder American cities like Chicago, Boston, Detroit, New York, et cetera. Um, yes, white flight um, occurred during the 20th century, but Irish immigrants still land in city neighborhoods, um, or in some cases move directly to middle class inner ring suburbs, or even to higher end gentrified neighborhoods. Um, there's sort of a new pattern of immigration um, moving around the city. Um, and so it's not a simple flow of Irish Americans back from the suburbs into the city and back out again. And so I think it's just interesting to think about this model of American urbanism through a late generation ethnicity uh, lens. Um, so with those four claims in mind, uh, we'd like to return to Liam Kennedy's challenge to identify and understand the features and implications of lateness. Um, so to, to sort of continue um, this discussion, um, I'm gonna turn it back over uh, to my brother, Michael. Michael, you're on mute. I'm on mute again. Here we go. Um, I think mindful of, of time here. I know we're running um, up against the clock. Um, so I'll be brief um, in some of my, my discussion points. Connor has already made some great connections between um, his finding and critical geography, also critical urbanism, um, as well as situating um, the place and appearance of dance halls within um, Irish Chicago ethnic identity development. Um, this is an excerpt from a 1977 report um, from the American Folklife Center. Um, 1977 writes, 
very strongly. There are no Irish dance halls left in the city. Um, the, while well, we don't believe that Irish Americans were late generation by 1970s, um, the disappearance of dance halls by the 70s may signal something about evolving Irish immigration patterns, um, but also evolving cultural, social, um, musical preferences and, and expressions. So I'll turn that over to um, Mary Rose to talk a little bit more about um, other frameworks you might consider as well as some future research directions. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, just a few other um, points that we might find ourselves in. Um, so as a, a, a few things, um, you know, where, how, where's the dance hall culture today? Um, and I think Connor sort of talked about that, um, maybe taking a look at the cultural centers, things like that. Um, I'm also interested particularly in the political and labor connections. Um, as Connor mentioned too, the, a lot of these the spaces were used for other events as well. And so um, there's a democratic hall on the west side that was also used for dances. Um, I was able to find the addresses for many of the, um, the dance halls that were mentioned in by various people um, in the literature, actually in various labor directories in both Chicago or the United States. So these are labor halls, uh, which is also, again, we have this great Irish labor tradition in Chicago. So, you know, all of these um, kind of alignment of those points. And then I, I, in particular too, then I, I'm also interested in the relationships with other cultural or religious or ethnic groups. Um, and then also the, um, the um, kind of the, you know, there was a pushback against dance halls in general, right? Um, in, in, in Chicago, there was uh, the Dance Hall Commission 1912. They were investigating, you know, these things and then were they moral and dens of sin and all this kind of stuff. And then also in, you know, in Ireland, we have the, the Dance Hall Act of um, 1935, which, you know, seeks to regulate some of these, these things. So kind of the pushback against them but yet them being such a significant point of um, maintaining culture and identity and, and, and relationships. Um, you know, one of the places you see the most references to dance halls in, in the literature is in the obituaries in the local papers where in Chicago, you know, there's, there'll be, um, you know, write-ups about various people and they met their spouses um, at dance halls in Chicago. <laughs> and so they were such a significant point in maintaining um, relationships and families and identity and perpetuating this in Chicago. So I think there's a lot of different threads that we can look at within this. But again, the next stage then is to, to do some of these interviews and get some of these stories that really um, are behind um, these dance halls. So um, thank you for your attention this morning. And um, we look forward to discussing these topics further. Thank you all so much. Um, I think not just as a lived experience from three siblings, but um, as a model of interdisciplinary and indeed transdisciplinary research. This is just a fantastic insight into methodologies of how we might approach some of these issues. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to move on now to our uh, final speaker today, who is Ellen uh, Skerritt. Um, is Ellen, I, I think I have too many people on it. Is Ellen there? She is great, Ellen. Thank you. Um, let me just. Oh, great. Okay, one second. I'll get my. Now, can I see you? I can see you. Great, Ellen. Hello. Um, Ellen is a Chicago historian with a particular interest in Irish America. Together with Mary Lesh, um, she has edited and annotated Francis O'Neill's memoir, Chief O'Neill's Sketchy Recollections of an Eventful Life in Chicago. She's a former project coordinator and associate editor of the University of Illinois at Chicago's website, Urban Experience in Chicago, Hull House and its Neighborhoods, 1889 to 1963. She has also worked with Mary Lynn Bryan on volumes two and three of the selected papers of Jane Addams, 1881 to 1900. And her books include Chicago City of Neighborhoods, The Irish in Chicago, Catholicism, Chicago Style at the Crossroads, Old St. Patrick's and the Chicago Irish and Born in Chicago, A History of Chicago's Jesuit University. She is currently writing A History of Chicago's St. Ignatius College Prep. So she is obviously more than qualified to speak to us today about reconsidering the Catholic culture of the Chicago Irish. Ellen, over to you. Thank you so much. Oops. You're good now. Thank you so much. I'd like to bookend my visual presentation today with two Chicago authors, Finley Peter Dunn and James T. Farrell, 
who achieved national notoriety, Dunn for his Mr. Dooley Collins in the 1890s and Farrell for his Studs Lonigan trilogy in the 1930s. In their fiction, Dunn and Farrell were also historians of the Chicago Irish and its Catholic culture. Both drew on their parochial roots and immortalized them in literature. This was Finley Peter Dunn's boyhood world, Old St. Patrick's, the mother parish of the Chicago Irish, founded in 1846. It began in the modest frame structure you see at the right, but within 10 years, Irish parishioners had financed the brick church visible at the left, dedicated on Christmas Day, 1856. Finley Peter Dunn's uncle Dennis, pictured here on the rectory balcony, understood that by building Catholic churches and schools, the Irish were establishing a place for themselves in Chicago. They were creating community, investing in their future, and leaving their imprint on the urban landscape. The bricks and mortar mattered. There's a reason Old St. Patrick's bears a striking resemblance to the Smithsonian's red brick castle in Washington, DC. Dennis Dunn hired the prestigious firm of Carter and Bauer to create the first Romanesque edifice in Chicago. Asher Carter had worked with the famous architect James Renwick on the original Smithsonian building and his partner, German born Augustus Bauer played a leading role in the design and construction of New York's Crystal Palace. But nearly 30 years would pass before the distinctive towers of old St. Patrick's were raised by then, Finley Peter Dunn had moved farther west in the city so that his three sisters could be closer to their jobs as Chicago public school teachers. Old St. Patrick's retained its title as the mother church of the Chicago Irish, but it was quickly overshadowed by Holy Family Parish, founded by Jesuit Arnold Damon in 1857. A Dutch immigrant who learned English as a third language after French, Damon was a city builder. He declined Bishop Anthony O'Regan's offer of Holy Name Cathedral on the city's north side, preferring to organize Holy Family Parish on the west side, close to the railroad yards in the lumber district where Irish immigrants were employed. Damon's faith in the future of Holy Family was matched only by the territory he claimed roughly the size of Dublin. Perhaps because Damon grew up in a clandestine barn church in Holland, he understood why sacred space and music and art mattered. It was not a luxury, but an essential part of Catholic life. Shortly before sailing to America, 22-year-old Arnold Damon traveled to Paris and spent hours walking in the halls and gardens of Versailles, which had recently opened as a tourist attraction. Thanks to Dr. Simone Vermeeren's translation of an 1837 letter, we know Damon was so impressed with Versailles' enchanting beauties, beautiful paintings and statues that are so numerous, I cannot name them all, that he promised to write his parents again. If that letter exists, I haven't found it yet, but as this illustration makes clear, Damon would have seen countless examples of Second Empire buildings, four and five story brick structures with mansard roofs. Jesuit correspondents rarely mentioned architectural details, but an 1868 report to Rome noted that St. Ignatius College was begun, quote, on a rather grandiose plan, drawn up with the goal to compete with the Protestant colleges and the public schools, and that this grandeur was necessary. Chicago photographer Alexander Copeland captured the monumentality of Holy Family Church and St. Ignatius College in this stunning view that has been carefully preserved in the Jesuit archives in Belgium. Damon came to Chicago in 1857 and within three months laid the cornerstone for a Gothic church that newspapers described as the largest edifice in the United States. Unlike Archbishop Hughes in New York, who stopped the construction of St. Patrick's Cathedral on Fifth Avenue because of the financial panic, Damon regarded Holy Family as hope in the future of Irish Catholics and their city. When Dedication Day arrived in 1860, thousands of Chicagoans turned out to witness the ceremony, an event documented in news accounts in Boston, New York, Cincinnati, and even in Ireland. The Sligo champion took special note of Mozart's 12th mass, sung in magnificent style by a monster choir. Although it took 10 years more before Damon's dream of a college was realized, 
its second empire design by architect Hermann von Langen ensured that it quickly became a landmark in the city. What makes this accomplishment all the more significant is that Arnold Damon was raising money for a college at the same time he was constructing grammar schools for girls and boys in Holy Family Parish. News of Chicago's largest Irish parish also traveled to Rome in the letters Arnold Damon wrote to Father General Peter Bex. Of special interest in his 1865 report was Damon's comment that Holy Family School gave great satisfaction to parents and the public in general, and that the school band was the admiration of the city. Designed by architect Augustus Bauer and completed at a cost of $40,000, more than half a million dollars today, Holy Family's first class brick schoolhouse was intended to compete with the city's public schools. Posing for their picture are hundreds of pupils, many of whom marched in Chicago's funeral procession for President Abraham Lincoln in 1865. Standing on the steps is the school band whose members wore emerald green uniforms at parades, school exhibitions, first communions, and confirmations. Holy Family School was an investment in the lives of Irish American boys, and it paid dividends, although not always in the ways teachers could have imagined. Among those who learned their math in the Jesuit school on Morgan Street was Chicago's future gambler, Big Jim O'Leary. According to legend, it was his family's cow that kicked over a lantern and burned the city down nearly 150 years ago. Although Catherine O'Leary has been absolved of blame for the Great Chicago Fire of 1871, historians have paid little attention to Irish Catholic relief efforts. Talk about sins of omission. Holy Family Church and its schools opened their doors to house victims of the fire, as did the convents of the religious of the Sacred Heart and the BVM sisters. Arnold Damon's vow to place seven lights beneath the statue of Our Lady of Perpetual Help if Holy Family Church escaped destruction in the Great Fire was no urban myth. Since 1871, candles and later electric lights have continued to burn brightly. Not only did Irish families reinvest in their Gothic church, adding new side altars and statues, but the 300 foot tower and steeple made Holy Family the highest structure in Chicago. Irish parishioners had good reason to regard Holy Family as sacred space, a place of great beauty in their lives and in their neighborhood. In 1860, John Comiskey went door to door raising money for the round clear story windows that are now regarded as the oldest stained glass in Chicago. The Irish immigrant from Cavan became one of the most well-known Fenians in the city, as well as alderman and later president of the city council. His son Charles spent countless hours in the Comiskey family pew, number 18, no doubt counting the minutes before he could resume playing baseball. Charles Comiskey's passion for this American sport intensified when he enrolled as a preparatory student at St. Ignatius College in 1870. His widowed father was not pleased regarding baseball as a pastime for town boys and loafers. Alderman Comiskey transferred Charles to boarding schools in Wisconsin and Kansas, hoping his son's baseball fever would break to no avail. Here is the owner of the Chicago White Sox on opening day 1910 at Comiskey Park, a marvel of engineering whose grandstand seated 15,000 fans Historians have paid little attention to the Catholic dimension of the Chicago Irish, but I would argue that Charles Comiskey knew all about great spaces from the years he spent as a child in the Gothic Church of the Holy Family. Week after week, Comiskey experienced the beauty and spectacle of ritual during mass and on feast days, and national newspapers took notice, describing in detail the main altar created by Anton Boucher in 1865 that featured gas jets, a modern innovation, and the great organ imported from Montreal with its carved angels holding musical instruments. Reporter Jack Wing got it right when he explained to his readers that, quote, Catholicism is a religion of symbols. It appeals to the soul through the senses, employing poetry and music, sculpture and painting. There is no question that Charles Comiskey's baseball palace on 35th Street continued to inspire. As Charles Fanning reminds us, James T. Farrell was seven years old when he watched Ed Walsh 
pitch a no hitter in the new park. And years later, as a novelist, Farrell portrayed this historic baseball event as Danny O'Neill's first exposure to art. After leaving his boyhood home in Trelibane County, Cork, Ireland in 1865 and sailing the world, Francis O'Neill put down roots in Chicago with his wife, Anna Rogers. As a police officer walking his beat in the Bridgeport neighborhood, he would hear familiar tunes whistled by immigrant newcomers, and he spent a lifetime and a small fortune ensuring that these melodies did not disappear from Irish culture. Francis O'Neill shared his passion for Irish music with his only son, Rogers, a brilliant violinist until tragedy struck. Valuing his own classical education in Latin and Greek as a student in Ireland, Chief O'Neill enrolled Rogers at St. Ignatius College rather than nearby Hyde Park High School or the new Carmelite College in Woodlawn. Despite his long commute by streetcar from 12th Street to Hyde Park, Rogers O'Neill looked forward to the six-year program at the Jesuit College and the opportunity to play football. His death from spinal meningitis at age 18 in 1904 devastated his parents and four sisters. Out of deference to his wife, Chief O'Neill never again played music in the family home on Drexel Boulevard. For most historians, Jane Addams, pictured at the left, needs no introduction. Together with Ellen Gates Starr in 1889, she founded Hull House, just a few blocks northeast of Holy Family Church. The settlement quickly achieved acclaim as the American counterpart of London's Toynbee Hall, and during her lifetime, it was celebrated in thousands of newspaper articles and magazines. Virtually unknown is Jane Addams' contemporary, Mother Mary Isabella. Born Mary Kane in Carrigaholt County, Clare, Ireland, she arrived in Holy Family Parish as a 10-year-old in 1865 with her illiterate widowed mother and four brothers. Educated by the Sisters of Charity of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Kane joined this Irish order in 1870 and she rose steadily through the ranks. Mother Isabella was a sister builder, a term Rima Loon and Schultz and I have found helpful in highlighting the crucial role women religious played in creating and sustaining secondary schools and colleges. Although Catholic sisters had been familiar figures in Chicago since 1846, that two Protestant women would choose to live here among quote, the uncultivated, captured the imagination of Americans. In her 1910 memoir that has never gone out of print, Adams recalled her dream of creating what she called a cathedral of humanity. Adams and Starr furnished Hull House with photographs they had collected in Europe and decorated the nursery with reproductions of Madonnas and casts from Donatello and Della Robbia. And they were pleased by the response to such beauty, noting that the children talked in a familiar way to the babies on the wall and sometimes climbed upon the chairs to kiss them. In an influential essay in 1899, Adams asserted that a settlement looks about among its neighbors and finds a complete absence of art. Really? The Catholic culture in the neighborhoods, Irish, German, French, Bohemian, and Italian churches would have been impossible to miss, especially this copy of Murillo's Holy Trinities that hung above the main altar of Holy Family Church since 1865. It's still there. Painted by a Belgian Jesuit who had spent six months in London studying the original, it traveled via Antwerp, New York, and St. Louis, arriving in Chicago decades before the city had an art institute. To say that the Irish are invisible in the literature of Hull House is an understatement. The pioneering 1895 study Hull House Maps and Papers devoted significant attention to Jews, Bohemians, and Italians discussing the synagogues, churches, and religious schools these groups had created. But nary a mention of the Gothic Church of Holy Family, St. Ignatius College, or any one of the parish schools that enrolled 5,000 children. This was the scene on May 31st, 1896, as the Confirmation Day Parade took over the streets of the neighborhood, an event that was largely the work of Irish women. Catholic sisters, many of them immigrants or the daughters of immigrants, prepared students for the important rite of passage, and the resulting spectacle received widespread positive coverage in all the city's newspapers. 
The vivid accounts of slum life portrayed by Hull House reformers were unrecognizable to the Irish of Holy Family, who belonged to the most highly organized Catholic parish in Chicago, perhaps the nation. This photo showing the balcony and steps of St. Ignatius College at the end of the 1896 Confirmation Day Parade also captures businesses that line 12th Street. Hirsch Brothers Photography Studio, where brides and grooms and first communicants had their portraits taken, Maloney Saloon, Eisenstadt Brothers Meat Market, and Jones Commercial College, to name but a few. Jane Addams and Mother Isabella Kane were both builders with a difference. Wealthy donors financed these red brick buildings designed by architects Allen and Irving Pond. But it wasn't always clear sailing for Adams. In 1895, the settlement narrowly missed being absorbed by the University of Chicago when benefactor Helen Culver promised President William Rainey Harper a million dollar gift that included the land on which Hull House stood. Hull House never left its original location at Halstead and Polk Streets. In contrast, the BBM sisters used tuition and modest contributions from Catholic families to expand their footprint in Chicago and the Midwest. Perhaps because so many Catholic sisters came from Irish working class backgrounds, they did not share reformers belief in vocational training. To put it another way, their mothers and aunts already knew about laundry and domestic service. The BBMs put their faith in higher education. Mary Kane was elected mother general of her order in 1919. And in 1922, she gave Barry Byrne his first important Chicago commission, the Immaculata High School on the city's north side. Byrne had been a draftsman for architect Frank Lloyd Wright and his prairie style design for this secondary school was a turning point in his career. Two years later, Byrne was hired as architect of St. Thomas the Apostle Church in Hyde Park, where funeral masses were later held for both Charles Comiskey and Chief O'Neill. My hope is that one day we will know as much about Chicago Irish teachers in the classroom as we do about baseball and Irish music. An important step in this direction is Sonia Birisho's dissertation and book examining Irish and African-American teachers and principals in progressive era Chicago. She may have been the daughter of an illiterate immigrant, but Mary Kane's experience of Catholic culture and education in Holy Family Parish set her on a path unimaginable to Chicago's civic leaders. And here was her final act as a sister builder. At age 75, Mother Isabella Kane mortgaged the BBM's community property to create a $2.5 million Art Deco skyscraper on Sheridan Road in 1935, collaborating closely with architect Naren Fisher on its design and the color and placement of marble in the interior. Not only did Bundeline College expand opportunities for Catholic women in Chicago, but it provided workers with round the clock employment as the depression deepened. Mary Kane grew up at a time when Irish stereotypes such as Bridget McGruiser still flourished. Yet when Irish Catholic women became educated, thanks to the investment made in them by parents and Catholic sisters, it was cause for alarm, not celebration. At the time, Thomas O'Shaughnessy created this stained glass window of Bridget, the teacher at Old St. Patrick's Church in 1912, school superintendent Ella Flagg Young was trying to impose a quota system that would effectively limit the number of Irish Catholic teachers in the city's public schools. Illinois Governor Edward Dunn, educated at Trinity College Dublin, had no such qualms about Irish teachers. As Sue Ellen Hoy discovered in her research on the Women's Trade Union League in Chicago, Governor Dunn credited Margaret Haley, seated here, and Catherine Goggin of the Chicago Teachers Federation with making him a convert to the cause of women's suffrage. It's worth mentioning, I think, that Haley learned parliamentary procedure as a member of the Women's Catholic Order of Foresters, founded in Holy Family Parish, and that she got her start as a labor leader in 1898 by filing suit against the foresters. In his classic 1923 conception of Chicago's concentric rings, Ernest Burgess identified the city's Little Italy's, its Black Belt and Vice districts, its Gold Coast and Rooming House areas, and emerging neighborhoods of two flats. 
I've looked in vain in the Burgess papers at the University of Chicago for the city that Catholics had helped to create parish by parish. It would have been impossible to miss the complexes that dominated city streets, and yet they are all but invisible in the pioneering sociological studies of the Chicago School. Here, by contrast, is a 1926 view of Chicago that maps the city's 238 Catholic churches, virtually all with parochial schools. This was the world in which James T. Farrell grew up, a city where Catholics identified their neighborhoods by parish names, and he never forgot these connections. After all, as Farrell wrote me in the late 1970s, his Irish immigrant grandmother had contributed 25 cents for a stained glass window in Holy Family Church. She was proud of this all of her life. Farrell's Boyhood Church of St. Anselm was one of the new mile square parishes that began in 1909 with a modern brick combination church school visible to the right but Sligo-born Pastor Michael Gilmartin and his congregation set their sights on a freestanding church with imported stained glass windows from Munich and a main altar that included shamrocks embedded in mosaic. As the new Romanesque church was nearing completion in 1925, the neighborhood changed racially from white to black. While Farrell accurately registers the bitter emotions of Irish families who feel they are being evicted from their homes, his Studs Lonigan trilogy also portrays the future of St. Anselm's, quote, standing in the rear of the church were four new and totally edified parishioners. Their skin was black. Unlike white Protestant and Jewish congregations that soon moved out of the neighborhood, St. Anselm's stayed put, welcoming African-American cradle Catholics and converting newcomers from the South, part of the great migration after World War I often overlooked by city planners, sociologists, and historians, is the remarkable way in which sacred space built by one Catholic ethnic group has been claimed by others. As Sue Ellen Hoy has documented through their schools and home visits, the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament, many themselves the daughters of Irish immigrants, played a significant role in the development of Chicago's black community. As was true for James T. Farrell, St. Anselm's commitment to education pay dividends for African-American children. We know from Timothy Neary's scholarship that basketball players from St. Anselm's crossed many parish boundaries from the late 1930s on as part of the Catholic youth organization that brought together Chicagoans of different ethnic and racial backgrounds. According to parish lore, black policymakers helped to fund St. Anselm's $500,000 recreation center that opened 10 years after this photo was taken. Its gymnasium, auditorium, cafeteria, and facilities for indoor skating and dancing were unlike anything enjoyed by Italian children in Holy Family Parish or Puerto Rican children at Old St. Patrick's. But as it became possible to purchase homes in previously all white residential neighborhoods in the 1950s and 60s, the exodus of black families from St. Anselm's began. This summer, the church immortalized in Studs Lonigan and beloved by generations of African-American Catholics will close its doors forever. Part of the massive consolidation plan of the Archdiocese of Chicago titled, ironically, Renew My Church. What will become of the second station of the cross that James T. Farrell's mother purchased with the insurance money from the death of her teamster husband or the marble altar with its inlaid shamrocks, a rare survivor of post-Vatican II liturgical changes? Should we care that sacred spaces such as these will soon be only a memory? I'd like to believe that the narrative of the Chicago Irish might have changed if historians had been as interested in acknowledging the long-term impact of its Catholic culture that extended beyond politics and across racial and ethnic lines, perhaps not. But I think that Finley Peter Dunn got it right back in 1902 when he lamented, I know history isn't true Hennessy because it ain't like what I see every day on Halstead Street. Historians is like doctors. They're always looking for symptoms those of them that writes about their own times, examines the tongue and feels the pulse and makes a wrong diagnosis. The other kind of history is a post-mortem examination. It tells you what a country died of, 
but I'd like to know what it lived of. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen, for such a compelling and wonderfully visual presentation. Um, it was absolutely extraordinary to see the ways in which Catholic culture has migrated and imbued the imagination um, of contemporary Chicago. And it's something that's very close to my own heart because um, in the Glucksman, we did an exhibition not too long ago about Joseph Albers as a Catholic artist and looking at the links between this work of this great modernist in relation to Piero. So I do think that those ways in which those of us who've grown up with Catholic symbols and Catholic architecture might migrate and take that to other areas is such an incredible area of research. So thank you so much um, for that presentation. We have a few minutes, I think, to open it up um, for questions um, for any of the panelists that have spoken. So um, the Charles, I'm going to, uh, the, the wonderful O'Shea siblings, <laughs> Michael, Mary and Connor and Ellen, if anyone has a question, I invite you to either unmute and ask or potentially to pop it in the chat. Um, and I also understand that James Barrett, whose presentation was recorded and shown this morning, that people may have questions for him as well. Um, I note that people are commending everyone for your fascinating papers. So thank you, Sophie, for, for that comment. Um, I don't know if anyone has a uh, question that they might like to either directly pose or a uh, remark to be made. Um, yeah, there is a, a question for the uh, Oshia. Can you tell us more about Irish pubs in Chicago? <laughs> <laughs> in terms of Going to the pubs or, or mapping the pubs? <laughs> in, uh, oh, sorry, in terms of mapping the pubs. <laughs> yeah, would that be a question maybe for, for Connor since he did a lot of the mapping or Mary Rose, do you have anything to add? I can just add something uh, just very generally. Um, I don't want to make um, I mean, I can speak from my own lived experience, but maybe I'll speak based on what we're seeing on the map. So it kind of relates to our methods. Um, but I think um, in terms of Irish pubs in Chicago, uh, if we were to take a glance at a map of uh, their distribution today, um, you would find that there are large clustered clusters in um, uh, sort of wealthier uh, north side uh, neighborhoods that are towards the lake. Um, and then there are also clusters down on the southwest side um, in uh, areas like Mount Greenwood, Morgan Park, Beverly, Kennedy Park. Um, and then also on the far northwest side, um, there are also uh, clusters of pubs. But then there are also, you know, what, when, we're, when we've been doing these mappings, um, either of historic dance halls or contemporary pubs, we're always trying to look for the single model to describe the, the map of Chicago. And then what we realize is that there are just, there are always these outliers um, that sort of, that foil us. Um, so uh, um, for example, like uh, the Abbey Pub um, uh, or uh, the Atlantic Pub and Grill on North Lincoln Avenue, um, these aren't really within uh, clusters of contemporary, of, of um, contemporary Irish pubs, um, but they are still places that people drive for miles and miles to get to um, for any given event. Um, and then I should also, and I would just say one more thing, um, you know, I, I mentioned the Irish American Heritage Center as a cultural institution where um, Irish Americans and Irish gather to take music lessons, to take dance lessons. Um, but there's also, of course, there's a pub within the Irish American Heritage Center. So there's actually two categories in one. Um, so these things overlap and they don't neatly fall into the categories that we're using, but we need the categories to unpack what we're, uh, what we're, what we're seeing, what we're studying. I don't know if that answers your question. That is uh, just there. a bit of reflection. Sorry, just about um, the dance halls and wondering, did the church have issues with the dance halls in Chicago? Ellen might know that. I don't know, Ellen, you're on mute. Jane Adams certainly had uh, problems with the dance halls in Chicago um, and their investigations um, of them. Um, one of the most moving pieces I ever found uh, in the Burgess papers actually by accident was James T. Farrell's um, 1929 piece on the dance halls in Chicago and during the depression. And here you could tell was a, a, an Irish writer, very gifted, 
in observing all the um, lessons he had learned from the sociologists at the University of Chicago, and yet he was taking it to a higher level. What was the aesthetic? What was being missed? Um, so this has been a wonderful panel to be on today with Charlie and the O'Shea's and um, really fun stuff. Thank you, thank you, Ellen. Um, and Deborah is also just commenting that she's also thinking of the way that the US parish relied on dances as fundraisers. Does anyone want to comment about that? Maybe Mary Rose? Sure, I, I would say one of the other things that we're noticing in the, um, you know, as I go through the literature is the dances, um, some of the ones that were in these fields or at the halls, they were fundraisers, whether for specific people, but also for causes, um, including, you know, political causes, uh, cause for, um, you know, Irish freedom and things like that. And so that's all the political underpinnings, um, I think are also important to be, um, to be recognized. And then those fundraisers now do take place in places like the Irish American Heritage Center, where you still have these benefits, you know, when you go to the pubs and the flyers are up there. And so a lot of these traditions are continued on. They've just, um, you know, transitioned to different spaces. And yes, they're referenced in, um, you know, in Brooklyn, we have the dance hall scene and, and there was a recent movie, I believe, um, uh, called Jimmy's Dance Hall or Jimmy's Hall or something. Anyway, there's, there's, some, there's some work out there in these fictional representations of the hall. Greg, do you want to come in with a question? No, a comment. The uh, the dance and fundraising traditions. Uh, I find them in Central Illinois in uh, early to mid 1850s, where Irish women organized dances. They organized dinners for the community. Uh, had traditional dancing demonstrations, traditional music. Uh, as fundraisers for building the first Catholic school in Bloomington for uh, the children, a little wooden building. And the uh, uh, women of the parish uh, continued their fundraising activities. Uh, their largest one was to build a, a academy building uh, to be um, operated by the Sisters of St. Joseph of Karen Delay. Uh, and that academy building, a three-story residential place, again, raised with funds from the women-led fundraising activities of dinners and dances. Uh, the uh, press was always very complimentary. They said they were the best ones ever put on in the community on a very regular basis. So it's an old tradition. Oh, fascinating. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'm not sure there's a, a, a gentleman with his hand up, Vinay Darwatkar, but I think he's on a phone call in. Vinay, did you want to come in with a question? Yes, there's one there. Yes, over there. You just go close the Okay. This is a question for uh, Charles Fanning. Uh, you, you named a lot of writers in some connection or other with James T. Farrell, but you didn't mention Saul Bellow, who seems very proximate in certain ways. Um, so I'm thinking of something like Augie March, which is a book that's often sort of taught together with 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 uh, Studs Lonigan. Uh, what do you make of that of that book's relation to Studs Lonigan or Bellow's relation to Farrell? The fact that Bellow went on to win a Nobel Prize, uh, Farrell had nothing like those accolades. Do, do you think Bellow was working in Farrell's tracks very deliberately with Augie March, or what, what, are, what are your views about that? Yeah, well, uh, I think uh, he probably was, uh, but he would not have admitted it. Um, uh, in fact, I think Ellen has an approximate antidote, uh, anecdote about this. Could you? Yes, I do. Um, yeah. When I was um, a graduate student at the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago, chaired by Saul Bellow, um, he asked me who I read, and I said, James T. Farrell, and he shook his head, no, 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 um, dismissing <laughs> him. Uh, and that took my breath away. Um, later, um, I found out from Farrell that Farrell had actually written in favor of Dangling Man to be published. So th this, um, I, this is personal. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and Vanguard, which was Farrell's publisher, published Va Dangling Man, but mostly on Farrell's uh, recommendation, right? Yeah. 
Well, thank you all. Um, I'm aware that our colleague Aileen Delan is coming up next and that you need to have a bit of a break before we speak. Her. That, from my perspective, is just such a stunning panel, um, not least because all of you are kind of um, bringing back into focus elements that are lost, but the beautiful way in which they kind of commented and focused on each other was really wonderful. So. Um, Thank you, uh, Charles. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Connor. Thank you, Mary Rose. Um, I wish we could give you a rousing Irish Bula boss. Um, that's not possible, but certainly from Cork, I am giving you my warmest thanks um, for a really fascinating afternoon. And um, Gurv Mila Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Merci. Thank you very much. <laughs>um, of her approach uh, to music. However, today um, we're going to look at another more theoretical aspect um, of her work. Uh, she has a very impressive list of publications in a number of areas, notably protest songs and the links between music and ethnic identity. Um, uh, this work has to be set alongside a, a number of collaborative uh, research projects, uh, several of which are ongoing. I'll just mention two as they seem to be uh, uh, relevant to the paper uh, that we're going to hear this afternoon. One called uh, Global Irish Musics and the other Limerick Soundscapes. Work uh, along the interface between uh, global influences and the soundscape uh, of a particular urban space uh, is clearly at the centre of her current uh, preoccupations. Uh, as you can see in your handout, um, she's at present completing a monograph, uh, Irish American Musical Imaginaries, which will feature field, field work uh, in Chicago from that particular perspective. Um, Eileen has a very strong ongoing connection with Chicago, uh, and goes, uh, which goes back to the late uh, 1990s, uh, when she attended the University of Chicago on a Century Fellowship, before returning some years later to complete her PhD uh, on ethnomusicology uh, at the same university. Today's paper is therefore uh, on the soundscape of a city um, uh, with which she's intimately in tune. Um, and the paper is called uh, Chronotopes, uh, Cartographies uh, and Musical Imaginaries, Celtic Chicago at the end of the long 20th century. Thank you. I'll hand over to Eileen. In the city of Chicago, as the evening shadows fall, there are people dreaming of the hills of Donegal. 1847 was the year it all began. Deadly pains of hunger drove a million from the land. They journeyed not for glory, their motive wasn't greed, a voyage of survival across the stormy sea. In the city of Chicago, as the evening shadows fall, there are people dreaming of the hills of Donegal. Some of them knew fortune, some of them knew fame, more of them knew hardship and they died upon the plain. They spread throughout the nation, they rode the railway carts, they brought their songs and music to ease their lonely hearts. <laughs> Music and song are powerful tours, tools in shaping and expressing values and identities. They reflect and generate socio-political and cultural imaginaries. Songs of migration in particular from the 19th and 20th centuries have shaped my own experiences. As a traditional musician growing up in rural Ireland, Irish national identity was closely aligned with Irish traditional music and Irish song, 
slow airs and dance tunes. But there were other forms of music that jostled for position in narratives of an Irishness and belonging here and there in the diaspora. Cultural expressions, ju not just from Muscari, Gaeltacht or the hills of Schlie of Lucre, or even the south side of Chicago, but also from commercial 78 RPM recordings, Hollywood movie soundtracks, country and Irish bands, even rock groups. All of these could be accommodated in expansive views of Irishness, but invariably what constituted Irish music and hierarchical registers of Irish identity back then was contested and invariably patrolled. Songs are also emotional maps in individual and collective lives, spanning across space and time, often truncating and collapsing both. In his work on Topophilia, Yi Fu Tuan points out that we seldom say this is our landscape, but we often say this is our song, and we might say this is our soundscape. I open up with the song by Luca Bloom to both illustrate the manner in which a song can disarm while speaking to deceptively complex processes of narrative generation. And Irish American Chicago has its own particular agents, texts and tune settings, local histories and practices that are particular, but that also connect with global flows and ideas from over a century and a half. As an ethnomusicologist, someone who tries to study why people make music and why that should matter, my presentation today focuses on two performing contexts in the 1990s Chicago, building upon and very much intersecting with so much of what has been presented in the last two days, namely the pub and the festival site. Though I have spent a lot of time thinking and writing about early 20th century Chicago music scenes, the end of the long 20th century speaks to me in ways that connects Irish, Irish American and Celtic pasts and futurities. All ethnographies, of course, are partial truths. And this foray today is simply a sliver of a larger story. I occupy coordinating points in the following narrative, not as an ethnographic exercise, but as an acknowledgement of being implicated both in the research project and in that larger story of migration as an insider and as an outsider. And so I will do this in four chapters. And this is the first chapter, cartographies and chronotopes. In September 1998, I arrived in my new as yet unseen home in East Hyde Park Boulevard, South 51st Street in Chicago. Like thousands of Irish people before me, I had followed a particular path, a migrant from Ireland, going to the United States for new opportunities. I recall finding the moment hugely significant. And once I had um, unpacked my bags in my brand new sublet, the first thing I did was orient myself, lake to the east, university to the south, downtown to the north and westward, the stuff of myth and legends. Facing Ireland, I hung up an old style signpost with the name of my village on it, Temple Glanton, and I pointed it eastwards towards home. It didn't matter that my latitudinal lines were all off. Ireland is parallel with Labrador and Canada and not with Chicago. I'm at the 55th parallel. You guys are at the 42nd in Chicago. But the symbolism was significant to me even then. Uh, though, of course, my trip was very different from those early migrants from Donegal and other parts of Ireland during, uh, pre and, of course, post the famine of the mid 19th century and ever since. I was not looking for work, but rather availing of a funded education at the University of Chicago. And I also belonged to a cohort of European migrants that enjoyed a level of mobility and social and cultural capital that was perhaps unprecedented. I could avail of cheaper flights that, on a whim, I could take home in an emergency directly to Shannon Airport from Chicago and be back in my home in 45 more minutes, if I desired. This was the era of the burgeoning Celtic tiger economy, buoyed by the recent signed Good Friday peace agreement that ushered in a new era of political stability and inward investment to all of the island. There was a newfound cultural confidence with the sleek productions of Riverdance show seeded in the Eurovision Song Contest of 1994, a decade of which Ireland hosted three times during that 90s, Ireland hosted the Eurovision three times. And do of course remember Michael Flatley of the Southside Chicago was in Riverdance. There was a huge increase in this decade in cultural, cultural, like Celtic cultural identification and commodification, particularly in the music industry, where Irish music became part of a broader world music and ambient category. It was global, cosmopolitan, hybrid, and in dialogue with others. 
And I'd like you to think of maybe Enya or the Chieftains in Santiago or hugely popular bands like the Afro-Celt sound system. But just a decade before me, my soon to be bandmate Aidan O'Toole, shown here on the top left, had arrived in Chicago with no job and only a couch on which to sleep, but a determination to succeed and not return to 80s Ireland, which was so economically and socially depressed by unemployment and migration. Before him, they had been peaks and troughs in migration patterns, adding to the admixture of Irish and Irish Americans over 150 years or more in the city, alongside, of course, many other migrants from different points of origin, generating one of the most multi-ethnic cities in the USA. Mid-century Irish migrants produced a generation of cultural producers that I encountered of considerable fame and success in the period. And at the picture there, you will see down at the bottom, uh, Fiddler Liz Carl, after whom Mayor Daly called September 19th, 1988, Liz Carl Day. And you can also see Michael Flatley and a number of other people, Jimmy Keane, Marty Fahey, um, who I still collaborate with, and uh, there down in the, to the bottom left, that's the band I was in, Anish, also with Aidan O'Toole. And Aidan is somebody I've written about quite extensively. So all of these ethnic entrepreneurs were building upon a particular uh, pattern of migration from the 60s onwards. And uh, I will return to both Michael Flatley and Liz Carl uh, towards the end of my paper. <clears throat> they brought their songs and music to ease their lonely hearts is how Luca Bloom speaks of the power of musical migration. But music does not just serve communities in space and time, it also transcends them. With the analytical device of a chronotope, Bakhtin explores how time, chronos, and space, topos, are configured discursively, allowing for the differentiation of genre within literature and the manner in which time is treated. Extending and adapting this to music and the sonic episteme, the space-time worlds of music and song are doubly enrolled in that music is performed to people in a social situation, in a given place and within chronological time, allowing for the past and present, public and private, individual and collective, real and imagined, to collide in powerful ways. Like discourse and as a discourse, but with its own semantic system, song and music reveal the forces operating in the cultural system from which they emanate, revealing times and places, worldviews, ways of speaking and singing, and shared values. Music's power is located in the discourse it generates within the form, especially where there are lyrics, between those who perform and listen, and the manner in which it actually bypasses discourse and even cognition to appeal on the very somatic level to the emotional pathways that are already laid down by memory and entrainment. Music both maps and generates those maps by which we negotiate our way, but it can also elide difference and generate sonic color lines, something that I'll get to later. I also tell the story of emplacing that old fashioned signpost brought for me from a tourist shop by my sister for other reasons. The sign also complicates narratives about tourism, consumption, and capitalism, for even this kitschy product could come to have meaning and value, indexing a set of relationships that define a person, and indicating that no symbol, material or sonic, could be dismissed as simply inauthentic or commercial. University of Chicago anthropologist Ajrona Potterai's work on modernity and globalization theorizes ersatz nostalgia, a feeling of loss for something you never had that proved so important when considering the role of catalog culture and commercial mediation in 19th and 20th century Chicago in the fabulation of a narrative of the city and of America writ large, something explored so beautifully in the work of Kathleen Stewart. A Potterai saw too, and I quote, discriminate between the forces of nostalgia in its primary form and the ersatz nostalgia on which ma mass merchandising increasingly drew, as well as how these things might relate to the consumption patterns of different groups, end quote. The interaction between Irish music and Irish America and American identity in the 1990s proved important to unpack in this respect but separating out these categories, associated processes of performance and the secondary production of identity through consumption 
is not always easy or one directional. Irish identity, of course, has been implicated in the American musical landscape and soundscape from the outset, but especially in the commercial entertainment industry from the original Irish performers of minstrelsy, the Irish performers and Irish American performers on the vaudeville circuit, right through the Tin Pan Alley era, up through the folk revival and manifesting in the ubiquitous Irish pub and festival scene of the 1990s, which is the focus of my paper today. And this is an important point. For many Irish Americans and the American public in general, the location, to use the word of Homi Baba, of Irish culture is found more often within the context of musical performance rather than art and literature. Irish music in the United States in all its guises narrates the stories of Irish emigrants and their subsequent generations through both emic and etic constructs that share at their very core a sense of longing and a looking back to a misty and imagined past and also many real pasts, things that can be translated as powerful expressions of both sentimentalism and nostalgia. And you can look at the work of W.H.A. Williams and Charles Hamm in particular, and of course, uh, the wonderful Patrick O'Sullivan who's at this conference. But all of these things too, and especially nostalgia and the operation of nostalgia can belie some structural racist issues. In the end, the community participates in, configures, reconfigures and resists various tropes through often maybe using ironizing as well as, as, well as de-ironizing gestures. Again, I go back to my bandmate Aidan O'Toole and in the 1980s and early 90s, he joined a band called the Muck Brothers. And one of the things that they would do would play uh, north side pubs and bigger halls and venues, embodying the rowdy, drunk, uh, pugilistic Irish, um, which was consumed with great vigor by middle-class Lincoln Parkers um, who adored this form of consumption. And, you know, they did it with irony, but the irony wasn't always picked up. In tackling these issues um, of a kind of nostalgia and the manner in which they interact, Svetlana Boym uses a useful typology. She distinguishes between what she calls restorative nostalgia, which is about truth and tradition, the national, the monumental, the commemorative, and what she calls reflective nostalgia, which is a more ambivalent and contradictory and quite social and sometimes unintentional uh, nostalgia that is quite consumptive in nature. In many ways, these two nostalgias interact within the Irish American sphere, but reflective rather than restorative nostalgia might perhaps map on a little bit more easily to Irish American Chicago. Broadly signified by a lack of desire to really return and to have things be the way they were, but rather than make a sense of life within America. Of course, in that sense, it becomes commemorative within the American uh, public sphere. This is a condition shared by so many generational migrants um, and should shared experiences be kind of, come a kind of unspoken restorative nostalgia, part of a national narrative of what it means to be white American as explored by uh, Cecilia Tishi and as I mentioned earlier, Kathleen Stewart. Similarly, restorative nostalgia is in another guise, the debate about origins and authenticity that sets different generations of Irish and America against each other. And this is the reason why some musicians will not play or sing something like Tura Lura Laddie, Tura Lura Lay for an elderly Irish American whose sense of self and identity is profoundly bound up with this song, but which for a musician is deemed perhaps certainly a newly arrived musician, inauthentic, uh, inauthentic commercialized music. The conflation of Irishness with nostalgia seems to come less out of direct immigrant experience and the idea of Dioriot, and more from the attribution of nostalgia as a very sentimental nation, nature of the Irish in America, a kind of a transmorgified Danny Boy effect, resulting in a public ownership of this very private of sentiments something Ellison argued in 1999. In such a reading then, Irishness is as much a configuration of an idea, a romanticization, a trope of the imagination and a modality of American social, culture and political landscape as it actually is a collective expression of a distinct ethnic group across generations. 
And all of these things can be played out in really interesting ways when you look at the narrative and the structures and sounds of American popular music from the 19th century. And you can actually create a direct link in many ways between the tunes collected by Thomas More and that were subsequently circulated within North America. This is something, of course, James Chandler can, can speak to. And uh, in the work then of people like Charles um, Ham, because these things go right through, are routed through people like Stephen Foster, and then emerge in uh, some of the um, repertoire of the Irish tenors. But back to Chicago, that most ethnic of cities might be viewed as having a particular take on nostalgia and on the immigrant Irish experience. Not only was 1990 Chicago an intense site for negotiating nostalgias with its mobile and diverse ethnic populace, but Chicago itself had at that particular time and still remains a distinctly nostalgic facet in its rhetoric and sense of self. I mean, lots of cities do this, but I came across a plethora of uh, books about Chicago, constantly romanticizing its past, its gateway to the expanding West, its hub of the railroad culture, its home of the first skyscraper. Diarmo noted in 2003 in his book, The Pig and Skyscraper, that the mayor of Chicago at the time, Irish American Mayor Daly, commented that when he was looking at his domain, that he looked forward to the future with nostalgia. The period, of course, which I'm addressing today falls within the governance of Mayor Daly, who um, was mayor from 1987 to 2011. Citizenship and nostalgia then are somehow conflated and to be American, to be Chicagoan, to be part of a broad stroke ethnic heritage is to be uh, a citizen and to contribute to the fabric of this place. Back to my apartment and as I venture out, I gradually learned to navigate this new city in space and time. And I observed how maps like from the CTA were not mediations and simplifications of lived experience at all, but were actually the ultimate ideological tool that shaped how I moved and navigated this world. As I said, I would orient myself, Lake always to the east. I adhered to the stern warnings never to venture south beyond the university borders, but ignored chidings and rebukes by classmates that I should never ever take the Red Line L train system south to 55th and get the bus across to Hyde Park. Because on non-White Sox game days, I often, invariably in fact, was the only white person on the Red Line. And there was such fear around that. I never had any problem. So I gradually came to know that the visible and invisible borders and patrols that separated whites from blacks also operated in the many Irish pubs and cultural venues, venues I frequented um, as a performing musician. It was after I left Hyde Park in my first year that I also came to know that the celebrated collector of Irish music, the superintendent of the Chicago police force, the Cork immigrant Francis O'Neill, who as Ellen has described saved Irish music, just lived a few streets away from campus, um, as you can see in that map there. But as yet, that was an unfelt topographic resonance. However, I was keenly aware of O'Neill's need to map and to lay out Irish music in Chicago at the beginning of the 20th century, corralling and disciplining the Irish migrant tradition relocated here in a modernist book that spoke as much to his American experience as it did to any notion of capturing authentic Ireland. And you can see his bird's eye view, that idea of the bird's eye view of Chicago, um, his 1903 music of Ireland, I think in many ways was the ultimate modernist uh, project in that respect. And interestingly, if you look at the stacks of tunes that he packed into each page, these are the very tunes that continue to be played today and certainly were very alive in 1990 Chicago. So again, these uh, conflations of time and space um, are very profound. So as a musical ethnographer, I spent time in these spaces, in pubs and festival sites, wherever, doing what Clifford Geertz called deep hanging out or James Bradley calls participant observation. These are the tools of my trade. Though really, in retrospect, what I was doing was making friends and building community. Parks and Borges of the Chicago School of Sociology 
helped me to focus on the local and make sense of the local. Um, and Gotham with his view on the city as a dramaturgy and of actors as agents. And microactionist theorists like Deserto, who focused on spatial practices and tactics, along with, as the O'Shea's mentioned, human geographers, critical geographers, phenomenologists that theorized how practices happened in space and generated space informed my thinking at the time and continue to do so today. And urban theorists like Setha Lowe and Lucy Lippard with her lure of the local helped me think uh, beyond, but also within the latitudinal and the longitudinal. In terms of the um, title of this conference, Edward Cronin's Nature's Metropolis offered a new way of thinking about Chicago, not as a bounded city, but as a set of relations that grew out of Western expansion, the hog butcher of the world, the green capital, the pig in the skyscraper. That hinterland concept could profitably be extended to Ireland, to what Cheryl Herr has called a kind of critical regionalism, connecting new two nodal points of regions, the west of Ireland in particular, and Chicago, bringing the canal makers, the dockyard workers, the politicians, the musicians, the students, across 150 years, different registers of Irishness and Irish Americans becoming visible and plural, contingent, never essentialist or exceptionalist, part of a tapestry and a pathway of being, which was part of a bigger uh, identity project for the city. One of the more interesting ways that Chicago was mapped for residents and visitors from that city in the 1990s and in the 2000s was through a particular company called Big Chicago. This is one of their CDs from the World Music Festival of 2000. And you can see um, the various contributors to the tracks. And other CDs available from this company included the Chicago Jazz Tour, the Chicago Blues Tour, Women Who Swing, Jumpin' and Jive in Chicago, and as I just said, the World Music Festival. Here was the one offered um, for Irish music culture. It was a CD that made a number of interesting points that could be unpacked to reveal a particular agenda on behalf of this company. One of the most important was that Irish music was one of the many brush strokes that colored the musical landscape of Chicago, and thus was an integral sound to the city. But there wasn't a sense of dominance or privilege here necessarily. But also what was of particular interest in this CD was the inclusion of a map or an abstraction of the city understood in relation to a network of pubs that platformed Irish music. Hidden treasures of Irish music in Chicago um, basically was like the Columbian exhibition writ large across the city, inviting participation, not quite as a flaneur, but I guess as an automobile propelled flaneur in the city. And this is the map that they included. And you can have a look at it there. I think this would be helpful um, for the O'Shea's if they don't have it already, because many of these pubs are actually gone. Some of them are cultural centers like the Old Town uh, School of Folk Music. You can see the Irish American Heritage Center, as the O'Shea's pointed out on the expressways. The Abbey Pub too. Um, and if you look at the insert, one of the pubs that absolutely fascinated me at the time was one in uh, Chicago Midway Airport called Irish Times. There's a pub there still that's beyond um, a passport control. So if you ever wanted to think about non-places non Marc Auger, there's a, there's, a, there's a pub for you to think about in that respect. Um, I played in all of these uh, bars um, when I was uh, there and I taught in the Old Town School of Folk Music. Um, this was my pathway. This was that near north side moving upward, as the O'Shea's pointed out, a particular moment in this cartography of Irish uh, music uh, hosting. And I want to insist that because I'm not giving you the long durée here at all. From a, the perspective of the musicians I was studying and you know their social relations at the time of the CDs released, there were many professional opportunities, in part as a result of both the global resurgence of Irish pub, as well as local histories, histories and lineages of performance of Irish music in the city. Um, many of these were community hubs and buildings, others were more commercial, but actually those distinctions never really fully held up because it was all about how people interacted with those spaces. I turned to two newly created pubs of this period that drew on the language, the chronotopes, if you will, of other stagings of Irish culture in Chicago of the past, along with the language of Celtic identity formation of this period. And I've outlined them there, Fado and Chief O'Neill's, both of which uh, uh, featured music as a key constituent of their multisensorial experiences that also included food, decor, and drink. 
One, of course, a downtown chain located at the heart of the commercial tourist district, and one, a neighborhood bar taken over by two Irish musicians centered on the real life figure of Chicago musician Francis and collector Francis O'Neill. So this might seem like a, a case of the global super pub versus the ethnic neighborhood tavern, but these sites tell in what, does, as De Sarto points out, spatial stories that actually underline greater similarity than difference, and where music enfolds as well as unfolds in the space. Fado was established in 1998, a year I arrived in Chicago. One of a number of franchises that started in Atlanta, its iteration located in the downtown tourist area just off the Magnificent Mile, its neighbors included, as you can see from these pictures, Rolling Stones, uh, the Rainforest Cafe, and a number of other kind of hyper real commercial um, outlets. Outside, it was a simple red brick building, but it drew on Celtic iconography, Fado, the Irish for long ago, it's how you start a story, Fado, Fado, it's very time unspecific, which is of course how uh, ideas of the Celtic operate, as Amy Mulligan pointed out so well yesterday. Um, and then you go inside and Fado Fado is exactly what the uh, carefully curated interior does. It invites the customer to take a step back in multiple times. And so you move in, walk past a portal dolmen uh, made out of papier mache. You see Corrucks from the Galway tradition. You see Viking ships, hulls of ships. You see a rendered plaster distressed. You see the, the, the utility objects, uh, the work objects from houses, from farms, all juxtaposed in a type of uh, bricolage, a narrative of a composite Irish Celtic, uh, Chicago, um, uh, Irish American imaginary that you might in some cases be tempted to read as a sort of postmodern pastiche. And certainly at the time, postmodernism was all the rage as a theoretical tool. But for me, it always was a bit of a cul-de-sac because, uh, you know, if you look at this moment, it's not in certain ways too dissimilar for the kinds of encounter and engagement one would have had in the Irish villages of the Columbian Exposition. You know, there's lots of authentic stuff there. You can see the crackers and the oxo cubes. These are all uh, tastes and smells of particular eras. Arts and crafts, mythology, Celticity, Brendan Voyage. Uh, you know, uh, yes, they're all juxtaposed, but they're, they're just more kind of... Uh, squished together. It's not really about the narrative, it's about creating a space of encounter. Um, because the bric-a-brac decor didn't seem to confuse but rather intensify the experience to those I interviewed at that time. It was the mere sound of jigs and reels, as many customers told me at the time, that conjured up all kinds of associations with a real or an imagined Ireland, a Hollywood Ireland, but also with an Irish Chicago. At least three audience or customer groups needed to be accounted for in Fado. Tourists could make up approximately half of those attending in any given night during the summer season in the 1990s and into the 2000s. The tourist type that predominated in that moment was the out of towner, somebody from somewhere else in North America. They came to Fado because they were looking for food and thought the place looked interesting. Some of them simply didn't fancy going to the Rainforest Cafe or they found in tourist literature that this was a place for quality food that was not too expensive and wasn't fast food. Some expressed an interest in seeing Chicago Irish pub because they had frequented Irish pubs elsewhere across various cosmopolitan centers, not only across the US, but across the world. Very few in my interviews were looking for any kind of necessary authentic Irish experience. Ironically enough, much of the bric-a-brac within had been imported by the Dublin uh, company from Ireland. So the material culture was actually quite real. Another group was the downtown business person, man or woman, um, for them, Fado was a regular hangout, easy to access from the office, good food, nice quiet corners in which to have business discussions and, you know, a little bit more welcoming and private than the open layout of brighter, noisier sports bars. And then the final group in attendance might simply be characterized as predominantly North Chicago side residents who one night might have gone for Ethiopian food, another night gone for tapas and another just come in here for a pint. In this context, then, Irish food and bar experience was just one variety on the menu um, and uh, the city dwellers were simply keen to experience it. Uh, it wasn't necessarily about a specific community. In terms of music then, Fado offered mostly gigs upstairs, musicians facing audiences and providing curated play playlists, so with uh, microphones and speakers. 
jigs and reels interpolated with Irish songs and often with an American contemporary song as well. This was also a spot at that time for young European migrant professionals. So European and World Cup nights were held and you may be aware that the European World Cup or the European Cup is on at the moment. And I recall the irony of singing a song like Irish Ways and Irish Laws that spoke of 800 years of oppression and colonization and that really, you know, gave it to people um, uh, in the UK, yet was lapped up by English soccer fans. It was also a place where touring musicians hung out and over time where actually communities began to establish themselves around going to GAA matches broadcast from Ireland as well as English league football. So here was an expansive and more contemporary notion of what it meant to be a consumer for sure, but also what it meant to consume Irishness or Irish Chicagoness. It had multiple, multiple registers. Chief O'Neill's, in contrast, was somewhere where the music was more regular sessions, where the musicians faced inward into a circle, uh, providing background music that was not necessarily mediated. There were gigs in the main dining area, but they tended to be more low key. Uh, the place had a feeling of uh, history because, of course, it drew on the iconography and on the mythology and on the reality, I guess, of Francis O'Neill. And it was established uh, in 1999, an updated version of an older bar or club called Oinkers. Um, and of course, this speaks to the porosity of the city and the layers of history um, to which the O'Shea's have just spoken. Um, in spending huge amounts of money importing the interior wood and the stained glass from Ireland and in making all of these references again to a different type of uh, chronology uh, using um, uh, Celtic iconography, uh, Brendan McKenney, the owner from Detroit, who himself is a musician, made it clear from the start that this was actually a more upmarket place in what was largely at that time a Hispanic neighborhood. The majority of the clientele, uh, back then at least, was Irish American following those roads um, and those highways to this area, coming from all over the city to hear uh, good Irish music. But the kitchen itself was staffed generally by Central or South American workers, and rarely did one see local ethnic families in the areas coming into the place. So there were differences for sure, but from a decorative point of view, the two pubs were not so dissimilar, in that O'Neill's had that specific imported interior. It also was very much aware of itself as a commercial venue, producing its own t-shirts, which you see on display here. It was into merchandising. Um, and as important as it was for a traditional musician to have traditional music in the bar, it was also very much part of what was on offer as a larger experience. So, you know, in both cases, like the Irish villages at the Columbian Exposition, there was a play with the material culture and traditional music and often the same repertoires animated these two bars in two very, very different ways, but also in extraordinarily similar ways. So it's not, an, it's not a case of pitting them against each other, but seeing lots of similarities. These are just two examples from this era. There's a plethora of pubs with much longer histories that speak to different uh, textures and resonances of place, which I can't go into now. But what I do wanted to do to say is that uh, if these two pubs within these kinds of structures and uh, material affect overplayed the nostalgia encoded in the, de in the decor, um, the festival site of a new downtown festival, which also was established in the late 90s, uh, did the opposite, arguably, relying more on music to create community uh, um, than actual material um, structures, but at the same time equally connected uh, with past stagings of Irish and Celticness and with a keen eye on a unifying narrative that had a commercial edge rather than uh, celebrating difference. And so I move to the next um, third chapter, Parks and Rec. And this is where I will speak to you about uh, Celtic Fest Chicago. The fetish for certain types of commercially mediated cultural expressions tend to be cyclical. And so with so-called Celtic music and culture, this is no exception. The 1990s was one of those high points brought about by an increased interest in the idea of ethnicity, especially white ethnicity um, and therefore Celtic ethnicity. It was tied also in material culture to the rise of record labels like real world recordings and to a growing circuit, national and international, of festivals celebrating diverse culture. 
If ethnic Irish American Chicago had long celebrated its culture within its own neighborhoods and territories, including the uh, South um, West Side and downtown Gaelic Park, the 1990s and new millennium brought a more commercial, cosmopolitan, global form of celebration and consumption in the form of a Celtic festive culture that intersected with, but also was quite different from ethnic Irish American expressions from the city historically. Here is an example of Celtic Fest program from 2002 and 2004. In the middle, I've just put in uh, uh, 2002 Country Music Fest. There are similar brochures for Blues Fest, Jazz Fest, Taste of Chicago. In spite of the neighboring city of Milwaukee hosting the biggest Irish music festival in the world and the South Side having a very well-established festival, Mayor Daly felt comfortable in including Celtic Fest new suite of summer festival offerings in Grant Park in the late 90s. Utilizing the same logistics and layouts for each weekend festival, be it Taste of Chicago, Country Music Festival or Jazz Fest, each weekend Chicagoans and visitors could attend the festival and consume and enjoy the music on offer. This was a type of parks and recreation activity. Celtic Fest and other such festivals um, had an emphasis less on difference and more on civic communal participation through a coherent top-down vision from City Hall. Happy citizenry and revenue generation through tourism, not simply ethnic celebration, was key. And this is something that David Grazian argues for Blues Fest in his book uh, entitled Blue Chicago from University of Chicago Press. These are sanitized version of local culture for public consumption. This is, of course, in contrast to somebody like Philip Bullman, who talks a lot about ethnic Chicago and places emphasis on the notion of how one performs ethnicity within a festive space. For Grazian, he believed the major purpose of the events was to increase popularity and attractiveness of the city in the global imagination as a means of promoting tourism. And, and I quote, the festival helped to foster an image, in his case, Blues Fest, but we could apply to all of them, of Chicago as a world-class city, as a mecca for free outdoor cultural events like no other city. From the material culture perspective, then you have this cookie cutter model of tents lining Grand Park. And as you can see in this next um, slide here, I'll just show you, you have a festival map. The only, um, we'll say a point, the only stage that stayed permanent across all the different festivals was the Petrillo. Everything else was renamed. And this is, uh, um, uh, Mayor Daly talking about uh, the festival traditions date back from 700 BC and this is what we're bringing you um, to, to the offering. In the context of this particular festival then, the Celtic regions of the USA and Canada were not peripheral to the Celtic world located in Ireland and, and Brittany, but actually central. And within that Irish music dominated. This is something James Porter has argued. Celtic in North America properly ascribes to an, a sliding scale of national or regional musics, he says, Irish in the US, Scottish in Canada, and then the sliding scale goes down with Welsh and Breton much well less known. And this was certainly the case in, um, in, in Mayor Daly's um, um, festival. I show here a slide of the kinds of cookie cutter uh, elements in the top. You have a, a very benevolent looking Ronald McDonald uh, seeking your money to buy fries in every one of the festivals. And at the same time, you have Chicago souvenirs from Mayor Daly. But the change would come then, depending on the festival weekend, uh, with Celtic Fest saying, here you have a loaded baked potato with Celtic corn. O'Brien's might be in the festival space next week and call it something else. So there was a real sort of uh, manipulation and, and a type of lack of transparency in a way, you know, it didn't, it, people didn't care that these uh, uh, fractures were, were visible. Um, it didn't matter because that was not the purpose of, of, of these festivals. Um, the Celtic label uh, implied in some ways in Chicago in the 1990s, a type of white community, because it's, it's a term that has a long historical presence in the United States and speaks to a kind of a protean white American identity. To evoke Celtic is to begin to blur the lines between ethnic identity proper and a kind of symbolic ethnicity as described by Herbert Gans that referred less to actual real ties to a specific ethnic culture as manifest in everyday practices and more to a notional sense of participating in the consumption of culture in order to express some kind of an identity. 
This model of ethnicity finds expression in various writings about Celtic music. Timothy Taylor asserted in Global Pop in 1997 that Celtic music was particularly successful uh, in marketing in the 1990s the desires to middle-class white America seeking a more open and inclusive form of ethnic identification. Because of course, Celtic music as a rubric falls apart under even the most gentle investigation. So on a positive side, it sidesteps essentialist discourses that so often plague various traditional musics. But on the other hand, um, you know, it causes other kinds of problems when emptied out of signification. So if Celtic was not exclusively tied to place or language or religions or anything like that, or particularly political overt goals, restorative goals, um, it could not even really be part of a discourse around former colonization or expansionist projects either. So it was a safe and accommodating place to be ethnic in many ways. And that's not dissimilar again to what we've seen before. And this chimes with um, the point that Amy Mulligan made yesterday about uh, how Irishness was presented in um, the uh, the context of the Colombian exposition. In many ways, Mayor Daly's festive offerings were part of an exercise actually really in multicultural civility, ostensibly in an open and inviting festive space carefully curated for locals and tourists, but really offering a tour of Chicago, not through CDs as I showed earlier, but through these weekly offerings where now neighborhoods and ethnic groups and music cultures came to be displayed. Now, while the Columbian Exposition did this as part of exotic others, um, the World's Fair in, in 1934 shifted uh, the Irish from that slightly peripheral to the center. And you had events, of course, like Pageant of the Celt uh, in Soldier Field, which Francis O'Neill was involved. And I would urge all of you to read Charlie Fanning's wonderful, wonderful article on this, because this is the moment where Celt is mobilized as part of the Irish American business community and takes on a particular discourse that one could interrogate and then getting there, I'm not there yet, through a sort of an increasing potentially fascist framework. The, 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 the pageant of the Celt basically uh, was a staging using a Michal MacLeamore from Ireland of um, you know, thousands of years of Irish history with the huge ensembles and soldier feed, field. And uh, it, was, it was apparently by all accounts very successful. Um, but I haven't gotten all the material I need yet uh, to really understand how this worked. But I would say that um, the report said that up to 10,000 people um, attended this event. Um, and it was the brainchild of Chicago lawyer and Celtic scholar John V. Ryan. Um, and there were Scottish and Welsh choirs, but maybe the Irish element dominated in many ways. And Chief O'Neill actually was part of that as well. Um, he, he was part of the arrangements. Um, and apparently each night up to 10,000 people attended this. So moving on, in sum, given the absence of textured space in a place like an end of uh, the century festival uh, space like Celtic Fest in downtown Grand Park, music had to take on the burden of sign signification. Um, otherwise, how could one differentiate one festival from the other? And unlike the materiality of the pubs, which had a surplus of indexicality, the festive site in Grand Park didn't. So acoustic territories were sounded out, bleeding across tents and generating identification and animating social relations. The Irish and Irish American dominance in these Celtic festivals is very apparent, uh, but so too was that kind of um, ethnic dominance in the audience. From my observations, participation was almost exclusively white compared with blues or jazz festival, for example. But what always struck me was that the logistical work in keeping the festival going was invariably done by black people, especially black women. And that sometimes there were ruptures on the fringe of the site, uh, um, challenging the sonic color line, as you can see from these hip hop artists who were shortly after I took that photograph dispersed by the police. And so I come to my final um, chapter and this is short. I just want to very briefly uh, draw your attention to two highly successful Irish American performers of this era, uh, Liz Carroll and Michael Flatley, both children of Irish migrants that married and settled in the south side of Chicago in the 40s and 50s that were connected to the visitation parish mentioned by James this morning. Uh, that grew up um, in uh, the same Irish Catholic cultural milieu, competing in competitions, engaging in cultural um, activities but that in many ways followed quite different paths at this period at the end of the long 20th century. So it, 
I guess for me, they represent um, different sides of the coin. And in many ways, as Mark Sloban has pointed out, what constitutes ethnic Im immigrant, civic or anything else up close looks less like a monolith and far more like um, tents. Liz Carroll, I show here her most, what I think are her most Irish American of uh, music contributions to the Irish music tradition, her Lost in the Loop and her Lake Effect CDs from 2000 and 2002, where she deliberately maps her city and place in the history of Irish traditional music in very material and creative ways. Now I've written about this elsewhere, so I won't go into it now. But the key point I want to make here is that these CDs represented a reaching out to other musical traditions and a mapping of herself within the tradition from a Chicago center and an Irish hinterland, which is the reversal of the diasporic model. Um, you know, she, these are Irish, or I beg your pardon, Chicago geographic um, uh, places, and she's speaking to them and her, her youth in, in the South Side. She has a beautiful air called Hanley's House of Happiness, which is where so many people would go in the South Side to listen to music and to the radio shows. These days, she's been involved in Celtic music bands like String Sisters, and in 2015, she was center as a composer at the wonderful um, Art Institute of Chicago exhibition and associated music CD that celebrated Anglo-Irish craft work and that ideologically embraced this aspect of Irish history and heritage that hitherto wouldn't have really been dealt with or staged in Chicago in many ways. And she did this with Marty Fahey. Um, and I'll talk about him maybe tomorrow in the round table. In contrast, uh, Michael Flatley's full embrace of the stadium-like pageant of the Celt, Celtic inflected extravaganza in stage shows such as Lord of the Dance in 1996 and Feet of Flames generated a strong mythos that reached a particular climax with the performance of Warlords at the inauguration of Donald Trump in 2017. This was a refraction perhaps of what the Celtic paradigm of inclusivity was trying to do in the 90s, or maybe it was simply a canny take that was to do with commercial prowess. But certainly, as you can see on the screen, the white nationalist undertones that one sees in the performance, particularly at the, or, um, at the inauguration, and the framing of the baddie as Dan Dorica invites reflection through a critical race theory lens, um, something that I'm doing in relation to Hazel Carby's work in the 1990s. I mean, this was also a show where specific iterations of Irish America were honored, but the, the Irish Americans that were honored in Feet of Flames and in Lord of the Dance were Irish Americans that had penchant for blackface or a particular type of white 1960s nostalgia or an unteleologically untethered Celtic paradigm that was emptied of signification. And so this is a very critical reading of Lord of the Dance and Feet of Flames um, and maybe this output and it's something I'd welcome us to, to talk about. Um, I guess the point I want to make is that uh, music and dance are porous and can take on these things. So to, to conclude, thinking about the mapped pubs from Big Chicago CD, many are gone now. The commercial desire for large bands is no longer there. Pay has not risen with inflation. 20 years ago, you'd get 100 or $150 for a gig. Um, it's pretty much the same today. Chief O'Neill's is still there, but Fado no longer has much Irish music. The owners of O'Neill's um, uh, are now openly uh, proclaiming uh, their Republican status while most of their musician friends remain democratic and very tie tied to blue uh, color um, politics. Tensions abound across um, the area. I was speaking to a musician from Chicago last week, the wonderful Jimmy Keane about the bars and locations in the C CD. And he was pointing out what was gone or what had shifted to the suburb. And I was asking him, was this to do with a decrease in migration from Ireland, the late ethnicity uh, that we talk about, or was it to do with something else? Um, obviously there's also been a decline in the consumption of the Irish pub culture because that has changed uh, um, and Jimmy said basically if there are peaks and troughs if this is lace ethnicity we're definitely in a trough and he advised me to put my diving gear on the taste for Celtic music in Chicago has waned in 2000s there was a craze for Latin music and then for hip-hop and then for rap and Celtic Fest Chicago itself was subsumed into a smaller festival with the taste of Chicago and then eventually disappeared Meanwhile, Milwaukee Irish Fest and Southside Irish Fest continue with considerable support. So according to that 2017 report by the Clinton Institute in UCD, Irish America is becoming more distant from its cultural roots, and it recommends that there's a need to regenerate community identity amongst the diaspora.
So in the city of Chicago, as the evening shadows fall, there are people more likely dreaming of Mexico City and Hyderabad and Lagos rather than the hills of Donegal. But we shouldn't be too fast to, to make this assumption either. O'Neill himself lamented the demise of Irish cultural production and migration by the time of his death in the 1930s. Such patterns may prove cyclical once more, but there will be a difference. What is clear is that Irish cultural production is becoming more untethered from an essentialist Irish and Irish American identity politics, and that any Irish migrants from Ireland to the US in the future may come in many shapes and sizes and will most definitely be less homogenous. In the Irish diaspora strategy of 2020 to 25, um, Ireland and its diaspora is reimagined as multidirectional and inclusive, including citizens from other ethnic heritages and people with an attachment to Irish culture, what is called affinity diaspora. And you can see up there in the top right, Morgan Bullock, an Irish dancer uh, from the East Coast who doesn't have any ethnic ties to Ireland, but is an extraordinary dancer who dances to hip hop music in a very conservative way, I might add, her dancing itself. And below you see Denise Chyla, somebody who has been hanging out with President Higgins recently and is making fantastic critiques of what constitutes Irishness in Ireland. And finally, a picture of a, uh, young students from Ennis at the Flat Nua about 10 years ago playing Irish music. With the Department of Foreign Affairs sponsoring more events of an uh, ex, um, equality, diversity and inclusion nature and places like NYO, NYU hosting green, black and brown seminars, expanding notions of what constitutes Ireland and Irish America, we may see these kinds of iterations in Chicago also. Belonging may no longer be prescribed on purely Blut und Boden or ethnic lines, but may extend to anyone who appreciates and identifies with Irish music culture. So as long as people perform identity, there will always be songs and stories to shape that, to configure it, to contest it, and to reify those ideas and expressions. One thing's for sure is the music and dance won't stop, so the stories won't stop either. Thank you for your patience and time. Thank you very much indeed. Can can you hear me, Eileen? I can. Yes. Can you? Um, I, I, I would I, I would like to clap. I don't know whether the others are clapping or not. <laughs> um, thank you for um, well, uh, they are clapping. Thank you. <laughs> the ones you. that I can see are are indeed. Listen, thank you very much indeed um, for that really uh, you know rich. Uh, multifaceted uh, paper that works on so many uh, on so many levels you're talking about multiple journeys uh, between different spaces you're talking about networks you're talking about sites you're talking as well about enchanted spaces um, where performance um, is possible and where performance that the, you know, the idea of something um, ephemeral um, that, that um, uh, connects, that's deeply connected to your idea of time space um, and how all of that um, finds itself um, in uh, an increasingly complex uh, world um, where the, the, the hyper-local, that's one of the things that struck me when you, know, when you were talking, um, you know, uh, people coming from uh, what was you know, an extremely homogenous society, um, uh, really in, the, in, in, uh, in Ireland in the 80s, into this uh, cosmopolitan environment uh, where they find themselves. Um, I'm sure there are going to be lots of questions um, from different uh, people. Um, and uh, can I just ask the first one sure. um, around that issue of that collision, um, if you like, between, um, because you know, you're talking about um, lines of movement um, between Ireland and uh, and uh, Chicago, lines of movement, patterns of movement within space, when you showed the, the pub uh, layout, uh, your own movement through the thing, but there are also, and I was really glad you mentioned that at the end, the idea of bloodlines, um, you know, uh, where people from uh, an Irish migrant community who are installed and who are in fact American, mm -hmm. um, therefore, and what I wanted to ask was at that time, things have changed since, 
but at that time, the focus of your um, of your paper today, what was the, you know, would you like to talk a wee bit about that collision? Was there a collision between those coming in, um, bringing with them what Ireland had become and those who were there, whose Ireland was their parents or their grandparents' Ireland? Oh. Absolutely. And I mean, you, you can explore that so well through repertoire, but but most definitely, and, and I've written about this, I've talked about being in pubs and this tension around people's expectation, in particular around repertoire and what constitutes uh, one's repertoire. And, and I guess that's what I meant about songs and music being part of your map. We're all positioned in our own times and spaces and cultures. And so the, the materials that inform who we are or what we encounter. So there, I, I remember so many times I'd be playing and other people that I'd observe would be playing, for example, traditional Irish music. And that would be uh, seen as authentic Irish music. But someone who had a different understanding of what constituted Irishness because of where they came from would come up and say, can you guys play some real Irish music? <laughs> and, and, and I had, you know, I had, I had to manage this very carefully. And of course I was, you know, I was always thinking about these things because I was playing, I was implicated in it. And I write about Aidan quite a lot. We're still very good buddies. We're meeting up next week actually when he comes home. But you know, there's this moment where he just loses the head and says, for the love of God, you know, what, is, what are you talking about? What I am doing is Irish music. I don't know what you're talking about. And so that, <laughs> Um, that idea of the, 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 the musical biographies we have make us who we are and they can be shared and communal. Uh, but equally, somebody like Liz Carl, I remember interviewing her 20 years ago and she's saying to me at that time that, uh, you know, other Americans couldn't recognize uh, her music as American, but equally she would come to Ireland and play Irish music and they'd say, oh, you know, aren't you lovely? Aren't, aren't you good? And, you know, well done to you. You know, why don't you play your music now, Turkey in the Straw? Yes. So that has changed dramatically. And Liz Carroll, yes. 20 years later, all of the young people in the tradition are playing her tunes. She's a composer par excellence. So, so I guess what I'm saying is all of these things are so contingent on time, on place, on, on what's happening, which is why we require, at least in my field, close ethnographic fieldwork and that yeah. nothing is stable. There are stereotypes and tropes that persist to degrees the drunken Irish, the sentimental Irish, they're sort of metas. Yes. Uh, but 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 you have to nuance them. So yes. so so the other thing I would say to that question was uh, I was quite a background musician. You know, music was one of my tools, I guess, in in coming into a community. But suddenly I was shoved out front stage. I was made to sing because I was the only woman in the band and mm -hmm. I, I, I had come to embody some sort of authenticity I certainly didn't ask for because these were also the discourses about where does real Irish music come from. That's completely changed now in Chicago. Bands, you know, are, are focusing on Irish American repertoires in the way they just simply didn't 20 years ago. They call themselves after downtown suburbs rather than villages in Mayo. Yes. There's a complete yes. transformation. Yes. And this is why you've got to do close ethnography in different cities and towns as well, because you yes. cannot make sweeping statements about this. Yes, because yeah. it's it's it just just as the, the individual pubs are specific spaces, and individual towns are as specific. Exactly, and cities as well, because you know I, Chicago is very different from Boston yes. and New York and Philadelphia. Yeah, absolutely. Can I open it up onto um, uh, other questions? If anyone has another uh, or a remark, perhaps. Yes, uh, please go ahead. Hi, Eileen. This is Con Connor speaking. Thank you Hi, so Connor. much for that um, just incredible uh, talk. I was taking lots of screenshots and photos here. Um, so my question might be a little bit unusual. Um, mm -hmm. So if you don't want to answer it, that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a, I'm a landscape architect. Um, I teach in a design school. And so, um, you know, in my spare time, I try to sort of take, understand the built environment around me um, or the built environment of the recent past. Um, which is why I loved hearing uh, your presentation about Fado and Chief O'Neill's and the sort of, um, you know, critique of uh, the sort of pastiche of the uh, various Celtic artifacts in Fado, for example. Um, but I'm wondering if you might be able to speculate 
on what a forward looking or contemporary, more inclusive gathering space for um, the affinity diaspora might look like in the United States, um, whether materially or where it might be located geographically, or perhaps even thinking of a public place is almost a dated, um, dated uh, sort of way to, to pose that question. But I'm wondering, you know, as a designer, I'm really curious um, about, about building on, on, your, on your work and uh, designing spaces of the, of the the present moment or the future? Yeah, I mean, in many ways, I think it's the people that, that animate space. And in, in one respect, it doesn't matter because I guess I was trying to say about Fado for all of its kitschness, you know, in many ways, I, I found a, 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 a more solid community there than in many other places. It was actually in Martyrs on Lincoln, where most of the Irish music community would come after gigs, and that had nothing to do ostensibly with Irish music at all. Mm. I cannot think of the name of the grill bar uh, that's just down from the Art Institute on... Uh, um, uh, Kitty O'Shea's or Bennigan's no, was there for a while. No, 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 no. There's another one which is a very sophisticated 1920s modernist take on a Chicago version of Irish America. And there, there I think is an example of one of the futures. I think maybe Billy Lawless, who was the first minister. Oh, the gauge. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It, yes. It, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's I, think, a good point. Yeah. I, I think that does something very particular. I think there's a new level of sophistication around uh, that celebration uh, of or, or, or kind of cosmopolitan sense of self. I also think that we're probably going to see maybe, I hope, fingers crossed, other spaces open up that will also uh, engage with um, the, the, the visual turn towards art um, uh, around uh, Irish um, identity as well. So, so do these things move in peaks and troughs? I'm not sure. Is, is it moving in one direction? I don't know. I mean, do these need to be what we call schleave bon, blank white spaces that people will animate in particular ways? I'm not sure. Maybe the buildings will catch up. I think the music rather than the, the architecture is leading the way, but uh, I would love to see what you would come up with actually in terms of indoor and outdoor spaces. Um, the Celtic stuff may still have a place because it 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 animates and it it creates spaces that are sort of not specific, uh, but maybe maybe more tethering is required. I don't know. It's a really great question, Connor. Um, yeah, we'll have to have a chat about that. Right, thank you. That we'll was a, a chat yeah, about that. Wonderful yeah. answer. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yes, just a, a remark, more, more than a question, a remark uh, for Eileen. Um, sorry about this. I'm just, yes, I'm beheaded, which is a, a French tradition, but uh, <laughs> not, not being currently used. And I hope I'm not going to stop this, um, bring this tradition back to life. Um, well, I have a, a remark because what you said was uh, a reminder of what uh, Michal Sullivan would say. Uh, one of your former colleagues at the Irish World Academy of Music. And I remember uh, he's saying that uh, Irish music was uh, music that was being played in Ireland, in trying to define what Irish music was. And to a certain extent, uh, the perspective you bring um, to me is at the core of what this conference is about. That is a questioning, uh, a different questioning of, of Irish identities through culture, and in particular, what you said about the performance, that is uh, music being played, but also uh, music being consumed as a product. And uh, I just wanted to thank you for this uh, interesting, most challenging perspective. If we think about uh, Chief O'Neill, we'll talk about him tomorrow, but uh, it seems to me that uh, it's, it's a real questioning of, of the roots of identity and, and the, the, the idea of uh, some culture being grounded forever in, in some place. Well, well th thanks for that comment. And, uh, and I should add in a way, this is something that is discursively very live in, 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 uh, in anything to do with Irish traditional music, as if sometimes for people it's, it's routed through the landscape and is untouched. But Irish music has been mediated commercially for 200 years. Um, and so much of its uh, circulation uh, happens through uh, technological mediation in the USA. So, so the more we prize apart these things and understand 
what's at stake when people make these claims and who is at the center and who is at the periphery. When you upturn these ideas, some very interesting things uh, come back out. And of course, look, I'm a big fan of Adorno and the Birmingham School and the Marx and the, the, the uh, um, uh, yeah, you know, of the Frankfurt School. And I think, I think it's, not, it's not just one lens, but it is a way of thinking about um, more so, I guess, the Birmingham School, the secondary production of identity, because we do, we buy t-shirts, we put up posters, we buy LPs, we play them, we sing them to our children, they become part of our biographies. Um, and that's just as legitimate as some notion that, you know, you licked your ability to play music off a stone in a river in Schlieve Lucre, because those kinds of discourses actually can be so essentialist and so exceptionalist that it is about keeping people out. Um, and I became hugely aware of that uh, when I was in Chicago. And it's something that, you know, especially in multicultural Ireland right now, um, you know, it's part of a social justice issue for me. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, if we don't have any other Pardon, questions. Question. One more. One more question from, uh, from Jim. Eileen, that was so mesmerizing that you, there's there's a, a a point you might have touched on, but I'm not sure if you did. In any case, I want you to develop it more. In in, in Chief O'Neill's pub, mm -hmm. um, a, a further difference between that and Fado is that is the place of Chief O'Neill himself. Um, and, and it actually has the character of a kind of shrine. Um, and I can't remember if you mentioned this, but there's a, there's a, there's a case in the middle of the pub with, with his uniform and some of his books uh, as a kind of relic, reliquary of, of Chief O'Neill. And, and that not only seems to distinguish that pub from Pado, but to but to make it uh, strangely uh, singular, and it it becomes even stranger if you think that these guys from Detroit came in and set this whole thing up as if it was always there. Yeah. Um, well, well, uh, first oh, I would so what, say that. What do you make of that? Well, there, there, you know, I, I used the, the chapter title, The Lie of the Pub, which is an ad adaptation from Fintan O'Toole's uh, notion of the lie of the land, that the land tells you two things, but it also tells you a lie. Chief O'Neill's tells you a lie. That's a Garda uniform from the Irish Free State. That's not Chief O'Neill's. And in fact, he wasn't, he wasn't Chief O'Neill. He was a superintendent. Uh, the mm -hmm. other thing is, is that, you know, I think um, Brenda McKinney, and I say this with respect, is an ethnic entrepreneur par excellence. I mean, he takes a narrative that has commercial validity and, you know, he creates this pub. Now, he genuinely obviously admires Chief O'Neill, but, but, but if you, you can interpret it differently that this was a commercial, this was just as commercial a decision as to do a Fado pub. And that uh, I know at the time he got into a lot of trouble because he was taking things out of uh, Nicholas Carlin, who's the former director of the Irish Traditional Music Archive, who wrote the book on O'Neill. He was taking things directly from his book and kind of placing them in a, a, around the place and putting them on his website. And so when it comes to the material making of it, there's nothing that different uh, from what he did in there, except, as you say, the location of the narrative of a Chicago hero. Uh, yeah. But again, O'Neill is somebody that I also kind of try in my writing to, um, to deconstruct a little and to, to bring back from that harvest saved narrative. And I'll alert you all to a book that's coming out with University of Chicago Press next year, with my good friend, uh, Mike O'Malley, precisely on O'Neill, that's going to explore some of these things. So, uh, so again, you know, uh, I should say Brendan McKenney and his wife, who's from Kerry, they're fabulous musicians and, you know, they're beloved in the community and they're also savvy business people. So it's never uh, an either or, it's a both and, to quote the wonderful Marty Fahey. I've just seen flashing past a message from, I think, Mary Rose O'Shea. Is that right? Uh, yes. And I think, I, th I think, I Thierry, we still have time for one question. Yes. 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 Two. Two questions. 
Two questions. Two questions. <laughs> There's one from France. Would, would you like to go ahead? Would you like to go ahead? Um, I can go first if the other yes. person. Right. And I've got sort of a two-part question. The first one is, we talked about authenticity and authentic Irish music, inauthentic Irish music. Is Chicago any different from Temple Bar in Dublin, where you are being sold a complete uh, fake pubs? Uh, I mean, literally, there's nothing, there isn't a single authentic pub left in that part of Dublin. You have to go over to maybe Smithfield. Even O'Donoghue is on Baggett Street, the home of the Dubliners and traditional Irish sessions, dead. It's all fake. Um, so is we are worse than the Chicagoans probably in terms of authenticity. But, but, but you see, I, uh, so so my answer to that is authenticity is an absolute cul-de-sac. I don't go down it. <laughs> okay. as, the, the wonderful Martin Stokes, who was my supervisor while I was at Chicago, he's at King's College uh, London now, um, he's professor there. He wrote a book in 93 called Ethnicity, Identity, Music. And he, he kind of said there are, and I agree with him in many respects, not fully, but... There are, there is, a, you know, authenticity is not a quality or a thing. He says it's a discursive trope of great persuasive power. So what we say is authentic is then discursively reproduced. Um, and, and, and so if you take out authenticity for the moment, it's interesting you bring up Temple Bar because it's one of my three case studies in a European research project I'm doing at the moment around um, European uh, music festivals, public culture and uh, diversity. And Temple Bar is mm. ironic in a way because its structures are quite similar, as you say, to the kinds of things you might encounter in these fake bars. But in actual fact, the communities and the way that music is routed and animated and the support it gives to the live music industry is more real than anything you could ever imagine. Well, I'd agree, and yes, a lot of employment. Are more real. So, so, so I, I try, I guess, to avoid these binaries um, because um, the, the minute you bring in authenticity, it's just so riven uh, with, with certain types of value judgment that, that you can miss uh, some of the nuance. I guess that would be my response. Yeah. Part of my knowledge of this is I ran a bookstall in Temple Bar Square as an undergraduate at Trinity. Okay. And so I had to listen to this stuff. As a musician as well, it was torturous. But my second question, uh, <laughs> which comes on from being a musician, I was pondering with a friend of mine, a couple of friends of mine recently, the setting up a, an Irish music group, folk music group, that would take the music from both traditions. So that's another question I'll ask. Do you have any representation of the other tradition? Uh, Croppies Lie Down, Dolly's Bray, do these songs ever prop up in the diaspora community in uh, Chicago? That's yeah, one for you, Wesley. Yeah, <laughs> I, oh, yeah, I, I, I didn't yeah, dare I, ask. <laughs> no, but I do, I do think absolutely. It's, you see, this is the thing. Musicians are mavericks and they're creatives and there is no one repertoire at all. And, you know, right now there are so many musicians in Chicago who are listening to bands like Lancome out of Dublin who are kind of going back into these sort of darker trad places that are proving hugely influential. You know, I haven't been back in a while to study that, so I don't know, but absolutely in the past people would sing and engage with this stuff. And I think some of the most erudite and capable and incisive and historically uh, sensitive people are, are in bands um, in Chicago at the moment. There are just so many uh, really smart uh, people um, who are thinking about these things and doing this with their music. And yes, you're also getting people who are reproducing the Tora Lora Laddie, but so what? You know, it's, it's, it's like Danny Boy. You know, you sing Danny Boy in Ireland and people throw bags of tatoes at you. You sing Danny Boy in a diasporic setting and people- Throw weep. money at you. They weep, <laughs> they weep. And it's a beautiful song, by the way, connected to an old air. And so, so you have to find out the meaningfulness of these things to people. And I'm not saying everything counts and that there's no differentiation in terms of quality, but you can do a beautiful rendition of Danny Boy or of Tora Laura Laddie or of The Rocks of Bonn. Um, and they will speak to different traditions and pathways and, and cultures, but they can all be uh, meaningful, I guess, is, 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 is what I'm saying. And they can also be tourist schlock, and that's okay too. People have got to make a book. Thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, we have a question from, from Mary Rose O'Shea. Can, can oh, yes. you tune in? 
I can and I can see it here. Uh, right. I'm wondering about the sort of feedback loop that occurs between Ireland and the US, Michael Coleman's recordings in New York City, O'Neill's preservation work of the tunes, Pat Roach, absolutely, work in the Irish village in the century of progress, Fado and Chief O'Neill's founded by Irish born folk. So this brand of Irishness is Irish interpretation of what Americans would consume. Uh, I'm no, is this just capitalist culture? Um, Again, you know, I bring you back to people like Mark Sloban who talk about ethnic entrepreneurs um, and and the fact that, you know, Irish Irish uh, musicians and cultural producers have been ethnic entrepreneurs since since the founding of of the Republic and before, uh, you know, the United States, I should say. Um, and and I think people produce and circulate what people uh, want to hear at the time. They also shape tastes and they also predict tastes. And, um, you know, people like Michael Coleman and James Morrison, certainly in the New York, had huge uh, uh, influence in Ireland, but so too did Pipers. Um, and my colleague uh, Scott Spencer will speak about this tomorrow in relation to the O'Neill cylinders. Um, I mean, these are, these are, there isn't a singular narrative or trend, I guess, um, um, is what I'm saying here, that, that you constantly get renewed and rejuvenated by these new generations of Irishness. Uh, coming. I think the 1990s was just particular because of that discourse around uh, Celticness, but also because of the uh, moneyed opportunities people had to set up bars. Um, so in a way, I can't answer your question in a singular way, other than to say these trends happen, yes, in Chicago as well. They absolutely do. Um, and I think they will continue to do so. But your, you guys, you O'Shea's will be uh, determining um, the degree of lay ethnicity we're at. So I'll be looking at your stuff with great, it's great interest actually. Yeah, sorry, I'm not really able to answer that. I think in the way you might want me to, um, I need to think about it. Listen, thank you very much indeed. Um, and uh, uh, thank you for being so forthcoming um, in your uh, answers. And I'll hand you back to Thierry um, uh, in Paris. Thank well, you thank much. you. Very, thank you very much, Wesley. Thank you very much, Eileen. Thank you very much to all the panelists and chair people. Uh, I think you deserve a, a round of applause. Um, and, um, I'm just going to move from uh, Ireland to the United States and just mention Robert Frost. You know, we have promises to keep. Uh, among the promises, you know, uh, Paddy asked me not to mention the drinks again, uh, but I'd like to uh, tell you that tonight we are, we are going to have a banquet and uh, we'll think about you very deeply, um, knowing that we, we shall be in a, one of the best restaurants in Paris. So uh, thank you for the, the food, uh, the thoughts you provided, um, and we will miss you. I, I repeat that once again, but it's true. We will miss you. And may, may thank I you also, for cheering us up. Yes, may, may, all, may I also thank um, Wesley for his very kind introduction and uh, Arnaud and Thierry and uh, Jim and Claire Connolly for, for this invitation and for uh, having me in this extraordinary uh, two days so far, and I'm really looking forward to tomorrow as well. Thank you. Thank you.